Annabella. Written by Leah Connolly and published by Starfall Publications. Book One from Symbols of Love series. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Prologue. Though the room was close and by all accounts rather modest, the sunlight that filtered in through the window illuminated it so pleasingly that it took on a comforting golden hue all of its own. The view outside the window, too, was rather modest, showing a crowded London street below that teemed with humanity. Annabella Kelly stood with folded arms, watching the bustling merchants and women hurrying to and from market without really seeing them. It was an unseasonably warm April, with unaccountably clear skies, and everyone seemed glad to take advantage of the fine weather. Punctuating the endless stream of workers were from a gentleman and ladies. The ladies wore light dresses in bright, cheerful colours, contrasting sharply with the more drab garb worn by the labourers. Instinctually, Annabella could feel her eye being drawn to them. She noted cut the colours, trimmings, how bonnets were being worn this spring, drinking it all in without even really thinking about it. She had an eye for detail, a trait that served her well. Some ladies raised parasols in defiance of the spring sun, anxious to protect their fair complexions. Some walked arm in arm with gentlemen as they strolled, gloved hands resting just so on the elbow of their escorts. Annabella closed her eyes, sighing just a little, and pressed her forehead against the cool glass of the window. It would be a fine thing to be able to ramble about town like that, stopping to peer in shop windows, strolling in the park. The sound of thick, syrupy breathing filled the room behind her, disrupting Annabella's reverie. What mean you standing at the window and daydreaming? She chastised herself. She pulled away from the window and turned back to the small but comfortable room. There was a small dressing table with a polished glass mirror in the corner and a cedar trunk pressed against the wall next to it. A thick rug, faded a bit with age, covered the honey-coloured wooden floor, helping to insulate the room from both sound and chill. The dominant feature, however, was the bed in the centre, the frame was dark wood, and though simple, it had been polished to a brilliant shine. It was piled high with blankets, beneath which rest a figure that breathed laboriously. Prudence Kelly had once been a stout, strong specimen of a woman, with a square jaw and thick auburn hair. Now she was only a shadow of her former self, her eyes sunken, her face grey and sagging. Her hair had lost its lustre, and was thin and limp beneath her cap. It was terrible for Annabel to attempt to reconcile that this shade that struggled to breathe was her proud, indomitable mamma. Shall I close the drapes so you may rest easier? Annabella asked softly. Nay, my girl, let the sun shine in, the woman replied, her voice rasping as she spoke. Open the window a mite, would you, dear? I should like some fresh air, it smells like a tomb in here. Mamma, you'll catch a cold, Annabella admonished her then instantly regretted her words. The figure on the bed laughed softly, a sad remnant of what had been Annabella's strong, vibrant mother. The laughter quickly devolved into a fit of coughing. I don't expect that matters just now, she said. Annabella swallowed around the lump that had formed in her throat, nodded and turned to raise the window sash a little. The sounds of the outside world flitted in and a delicate breeze brought in the smells of the street. Mrs. Kelly, breathe a deep, seeshing a little appreciatively. Smells like Mr. Bakewell is making his famous walnuts again, she said wistfully. Annabella nodded again, smiling in spite of herself. Her dear mother had a notorious sweet tooth and a particular fondness for the local confectioner's candied walnuts, roasted and tossed in sugar and spices. I could run down and get you some if you like, Annabella offered. Mrs. Kelly shook her head, the slightest of gestures. I am not sure I have the appetite, dear one. She clearly saw Annabella's stricken look at that and attempted her familiar teasing, japing tone. Besides, I cannot send you out into the street with your hair down like that. What would they think of you? You'd be locked up for a shameless tart, no question, she said with a weak smile. 
This was a familiar joke between them, that Annabella, who was by nature a very good and dutiful girl, was always in danger of being run in for some sort of criminal mischief. It was so far from the truth as to be humorous. The truth, which Mrs Kelly was happy to tell anybody, was that Annabella was the very best of daughters. Nothing delighted her more than when said daughter responded in kind. Annabella shook her head playfully at her mother, sending ripples through her golden hair that fell about her shoulders. She was far past the age at which it was acceptable for young girls to run about with their hair down, but she had left it loose this morning. I thought you might like to brush it, as you used to do. You always said you found it soothing, Annabella said, coming to sit in the small straight-back chair next to the bed. I seem to recall you finding it less than soothing, Mrs Kelly said with another breathy laugh, which only set her to wheezing again. Annabella forced her mouth to stay in the shape of a serene smile, but her eyes stung with tears as she watched her mother struggle for air. No, darling girl, I find I haven't the energy for it today, she continued between wet breaths. I haven't the energy for much of anything, truthfully, she said with a weak gesture at the discarded needlework at her side. This alarmed Annabella to no end, for she had never seen her mother with still hands before. Always she was busy embroidering, beading, stitching, cutting, measuring. When she was not working at her craft, her hands were stirring the pot for their dinner or scribbling numbers in her account books. Annabella had never seen her mother so still, so quiet before, and it was heartbreaking. The silence between them grew heavy, and Annabella reached over to take the hand of the only mother she had ever known. It did not matter that there was no blood between them. Prudence Kelly had always been forthright with Annabella that the girl was a foundling. This mattered not to Annabella. You chose me to love me as your own when you were not obligated to, which is the greatest of gifts and compliments, she had told her more than once with the greatest sincerity. Mrs Kelly lifted her other trembling hand and placed it on top of her daughter's. There was much that Annabella would like to say to her, and yet she knew that her mother knew all that was in her heart. You're a good girl, the older woman rasped. You've taken such care of me, she said with a sad smile. I fear you have sacrificed much of yourself. Promise me you will live well now. Mama, this isn't the time. Now is exactly the time, Mrs Kelly insisted with surprising forcefulness. For just a moment there was just a glimpse of her old self. Do not argue with me, it is tiring. All that was mine is yours now. Should you wish it, you will be far greater and more prosperous than I could ever be. Annabella pressed her mother's hands. Of course, Mama, I will make you so very proud. Be happy, darling dear, and I shall be proud. Silence fell between them again, punctuated only by the harsh sounds of Mrs Kelly attempting to breathe. A burning sensation invaded Annabella's ease, tears threatening. She blinked them away stubbornly refusing to cry and distress her mother further in this delicate time. Just then, a breeze wafted through the room again, lifting the lightweight drapes ever so slightly. Fluttering, flitting, flapping its wings delicately, a small yellow butterfly was carried in on the breeze. Annabella started backward as it darted quite near her face for a moment, then it pirouetted in the air and landed on Mrs Kelly's left shoulder. Ah! Mrs Kelly sighed, as if she had just seen an old friend that had delivered a piece of long-anticipated news. Look here, now I've a butterfly on my shoulder, it's my time soon. What? Annabella asked, not understanding. A butterfly on the shoulder means death looms in the corner of the room. A soul of the departed has come to tell me, or at least that is what my Irish ancestors believed, Mrs Kelly said with another wistful smile down at the little creature. Reflexively, Annabella clutched at her own left shoulder. Mrs Kelly laughed at the gesture, which only resulted in more coughing. Don't put too much stock in stories, Annabella, she said, gasping for breath. Now, why don't you hie yourself over to the window and tell me who's out on the street? I imagine the whole neighbourhood is out, and I should like to know who is stepping out with whom. Annabella laughed, a strangled sort of laugh. Mrs Kelly was ever fond of her gossip. 
With a last squeeze, Annabella stood, withdrawing her own hand from her mother's dry hands with a sound like a whisper. Annabella turned back to the window, still fighting tears. The butcher, Mr. Carlyle, is in front of his shop, she reported, spotting the short little bald man. Clean apron? Clean apron, Annabella confirmed. Waiting on Mrs. Blackwell, I imagine, Mrs. Kelly murmured. Probably so. It's a shame he cannot just be open about his regard for her, but I suppose that would be less entertaining for us, Annabella mused. Mrs. Kelly did not reply, only breathed her horrible wet breaths that became shallower and shallower with each passing hour. Annabella shook her head slightly, looking farther down their street. Many of the ladies are wearing their calicoes, she commented, noting the prevalence of the patterned dresses. I suspect they shall regret it when the rain returns. Still, they are beautiful this year, so many new patterns and colours. She was vaguely aware that she was babbling, but she could not stop herself. If she stopped speaking, then she would be forced to acknowledge that the only other sound filling the room was her dearest mother struggling to breathe. Ah, and here's Mrs Jenkins. Oh, Mama, you would not believe the hat she has on. It's the colour of salmon and nearly two feet tall, Annabella said, thinking of how her mother used to take great joy in their neighbour's questionable millinery tastes. No sooner had she finished these words than there was a new sound in the room behind her. It was soft, so soft, that she was not even sure she heard it first. It was not precisely a sigh, being as delicate and inconsequential as the flap of a butterfly's wing. And then there was only silence. The silence was somehow worse, more crushing than the laboured breathing that had preceded it. Annabella reached up to grasp the window frame tightly, catching the drapes in her hands as well. Irrationally, she refused to turn and look behind her, feeling that as long as she looked out the window, focusing on the life and movement below, she would not have to acknowledge the horrible reality behind her. Tears, hot and cascading like a spring rain, flowed down her face. Her mother had undoubtedly wished to spare her the pain of having to watch her slip from this mortal coil, just as Annabella had wished to spare her mother her tears at the end. Still, as if she were being watched, she refused to sniffle or sob. Her eyes, watery and blurred as they were with tears, caught the smallest of movements from about the height of her waist. The small yellow butterfly, with a strange kind of determination, fluttered out the small gap of the open window and out into the open London air. Annabella fixed her eye on it, staring at it as it looped and dipped, and at last disappeared into the deep blue sky. Chapter One One Year Later Annabella Kelly was not afforded many quiet moments in her life. Though young, having barely passed her twentieth winter, she could not remember a time without work filling her days. She did not begrudge this fact, as she felt doubly blessed to work alongside the woman she called Mama, and she also genuinely loved her craft. She found an easy, meditative stillness implying her needle. What idle moments she could steal were usually to be found at the start and end of each day. She was fond of beginning her day, by sitting at the counter to the front of the small but well-appointed shop she ran with her mother at the corner of Bond Street. They were fortunate in securing a corner shop, as this meant they had windows on both sides. In the very quiet hours before the business day began, Annabella would take up her post at the counter, thumbing through the latest fashion plates and sipping on her coffee, her one true vice. Her mother would sit next to her, dissecting the delicate watercolour and ink drawings of the great and beautiful garments from Paris. Now, however, the stool next to Annabella was empty. There was no one to talk with about form, colour or craftsmanship. More often than not, their talking would turn to observing people, giggling about the petty dramas and squabbles of their neighbours. The shop had been jovial, full of camaraderie and easy affection. Annabella felt her loss most keenly at these times. She knew she should be working in her ledger, attempting to balance the books, but it was a joyless task. The accounts were shrinking, the year of mourning and change taking their toll. Clients were fewer, hesitant to purchase from such a young modiste, 
Annabella could calculate the yard age of fine muslin needed for an afternoon dress without skipping a beat. But these columns of numbers that did not add up to much money exhausted and frustrated her. Sighing, she pushed the ledger away, reaching to sip from her delicate porcelain cup of lukewarm coffee. Her gaze was naturally drawn to the world outside her shop windows. The sky was brightening from the sullen early spring grey of pre-dawn. With the sun, the people of London were beginning to stir and rise. Already, coal and newspaper deliveries, maids hurrying to fetch the day's milk and meat, and other merchants were moving about. Setting her cup down carefully, Annabella reached for the lone candlestick she had allowed herself, pulling it closer. It was always a struggle, balancing the need for light with the cost of candles, particularly as she required the best white candles for her work. She shook her head, trying to clear it, and a lock of her warm golden hair slipped loose of its moorings and fell across her forehead. She exhaled, then tucked it behind her ear the action reminding her of the times her mother would do it for her. I cannot afford to be sentimental, she thought ruefully. Indeed, her hands reached for the embroidery hoop she had brought down with her. Stretched across the frame was fine muslin and a half-completed monogram. Around the letters were sprays of flowers and the smallest of butterflies, all worked in pastel shades of silk thread. As always, she fell into the familiar rhythm of pulling her needle pausing only long enough to unlock the door to her shop as the clock struck nine. Annabella continued on in this manner, content if not precisely happy, until the bell above the door tinkled gently, announcing the arrival of a customer. Annabella looked up and blinked a few times, her eyes adjusting. It was a similar feeling as being buried deep in a book for hours and being jolted out of it. Though it was not, in fact, a customer, Annabella was not displeased, for she immediately spotted a familiar face. Penny Talbot was a woman of middle age, but her round cheeks and upturned nose gave the appearance of one much younger. Compounding this was her propensity for full smiles and pink dresses. Matching bright red curls peeked from beneath her bonnet and hung on either side of her face, highlighting her bright green eyes. Dear, dear Annabella, she said coming forward and holding out her hands. Annabella could not help but smile at her, rising from her stool and taking Penny's hands fondly. Acquaintances were always dear, according to Penny, and the closest of friends were dear, dear. Penny, how good it is to see you, Annabella said, leaning down slightly to accept the light air kisses that Penny offered her cheeks. She had picked up the habit during a trip to Paris with her husband, and she imagined it made her tres continental. Annabella did not dissuade her from this notion. It is so good to see you behind the counter again, Penny said, removing her mauve-coloured gloves one finger at a time. The last time I came by, the store was shuttered. Yes, I was, away for some months. In Ireland, Annabella clarified. Reflexively, Penny took Annabella's hand again. It was good of you to see your mother settled back among her own people. Annabella nodded, forcing herself to remain light and breezy. Yes, she always said she wished to be returned home. I imagine she would be pleased. Did you see any of her relations while you were there? Yes, well, Annabella amended. That is, what few of them there were. Some distant cousins and an ageing great-aunt. I stayed with her in her house in Belfast. Penny's round green eyes shone with sympathy. It really was the two of you, alone together in the world, she said. Annabella nodded, feeling the now familiar pang in her heart at the loss of her mama. As if sensing this pain, Penny quickly brightened and changed the subject. And here you are, hard at work as ever, she said, leaning over to view the embroidery hoop that rested on the polished counter. Honestly, Annabella... Your mother was skilled, God rest her, but you are a true artist, she said appreciatively, one finger touching the embroidery delicately. More's the pity, then, that an artist must starve, Annabella sighed. Penny looked up in alarm. You are not in such dire straits as that, are you? 
No, but I do worry about what the future will hold, Annabella confessed. Has there been no work since your mother passed? Penny asked, casting an eye about the shop, stopping to appreciate the finely dressed mannequins. A little, but not enough to satisfy either myself or the account book, Annabella sighed. She nodded to the embroidery hoop. My current commission is an order of a dozen handkerchiefs for Lady Bronson. Otherwise, it's been mostly stockings and gloves. Mr Talbot does so admire the clocked stockings you gifted to him last Christmas, Penny offered. Annabella could not help but smile at her friend as she settled back on her stool. It will all come to naught. The madness for full-length trousers will make its way across the channel before you know it. Never, Penny gasped. I don't think I care for a world where one might not see a forest of well-turned-out calves in every ballroom. Annabella laughed at that. Speaking of Paris, how was Mr Talbot's latest purchasing voyage? Penny's green eyes sparkled. Oh, the usual French madness. They are refusing our English cottons now, so much in the way of linen and silk in Paris. Mr Talbot secured the loveliest silks, however so it was quite worth the bother. We've completely restocked the warehouse, thank goodness. If I should ever get a commission worthy of your fine fabrics, I shall come down to the waterfront to browse, Annabella promised, gazing longingly at her stack of fashion plates. Be sure you do. Mr Talbot will be obliged to give you the best bargain. Annabella smiled at the mention of Penny's devoted husband. I really must thank Mr Talbot for all that he has done to help me in this trying year, Annabella said thoughtfully, showing a grateful face. Penny waved her off. You know that he was a great friend of your mother's late husband, and we are more than happy to help in any way we can. Come to dinner tonight, and your repayment shall be to give both Mr Talbot and I a break from each other's tiresome company. Though Penny was clearly having a jape, her eyes sparkled whenever she spoke of her husband. Annabella laughed in spite of herself. It was absurd, for she had never known two married people so well-suited and fond of each other. Still she nodded, her spirit gladdened, I may not have piles of gold, but I am wealthy in friendship. Chapter Two Alan Hardy, the newly minted Duke of Brandon, rubbed the bridge of his nose, willing his head to stop aching. Scattered across the desk before him was a chaotic assortment of maps, deeds, wills, bequests and codicils. Wax seals, ribbons and embossed stamps peeked out from among the pages. The day was barely half over, and the Duke was already feeling the strain of poring over so many documents. He had dismissed his solicitor earlier, hoping to find some titbit or overlooked passage that would allow him an out from his present duty, but none had materialised. He had always known that he would assume his father's title and seat. That was thoroughly expected and planned for. He had an unbreakable sense of duty that had been instilled in him from a young age, and he took it very seriously. Therefore, on his father's death, he had thrown himself into the work of managing the estate and his posting at court. Of course, with the regent bouncing in and out of power, it was all a bit chop and change and nothing was settled in that regard. For the first few months of inheriting the duchy, things had progressed pleasantly, all things considered. Duke Hardy had a head for management, being a rather logical sort of man, and solutions to problems seemed to appear quite easily to him. It had all been quite agreeable, until the solicitors had come knocking a week ago. In the simplest of terms, it seemed that the new Duke of Brandon was the victim of fate, and the whims of a newly imported king over a century ago. The Brandon estate was large and sprawling, encompassing a good number of farms and even woodland. However, there was a particular quirk about this particular dukedom. It butted directly up to the estate of another duke, the Duke of Sussex. This was all due to the first Georgian king's attempts at seeking loyalty among the nobility and elevating those in his inner circle and a lack of understanding about English geography and custom. So it was that the original Brandon estate was halved and the title of Duke of Sussex created. Things had been cordial, if a bit cool, between the two families for the past hundred years. 
Alan had always known that the original estate was a matter of some contention, but he had thought it would not amount to much for him personally. He was very, very wrong. The late Duke of Sussex, having been tragically killed at sea at a young age, had left no male heir. There were no cousins, no long-lost relatives that could have the dust brushed off them to assume the seat. There was only the Dowager Duchess and one daughter. With no heir, according to a stack of legal documents thicker than the Bible, the estate would devolve back to the Duke of Brandon, to Alan. Alan had always wondered why his father had made no bones about choosing a bride. Most other noble fathers made matches before their children were out of the nursery, or at least set some sort of expectations. The late Duke of Brandon had always taken what Alan had thought to be a blasé outlook to the whole question of marriage. Now Alan knew that it was simply that there was already a plan in place, and the late Duke needed not have troubled himself to make further demands on his son. Alan scrubbed his face with his hands, leaning back in the padded leather chair. His father's repeated emphasis on the importance of duty and honour only exacerbated Alan's feelings of being trapped. He was honour bound to marry the daughter of the Dowager Duchess of Sussex, and thus a son would inherit both, satisfying both honour and the law. That was his future, and there was not much he could do to escape it. To refuse would be to leave the Dowager and her daughter, one, he grimaced as he read the name, patience, adrift and without a home. The very thought of an arranged marriage chafed at him, redolent of centuries gone by. He was not a radical, but he believed in the logic and reason of the Enlightenment, and he believed that a marriage based on at least some measure of feeling was more likely to succeed than a cold one. Come now, man, be honest with yourself. It is also that you simply hate being told what to do, especially by generations of dead men, he chided himself. That thought did nothing to settle him, and he stood abruptly, causing the chair legs to squeak on the floor. He had discarded his jacket earlier and rolled his shirt sleeves to his forearms in an effort to preserve them from ink stains. There was a good prospect from one of the large floor-to-ceiling windows of his office, and he strode over to take it in. The fields of the estate were coming to life in the early spring sun, the grass beginning to shade to the familiar emerald green of warmer weather. The Duke knew the borders of the estate as well as he knew the back of his own hand, and it was easy to pick them out. He folded his arms over his chest, leaning one shoulder against the window frame. Still, he could not help but reflect. The joining of our two estates would truly be something to be reckoned with. Already he was beginning to mentally survey the terrain and the assets of the two combined. There was no denying that it would be a holding of legendary size and wealth. Few other families would hold such sway in the kingdom. Perhaps that is the way forward, he murmured. If he could just focus on the practical aspects of the match, there was nothing objectionable about it. After all, why shouldn't a duke marry the daughter of another duke? especially when she came with an estate that rivalled his own. If he really tried, he could temper his expectations. Maybe. Much would depend on the daughter, this patience. Alan was not a regular at court any more than was required, but he could not recall seeing her name among the young ladies being presented, nor could he recall even hearing her discussed. One, of course, knew of the Dowager Duchess of Sussex, a great beauty and formidable woman in her own time. There was some great tragedy there, though, but no one spoke of it any more. He knew nothing of the dowager nor her daughter, beyond that which was explained in the coldest of terms in the legal documents. This is the first step, then, he decided. He would seek to learn what he could about patience, and proceed from there. He would naturally be expected to call upon her and her mother, but he refused to enter into a matron's drawing room unprepared, never mind marriage negotiations. Turning about, he reached for the small silver bell on his desk and rang it firmly. A footman entered shortly after, and he instructed the servant to fetch his valet, the housekeeper, and his private secretary. Feeling much better now that some action was undertaken, Alan awaited the arrival of his retainers with his arms crossed behind his back. When they entered the small office, 
the Duke began dispatching orders as efficiently as a field marshal. Smythe, he said, addressing the valet who dipped his head. If you would be so good as to prepare my top boots and inform the stables that I intend to go out riding. At once, Your Grace, the valet said, bowing as he withdrew from the office again. Mr. Williams, the Duke said, addressing the secretary, a small, tidy man who straightened and pulled at his sleeves. I wish to call and pay my respects to the Dowager Duchess of Sussex. If you would have a note sent over inquiring as to convenient dates, thank you. I shall also see if you can acquire a copy of Burke's landed gentry. That should be helpful as well. The two male servants thus dismissed. He turned his attention to the housekeeper, a redoubtable woman with small beady eyes and a sharp jaw. Mrs Moore, I find myself needing to ask you to perform a duty not strictly in your purview, the Duke said, coming around to lean against the front edge of the desk. How can I help, Your Grace? the housekeeper asked, curiosity shining in her dark eyes. There was little a female servant liked more than intrigue. The Duke had to fight a grin and maintain his collected ducal manner. Do you have any communication with the servants on the Sussex estate? he inquired. The housekeeper thought for a moment. I used to know one of the housemaids, but I've not seen her for a time, Your Grace, she answered. The house has been closed for a number of years now. The dowager packed off to London over ten years ago. Ah, the Duke said, disappointed. I'm sure I could make some inquiries of my own, if it's a matter of particular interest to your grace, Mrs Moore said, tossing out a line to see if she could hook some gossip. It's a small matter, but I find myself curious about the dowager and her daughter. I know little about them, and I feel that it is my duty as the new Duke to get acquainted with the neighbours, he said smoothly. It was close enough to the truth, and believable enough to hide his true purpose. Mrs Moore studied him for a moment, then lifted her chin. I shall write a couple letters, and tell your grace at once if I should learn anything. The Duke nodded, and Mrs Moore bobbed a curtsy as she departed. Alone again, Alan pushed his chestnut-coloured hair from his forehead. Though nothing had really changed, the heavy weight of duty that had been sitting on his chest all morning eased slightly. He always felt better when he had a course of sensible action before him. Chapter 3 The Talbots lived in a modest brownstone home near enough to Cowley Street to be considered almost fashionable. It was a bracing walk of less than half of an hour if Annabella hurried, which she was compelled to do after shutting up the shop for the day. She always enjoyed the walk to their home, as it allowed her to pass quite near the park at St James's. Her main purpose in hurrying, however, was the knowledge that though the Talbots lived relatively simply, they kept the services of an excellent cook. The man was a bargain, being unfashionably a German chef, and the Talbots ate far above their means as a consequence. Their chef did the most inventive things with beer and mutton. The thought of it set Annabella's mouth to watering and she picked up her steps a bit more. When she reached their green-painted front door, she was received warmly by both Penny and her husband. Mr Talbot William was a few years older than Penny, with blonde hair gone to white that contrived to never stay in place. He had a warm and generous smile, and an equally generous belly that preceded him into every room. Annabella! Such a delight to see you again, he said taking her by the hand and pumping it with enough enthusiasm to set his watch fob to shaking. Don't rattle the poor thing, William, Penny admonished, coming forward to steady Annabella. She helped Annabella to unfasten her bonnet and slip from her spencer. We've not been back long enough to engage a maid, Penny explained. Annabella smiled, then automatically sniffed appreciatively. The house was small so the delicious smells from the kitchen below wafted up through the floorboards with ease. It smells divine in here. Is that... Annabella paused, then inhaled again. Is that apples and cinnamon? she asked hopefully. William and Penny exchanged smiles of their own. It mightn't be, William said coyly. Penny playfully tapped her husband on his arm, then looped her own arm through Annabella's and began leading her through to the dining room. 
Cook knew you were coming by and insisted on his apple strosel just for you. Once they were seated around the dining table, napkins in place, Annabella could not help but notice that the Talbots were exchanging an inordinate number of significant looks between them. Annabella watched them both through slightly narrowed eyes, but Penny pretended not to notice. The dinner passed in the warm familiarity of old friends and good food, particularly the dessert course which Annabella relished. She was not ignorant, however, of the fact that Penny clearly had some sort of delicious titbit of news or gossip. She took on the manner of an eager child in those moments, nearly vibrating like a hummingbird in her eagerness to share it. Penny was a woman that believed in the importance of timing, however, and she clearly was not going to be hurried into divulging her news. At last the dinner was nearing its end, and William raised his bushy eyebrows at his wife. Penny tells me that clients have been a bit thin on the ground of late, he said, not unkindly. Annabella nodded, sighing a little. It's true, though I'm hopeful it will pick up a bit when the ton returns to London for the season. Ah, pity, pity, William said, looking to Penny, who looked right back at him. It seems to me that if she simply had one very high-status, very wealthy client, then the rest of the ton would follow suit. Penny said, speaking to William as if Annabella were not there. Right you are, wife. The ton would follow the whims of the rich and tight-lid, as they always do, he agreed, reaching into an inner pocket of his jacket and withdrawing a pipe, which he proceeded to tap lightly against the table. If only she knew of a very influential noblewoman who sought a dressmaker of great talent to make a trousseau for her daughter, soon to be married, Penny said affecting a great sigh and wistful mien. Indeed, and if only she had good friends to inform her of this opportunity, William agreed, reaching into another pocket for a small pouch of tobacco. He packed his pipe nonchalantly, only looking up once at Annabella. Annabella's gaze slid between the two of them, unsure, not daring to hope. What are you... she began. They say that the Dowager Duchess of Sussex is brushing off the cobwebs and will re-enter society with her daughter. They say the daughter is to announce a formal betrothal before the end of the season and must be made fashionable quick-like, Penny said, leaning forward and speaking with relish. Annabella could not help but look to Mr Talbot, who was busy lighting his pipe from a small reed. Penny, for all her good qualities, was slightly prone to diving headfirst into gossip without ascertaining the truth of it. He glanced up only a little and nodded his head almost imperceptibly. I thought it a bit too much to be true, but who should we find in our warehouse but the housekeeper for the Duchess's London house, looking to secure new drapes and fresh linens for her mistress's return to London, William said. Penny nodded, her red curls bouncing enthusiastically. Of course they can't exactly announce it, but it seems that the news has reached every draper, dressmaker and seamstress in London. The Duchess wishes to outfit her daughter fashionably and is entertaining proposals as we speak. Annabella could not believe her ears. She spent several moments just breathing, her heart in her throat. This was the opportunity of a lifetime. As they had said, a client of this magnitude would set her right and ensure her reputation for years to come. It wouldn't make her stomach feel like a stone when she looked at her accounts any longer. But who am I to wait upon a duchess and her daughter? The orphaned daughter of an unknown mother, she thought sadly. She cast her eyes down, looking at her hands in her lap for long moments. I thought you'd have been cock-a-hoop at this news, Mr Talbot said, an edge of concern to his voice. I thank you both for thinking of me. It really was very kind of you, but I'm not sure I can manage it, Annabella said quietly, glancing up to them with a sad smile. I haven't the money for an apprentice, and I don't think I could manage such a large commission on my own. This is assuming I would even be considered, which seems rather far-fetched as a prospect. Are you sure? Penny asked, her brows tight with worry. Oh yes, Annabella said hurriedly. My mother built our shop from nothing through steady hard work, and it seems disingenuous to try to do something so outlandish all at once. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. 
like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Better I stick to what I am sure of. And this is just such a fantastic dream, it's... It's... Annabella became aware that she was most definitely babbling. She arranged her features into a smile again and rose from the table. Please thank the cook for this most excellent dinner, particularly the streusel. If you will forgive me, I must return home. I've rather an early start these days. Mr Talbot and Penny both rose, talking simultaneously. Are you sure? Shall I escort you? Let us call for a sedan chair. Thank you, no, Annabella said, curtsying and making her way toward the front hall. They continued to protest, wishing to see her home safely, but she continued to demur. At last, she had her bonnet tied about her chin with the lavender-coloured ribbon, and her grey-green spencer fastened about her again. Annabella naturally had a rather quick stride, being a bit taller than most women, and generally moving with purpose. This evening, however, she found her steps slowed and heavy with the news. It would be a very fine thing indeed if she were to win the patronage of such an illustrious figure as a dowager duchess. To say nothing of the daughter, but it was so far out of reach it might as well have been the golden fleece. It was a wonderful dream, nothing more. Dreams don't pay the bills, Annabella thought firmly. The lamplighters were out, tottering about on their stilts and with their long sticks to light the wicks of the street lamps. Evening had turned to the blue inkiness of just before nightfall, and Annabella paused for a moment. It was not raining precisely, but a fine mist hung about the air. The mist was caught in the halos of light around the lights, sparkling and golden. It was a small moment of beauty in a city of stone and stucco, smudged with coal dust. Annabella believed in finding these moments of ordinary beauty and drew inspiration from them. Even now, in her mind's eye, she could see the golden halo transforming into a pattern of gold silk embroidery and glass beading. It should be worked on a fine, transparent fabric, draped elegantly over a silk layer. Seven o'clock, a voice rang out sharply, startling Annabella. She glanced about, noting the hour, and pulled her collar tighter about her neck. It would not do for a single unmarried woman to be caught loitering after dark. She hurried on again, not stopping until she reached the rooms above the shop that were her home. The light was dim and flickering as she slipped out of her slightly damp clothing down to her chemise. Her mind still raced with possibility, her heart torn as to what she should do. With a sigh, she sat down heavily on the stool before her dressing table. The sleeve of her muslin chemise slipped from her left shoulder then, revealing the edge of a birthmark. Twisting a little, Annabella shifted to see it more quickly, the fingers of her right hand reaching up to touch it. It was in the shape of a butterfly, the wings wrapping over the top of her shoulder. Her mother had seen it as a sign, though in fairness, her mother saw most things as a sign. Still, it had served as the inspiration for Annabella's name, even though she almost feel her mother's soft fingers tracing it as she brushed her hair. Annabella sighed again, her shoulders drooping. Mrs Kelly had been a practical woman with practical skill. She did not chase whims and fancies. And yet, there was something of the fantastic in her designs, something that touched the imagination. Annabella stared at her reflection for a moment longer, then righted the sleeve of her chemise as she stood. Later, as she was tucked up safely in bed, a candle burning low on a humble dish, she sat with her knees pulled up. A leather-bound folio balanced on her legs, and the end of a pencil was clamped between her teeth. Her brow was furrowed both in concentration and from the low light. Beside her, a ledger of accounts was discarded. Clutched in her other hand were tinted pencils, which she selected occasionally. Across the pages of the folio, a figure in a gown of exquisite beauty was slowly taking shape. On the page opposite, motifs of leaves, sunbursts and tiny golden butterflies danced across the paper. Chapter 4 
The bell above the shop did not tinkle delicately so much as it clanged in alarm at the velocity with which the door was thrust open. Likewise, Annabella looked up in alarm, one pin in her mouth as she fitted a dress form to stand in the window. Quickly, she replaced the pin on the cushion strapped to her wrist and hurried over to see who had entered her shop in such a manner. The entrant, however, was quickly announcing herself in a swirl of excited pink ruffles and a bonnet with an alarming amount of feathers. Penny strode forward with barely contained excitement, her words tumbling out like water falling from a wheel. Look here and tell me again. It's best for you not to try for the Duchess Commission. Jabbing one hand into her reticule, Penny withdrew a card, waving it about and punctuating her sentences with each pass. Your darling Mama, God rest her weary soul, wanted you to take every chance at your happiness and, ooh, is that new? It's quite lovely, she said, becoming sidetracked by a profusion of pinked trim on the hem of the gown Annabella was in the process of pinning. Penny reached forward to catch it between her gloved thumb and forefinger, holding it out to admire the drape. Do you think in maybe a nice charmeuse? Penny, Annabella said, ducking her head to catch Penny's eye. What? Oh, right, she said, recovering her steam. Well, Mr Talbot and I have been on the lookout for you. The dowager's housekeeper came in again to check the quality of some new damask to recover her dining chairs. I make some subtle inquiries. You know me. Subtle as a fox in the hen house when I've a mind to be. And the housekeeper lets slip that the dowager isn't pleased with any of the contenders so far. I'm not entirely sure what, Annabella began, but was quickly cut off. So what do I do for you, Missy? Penny demanded, putting her fists on her hips. I tell her that's because the most talented dressmaker in all of London hasn't been summoned yet. Well, next thing you know, I receive a note. You would not believe the grandness of the wax seal if you saw it, and within is a calling card. For whom, exactly? Annabella just blinked for a few moments, feeling a bit overwrought by this sudden onslaught. A calling card, Annabella repeated. Yes, a calling card, Penny repeated slowly, placing the aforementioned card into Annabella's hand with a grand flourish. Just look at that embossing. Annabella did not hear her, though, for her entire mind was taken up with trying to comprehend just what exactly she was holding. The words Duchess of Sussex, along with a fashionable address in the toniest part of London, were impressed on the front in gold and green. Swallowing, Annabella turned the card over carefully in both hands, holding it up before her face. While the front of the card was all impressive show, it was on the back that things were truly interesting. Scrawled in careful tight script was a small note. The Duchess of Sussex requests that you attend her at one o'clock this afternoon. Tea will be served. Annabella found herself clutching the small card for dear life for it was all that was anchoring her to reality in that moment. The world was in great danger of spinning away from her. Well, Penny demanded, her fists on her hips again. I... does she mean today? Annabella breathed. Of course she does, Penny said. But that's only two hours from now. Penny exhaled loudly through her lips. That's more than enough time to get there, especially if we hire you a sedan chair. I can't afford... You can't afford to show up to an appointment with a duchess dishevelled and dirty from the streets, Penny said pointedly. Never you mind. I promised your mother I would look after you, and look after you I shall. You'll not squander this chance. Annabella took a deep, shaking breath. Her friend was right. This was a chance that was simply too good to pass up, no matter her reservations. I must prepare at once. I must take my folio and the fashion plates. Annabella said, bustling around the shop, reaching under the counter to begin preparing stacks of papers. Take your samples of beadwork and needlepoint too, Penny instructed, pulling off her gloves and laying them on the counter. What on earth shall I wear? Annabella said, suddenly seized with dread. I shall surely be judged on that as much as my samples. She looked down at the simple gown she was wearing, covered with an apron, as she had been moving dress forms about. Annabella, Penny said, taking her by the hands. You are a talented young woman. What do you think you should wear? 
Annabella paused, half bent over behind the counter, her hands poised in the act of preparation, caught by Penny. She straightened then, feeling a little foolish. Something simple, she answered reflectively. She's a duchess. She won't be impressed by flash and spectacle. My plum-coloured day dress with the embroidered ribbon belt. Penny nodded, satisfied. Now, we shall dress your hair a bit more splendidly and you shall be ready. But who will mind the shop while I'm gone? Never mind about that. I can sit behind the counter and sell gloves as fine as you please, Penny said patiently. Now, if you are quite done finding excuses. Annabella nodded, letting herself be steered up the narrow stairs to her private rooms. Under Penny's direction, she quickly changed into the dress in question and sat before the small dressing table with mirror. With surprising gentleness, Penny began brushing and arranging Annabella's waving golden hair. The act brought tears to her eyes, for it reminded her of her mother, and the hours she would spend gently brushing, parting and braiding her tresses. When Penny asked her to pass some hairpins to her, Annabella was surprised to find that her hands here trembling slightly. Penny, she said softly. Thank you. Penny paused long enough to squeeze Annabella's shoulder affectionately. Now just remember to call the old bat your grace. Curtsy well and you shall do just fine. Annabella closed her eyes and groaned quietly. Her mother had entertained respectable clientele, some even titled but no one as grand as a duchess before. Annabella had learned many things at her mother's knee but not how to properly address a duchess. Penny nudged her shoulder encouraging her to turn slightly so that she could finish pinning her hair. As she did so, she found herself sitting parallel to the small window that overlooked the street. The smallest of motions caught her eye just on the other side of the paned glass. Risking Penny's wrath, she turned slightly to get a better look. Flitting just outside the window, a small golden butterfly flitted. It hovered, wings nearly brushing the glass. For a moment, Annabella could only stare. Then, like a golden light from within, a smile bloomed across her face. Butterflies are the souls of the departed, her mother's voice echoed in her mind. Through her worry and anxiety about the coming meeting, a feeling of love and hope shone. Chapter 5 The sedan chair jostled Annabella as the bearers hustled through the crowded streets. The interior was dark. Annabella keeping the curtains drawn. The sounds from the world outside were muffled, allowing Annabella a moment to reflect and compose herself. On the floor, beside her was a small covered basket, carrying samples of her work. Clutched to her breast was her worn leather folio, tied shut with a ribbon. She wore her plum-coloured cotton daydress with the embroidered ribbon belt, topped with a sage-green capelet trimmed with dark brown fur. It was a simple, understated ensemble that allowed the quality of her work to speak for itself without the veneer of gilding. When the sedan chair stopped before the grand townhouse, covered in a new coat of London stucco, Annabella pulled in a deep breath. Curious, she peeked out of the curtain. A footman descended the stairs leading to the front door and opened the sedan door with studied disinterest. From the moment that her plain brown leather boot touched the paved sidewalk, Annabella knew without a doubt that she was in a far different world than the one she knew. The grand house loomed large above her, countless windows shining in the sun. Servants waited on her, a footman hovering as he held the sedan door still, another waiting with a maid just inside the darkened townhouse doorway. Annabella reached back into the sedan and snatched up her basket her eyes still studying the Duchess's house. A slight movement caught her eye. It was not much, just the barest twitching of the curtains in one of the upstairs windows. Annabella steeled herself, certain that she was being watched. Carefully she ascended the few stairs to the door. The waiting footman dipped his head and the maid bobbed a curtsy. She surrendered her bonnet and capelet to them, but her eyes were on the marvels of the entry hall. It was tiled in a repeating pattern of black and white marble, polished to a high shine that made her boots click as she walked. The walls were painted the softest yellow, with bright white sculpted plaster along the borders of the ceiling. 
In recessed alcoves were a pair of marble busts, staring at each other from opposite walls. Her head swivelled about, trying to take it all in. Another footman appeared, indicating that she should follow. He took her through a hall, another hall, and to a door that, when opened, revealed itself to be a salon. This room was painted a light, gentle green, set off with warm gold accents. The furniture was upholstered in warm cream stripes and matching floral damask. It would have been stuffy and entirely too grand if not for the fact that the windows, which faced the rear of the house, were thrown open wide. Through them, the smells and sounds of the garden wafted in, occasionally admitting a wayward bee or ladybird. Miss Annabella Kelly, the footman announced loudly, startling Annabella. The footman stepped to the side, revealing a seated figure. The woman was stately, with amber-coloured hair and cool, assessing eyes that were surprisingly dark. She wore a gown of dark grey, which highlighted her pale complexion. Her back was straight, her hands folded in her lap, in an air of complete control and power. Just in front and to the side of her was a small table with a pen and foolscap and a small gilt bell. Hurriedly, Annabella made a deep curtsy, dropping her head as expected. She did not rise until the Duchess spoke, her voice brassy and deep. Step forward, she instructed. Annabella did as ordered, holding her head high and looking toward heaven. You are younger than I had imagined, the Duchess commented, her eyes roving all over Annabella, who had no answer for that. And yet your establishment, Madame Kelly's, has been open for fifteen years, the Duchess continued, arching an eyebrow regally. Yes, Your Grace, Annabella answered, grateful that her voice did not waver. It originally belonged to my mother. She passed last year, and now I am the proprietor. Hmm, the Duchess said, and glanced toward the paper. And I assume you have made your own ensemble, then? Yes, Your Grace, Annabella said, unable to prevent a note of pride from creeping into her voice. Turn about, please. Annabella obeyed, turning slowly, her arms held out slightly. The Duchess lifted a lorgnette on a chain, holding it up to one eye. She beckoned Annabella closer, boldly catching an end of the ribbon belt and inspecting it closely. This is your own needlework. When Annabella nodded, the Duchess peered back up to Annabella, digging into her face before nodding herself in satisfaction. Not realising that she had been holding her breath, Annabella exhaled quietly as she stepped back, folding her hands at her waist. The Duchess lifted her head, peering down her nose at Annabella, considering. At last she spoke. My daughter is to make her debut into society, and shortly thereafter to be married. This will require several gowns for the season, to say nothing of her court presentation gown. I expect we shall also need any number of dainties to complete her trousseau. Annabella nodded, reaching into the slit of her dress to pull out a small notepad with attached pencil from her pocket. In a neat, small hand, she began taking swift notes, already calculating yardages and costs. Have you taken on a commission of this size before? The Duchess asked pointedly. My mother and I completed a trousseau for the new Countess of... Have you taken on a commission of this size? The Duchess repeated pointedly. No, Annabella admitted after only a moment's hesitation. I know that I appear young and inexperienced to your grace but I would not have come today and wasted your valuable time if I did not think I could do it. The moment the words were out of her lips, Annabella had a brief moment of panic, worrying that she had spoken impertinently. The Duchess, however, merely tilted her head, then nodded. Very well. Have you got samples to show me then? At Annabella's nod, the Duchess gestured for a footman to bring a chair closer, indicating that Annabella should sit. As she settled her basket on the floor, Annabella reached in to withdraw small samples of beadwork and embroidery, laying them out before the Duchess. She explained each sample briefly, leafing through them quickly. Once or twice the Duchess paused her, running a finger over the satin embroidery stitches or inspecting some ribbon flowers. When Annabella came to a piece of beadwork, 
shining silver and gold beads on the most fragile of muslin, the Duchess made a low sound of appreciation. This is a most beautiful piece, she said. You are indeed talented, especially for one so young. Not a single thread pulled out of place. Annabella flushed with pleasure at the compliment. Thus satisfied with her practical skills, the Duchess nodded toward the leather folio that Annabella held on her lap. I assume this is a collection of plates you can work from? The Duchess inquired, holding out a hand imperiously. Yes, Your Grace, Annabella said, gingerly placing the folio in her waiting hand. The Duchess made little comment as she flipped through the pages, pausing to study some of the ink and watercolour depictions of ladies in fine gowns. She paused, holding up one of the drawings. Overtop the watercolour and professionally printed drawing were a series of ink lines and notes. You have altered this one? At Annabella's nod, the Duchess demanded why. Well, Annabella began, shifting closer so that she might point at the drawing. These sleeves were set wrong. Whoever designed this knew the old way of setting sleeves, but not the new empire silhouette. See here. They are too far back. If a lady wore this, she would find herself unable to move her arms. And here. If the fullness of the skirt is moved more toward the back, then she will cut a most striking figure as she walks, without worrying about tripping. You take these things under great consideration, the Duchess commented, glancing at Annabella, who nodded. You believe that women should be allowed the option of being more than unmoving decoration? I believe they should have the option, Your Grace, Annabella answered carefully. Shockingly modern, the Duchess tutted, but I approve. I have had to do many things I had not expected after the loss of my husband, things which were supposed to be outside the scope and capability of a woman. Her gaze took on a far away, almost wistful look. The Duchess shook her head slightly and turned her attention back to the folio. Carefully, she flipped another page over and stopped. Annabella's heart pounded in her ears, for this was the real test. The Duchess had stopped at one of Annabella's original designs. It was an ink and watercolour drawing of a gown, the design simple but deceptively elegant and flattering. With the gown were small drawings of Annabella's inspiration, Roman columns and statues, sketches and watercolours of leaves and fruit. Accordingly, the gown was uniformly cream-coloured, with gossamer, puffed sleeves. Small leaves were embroidered around the band of the sleeves, with matching embroidery around the waist. Around the model's elbows draped a shawl of beaded and embroidery flowers and fruit. The defining feature, however, was the bust. Rather than the straight and gathered bust line of most gowns, this one was cut in a sort of wrap style, with one side folded behind the other. The torso was sculpted and shaped, rather than simply hanging from the wearer, ensuring the lady who wore it would be shown to great advantage with a long, graceful neck. The silence stretched and stretched, each passing moment worse than the one before it. Beneath the table, Annabella dug her fingernails into her palms, willing herself to sit still and not fidget nervously. She expected the Duchess to begin to laugh, to be insulted, any number of horrible things. She could see it now, being thrown out the front door, her effects being tossed after her. The humiliation would be complete and total. She could never... This is a real masterwork, the Duchess murmured. Annabella could only blink, not believing what her ears were hearing. The woman who wears this would set a new trend for years to come. The Duchess looked up suddenly, her eyes meeting Annabella's. I shall pay you the compliment of being honest, she began, staring unflinchingly at Annabella. I believe you to be a woman of great talent. I'm sure that you shall be a success, should you continue to ply your trade. However, I feel you to be inexperienced, and I worry that a commission of this size could crush you. That's fair, Your Grace. Thank you very much for your time. The Duchess held up one hand, cutting Annabella off. However, I find you to be honest, a most important trait for those I deal with. I think it is also significant that you are young and fashion-oriented. My daughter has been... sheltered, and I do not want any whiff of the provincial about her when she makes her debut. I wish the world to see her for the engaging, beautiful, aristocratic woman she is. 
the Duchess continued. To that end, I should like you to meet her, and to give your opinion and an initial design should you have the time. To say that Annabella was shocked would be like saying the Atlantic Ocean was a puddle. Suddenly all things were possible. Annabella could see her life stretching out before her in a web of opportunities that she hadn't dared to hope for the past year. The Duchess cleared her throat and Annabella realised that she was waiting on some sort of a response. Yes, Your Grace, absolutely. That is, thank you, Duchess, she added hurriedly. An inscrutable look that may have been amusement passed over the Duchess's face. As Annabella followed behind the silent, bewigged and liveried footman that conducted her to the daughter's private quarters, she was not certain her feet were touching the floor. So elated was Annabella by the news that she did not hear another guest being announced in the entry hall. Chapter 6 The first impression that Annabella had of Lady Patience Carnegie, daughter of the Duchess of Sussex, was one of cloying sadness. It hung about the girl like a mantle, weighing her down in some way. Though she had likely never wanted for anything in her privileged life, Annabella could not help but feel a sharp pang of pity upon meeting her. Perhaps it was her own grief, still raw even a year on, that induced her to speak softly to the young lady. After the requisite introductions and curtsies were made, Annabella said, Your sitting room is most charming. I may be biased, however, because it's the colour of daffodils, my favourite flower. True enough, the room was painted a bright yellow, the cheery colour only serving to highlight the quiet, morose nature of the young lady who occupied it. Lady Patience did not respond to this, merely casting her eyes about, as if she had never considered the room before. Sad little bird, Annabella thought, not unkindly. The Duchess, that is your mother, Thought we might spend some time getting to know each other, she offered. At this bit of news, Lady Patience's eyes narrowed slightly. You are a seamstress? Dressmaker, Annabella corrected, lifting her chin slightly. There is a difference, Patience asked, tilting her head slightly in curiosity. She spoke with an open, genuine face, belying an eager mind. Yes, but that is not important. I understand that you are to be out in society for the first time this season. Patience's posture and expression both slumped at that. And my engagement announced in the offing, she mumbled. Well, then I would suggest the most important question is, how do you envision yourself this season? What sort of figure would you like to cut in the ballrooms of the Great and Good? Annabella asked, settling herself on a silver and yellow striped settee. She settled her folio upon her knees, opening it up to a fresh page. Patience, her curiosity again inducing her to speak in spite of her shyness, focused her bright green eyes on Annabella. You are asking me. Annabella paused, pencil in hand, hovering over the page. Yes, you are the one who shall be wearing the ensembles. Leaning back, Patience blinked a few times, owl-like. I... I do not think anyone has ever asked my opinion before. Again, her eyes locked onto Annabella's. You are not like the other modistes. They all told me what I should wear. Annabella shrugged one shoulder. I don't much see the point of that. You are a young woman, not an invalid, and surely know something of how you would like to look. Annabella turned to look expectantly at Patience. Though she looked to be only a year younger than Annabella, something in her nature was so sheltered that she seemed barely out of the schoolroom. She was dressed in muslin and organza, her chemisette ruffled about her neck voluminously. She resembled nothing so much as a bit of dandelion fluff. Patience looked down at her hands, clutched together in her lap, and spoke so quietly that Annabella barely heard. I just don't want to be made a fool of. Annabella's heart squeezed for the girl. Though she might live in a grand house and might have wished for anything, Patience simply wanted to keep her dignity intact. I have a stack of fashion plates here, Annabella said, passing them over. Patience brightened a little, though she accepted the sheaf bashfully. Slowly she began thumbing through them, 
pausing occasionally to hum or murmur. Thus distracted, Annabella studied the girl more closely. Patience was thin, with long graceful fingers and bright green eyes. Her hair was blonde, much like Annabella's, with a tendency to shade to copper. Already Annabella was mentally preparing a palette that would complement her colouring. This is quite lovely, Patience said, bringing Annabella back to herself. She held up a watercolour showing a white evening gown with sapphire-coloured robbing. That's a favourite of mine too, Annabella said, scooting forward a little to point at the drawing. Some simple embroidery just here, on the belt of the robing, would accent your waist nicely. Perhaps in a warm ivory, to really set off your complexion. Patience looked down at herself, as if considering her own person for the first time. You will think this very silly, but it never really occurred to me that I might actually look like one of these ladies. Annabella laughed, impulsively reaching over to squeeze Patience's hand. Pah! By the time we are done, you shall put them to shame. An easy hour passed then, with both girls' heads huddled close together. They passed the fashion plates between them, both forgetting the distance between their social standing and giggling together. Duchess Lavinia Carnegie had more motivation to occupy her daughter with the modiste than simply ensuring she was properly attired. Her interview with the plucky dressmaker had been scheduled precisely to ensure that patients would be occupied for the afternoon. As she waited in her fashionable salon, she could not help but gaze up at the portrait that hung on the opposite wall. A portrait of a young man dressed in the fashion of some twenty years previous stared back at her. His smile was gentle but knowing, handsome chin lifted proudly. The portrait was newly hung. She never travelled without it. Impossible to think that she had lost her beloved nearly twenty years ago. The late Duke had been a man that radiated vitality and energy, never satisfied to sit still. To have that spark snuffed as suddenly as a candle was more than her heart could bear. Her precious firstborn daughter barely begun to live, soft little arms around the Duchess' neck, also lost to the cold sea. She had sealed herself up in her country home, away from the court, away from society. And then, in the midst of her grief, a new life, delicate and precious. Her second daughter, the last child she would ever bear, her patience. She had been a small, sickly babe, and it was easy enough for the Duchess to justify her isolation as being to protect her new daughter. Ever it had just been the two of them. The Tun, for their part, seemed to find the Duchess's mourning first pitiable, then dutiful, and now something of an eccentricity. She refused all invitations, keeping her society limited to a few neighbours and family friends. The Tarn attributed this to an inherent snobbery, and naturally approved. The rumours of a daughter, never seen, locked up like a cursed princess in a tower, only fanned the flames of curiosity. The Duchess was well aware of all of this, of course. She may have lived in isolation, but she still had numerous friends at court who kept her informed. She had always been a meticulous woman, planning carefully and lashing out with legendary temper should the need arise. It was something of an embarrassment, then, that she realised her daughter was suddenly eighteen. She would need to be presented and navigate a successful season in short order. The news of Duke Brandon's sudden death had served as a harsh awakening. She had to provide a stable future for her daughter and quick. Well, the Duchess thought, that is more easily rectified than one might have hoped for. In fact, the solution to a number of problems was being shown into the salon at that very moment. Duke Alan Hardy of Brandon was looked to be everything an English gentleman should be. He wore buff-coloured breeches, crisp white cotton shirt, and a waistcoat of green and black stripes. His jacket was so dark green as to almost be black and cut in the latest cutaway fashion. His hair, the colour of ripened wheat, fell across his forehead in a manner that would have been messy on anyone less distinguished. The Duchess appraised him with a careful eye from the moment he entered the salon. She approved of his tight posture, but easy, rambling gait peculiar to many English country gentlemen. His eyes, dark blue, surveyed the room subtly, 
though his expression was neutral, his eyes betrayed him. Ah, he chafes at this new harness, the Duchess thought. She settled into her settee more comfortably. Reluctant young men were easy enough to manage, after all. Duchess, he greeted her after being announced by a footman. He came forward willingly enough and bowed over her hand, as was expected. Duchess Lavinia nodded sharply at him, returning his salutation. She gestured to a nearby chair, and he settled himself into it, one long leg crossed over the other at the knee. His black boots were coated with dust, and he wore no cravat pin or rings that would mark him out as anything other than a wealthy gentleman. I suspect we both rather wish to keep this as brief and direct as possible, the Duchess said, fixing her eyes on the Duke. He did not squirm precisely, but he did stiffen. To his credit, however, he did not wince. He nodded. That would likely make things a trifle easier. You find yourself in the awkward and delicate position of being instructed to marry my daughter by your late father, the Duchess began. As she spoke, she signalled to the waiting footman for some tea. That is correct, the Duke agreed. To complicate matters, you have never set eyes on my daughter. Again, the Duke nodded his agreement. There was a lull in the conversation as the footman reappeared, bearing a tea service for two. The Duchess bided her time, pouring carefully and serving as if she had all the time in the world. It was a tactic her beloved George had taught her. This is to everyone's benefit. I expect an engagement to be announced at the end of the season. This will ensure that your reputation isn't marred by accusations of mercenary behaviour by not providing for a widowed Duchess and her vulnerable daughter. Though the Duchess spoke mildly, it was clear from her aristocratically arched brow that should the Duke Hardy not cooperate, she would ensure that his reputation was in tatters. She peered closely at him for a moment to be sure that she was understood. Satisfied from his tightening jaw that she was, she nodded slightly to herself. I feel that now I must make myself clear, the Duke said, balancing his teacup in a hand that rested on his knee. I have a thorough understanding of my duty. I know precisely what is required of me, and I have no intention of neglecting my duties. Any of them, he added. However, I also believe it in our mutual interests to move slowly and carefully. We would not wish for anyone to accuse you of selling your reclusive, that is, elusive daughter, to keep yourself in high living. The Duchess found herself riveted to the chair. She had underestimated this young buck, expecting him to be malleable as many young people are. She was surprised, not unpleasantly so, to discover that he had a quick mind and conviction. She did not smile, per se, but she did lift her chin and then dip her head in the subtlest of approvals. It may not be a love match, but this young duke may prove to be a thoroughly acceptable suitor, she thought. She was not concerned about the lack of feeling. After all, her own marriage had begun as a negotiated contract between fathers. The love had been an unexpected boon, blooming from mutual respect and ambition between herself and her late husband. Besides which, she mused, watching the handsome young duke sip his tea, love can sprout wings in the most unlikely of circumstances. Chapter 7 Before Annabella knew it, a distant clock in the grand house was chiming twice. Patience had thawed considerably in that time. Annabella was now hoping for this grand commission not simply for the material gain it would bring, but also so she could spend time with Patience. The Duchess's daughter had confessed to her that Annabella was the only person younger than forty that she spoke to that wasn't a servant. Annabella could understand this loneliness, to a degree. She, too, was an only child, and had spent her life largely in the company of adults. Schooling had been undertaken at her mother's knee. Not that there had been much time for socialising or playtime. As soon as she was old enough to snip threads and hold a needle, she had assisted her mother. A supremely delicious tea had been provided, including cucumber and watercress sandwiches, and a cake with candied plums and currants. Annabella could not remember the last time she had spent an afternoon so pleasantly. The casual air was broken, however, when the Duchess appeared in the doorway. Annabella started, not having heard her arrive. 
The feeling was only compounded when the Duchess simply stood in the doorway, staring at Annabella. Her cheeks flushed, and she feared for a moment that she had committed some impropriety. Mother, what is it? Patience asked. Whatever reverie the Duchess had been in lost its hold when Patience spoke. The Duchess shook her head a little and said, Forgive me. I was merely struck by how similar your colouring is. You two could nearly pass for sisters. Annabella and Patience shared a look then, and both smiled quietly at each other, though Patience's was partially hidden by a shy duck of her head. The Duchess saw this look pass between them, and arched a brow. Am I to take this to mean that you approve of this dressmaker? Oh yes, Mother, Patience said with more conviction than Annabella had heard her use previously. Annabella smiled at Patience again, who this time returned the smile without blushing. Very well, we must begin immediately, the Duchess said, coming forward to peer over Patience's shoulder at one of the fashion plates. If it pleases your grace, I would suggest we begin with the stays, Annabella suggested, which set Patience to blushing all over again. The Duchess, however, nodded. I assume you can recommend a good stay maker. Yes, your grace. I heartily endorse Madame Renaud's on Bond Street, near the Arcade. Monsieur Renaud is quite talented and, more importantly, swift, Annabella explained. Patience looked up in alarm, but the Duchess just nodded again. It's common for men to make the stays, Annabella explained, hoping to soothe Patience. His wife will take the required measurements and draft the pattern, and Monsieur Renaud will undertake the actual making of them. We shall make an appointment post-haste. When can you wait upon us again? the Duchess asked. Annabella considered for a moment. Now that she had the commission, it would mean a great deal of time away from her shop. I may have to hire a shop girl, she thought in some alarm. Shall we say a week? That should be enough time for the stays to be completed. I will return with muslin and toile, and I can begin draping at once. Very well, I shall send a note, the Duchess agreed. Annabella could not help but notice that Patience had faded further and further into the background as the conversation wore on. Though she was present, she was spoken about as if she were absent. Annabella instantly felt a prickling of guilt. I look forward to hearing more of your ideas, Lady Patience, Annabella said pointedly, endeavouring to make eye contact again. Patience grinned timidly but gratefully. Me too, she answered softly. The Duchess's gaze shifted between the two young women. Until next time, Miss Kelly, the Duchess said pointedly, gesturing for the footman waiting in the hall to show Annabella out. Feeling triumphant, Annabella stood and began gathering her things. When she was done, she curtsied and followed the silent footman out. She was fairly certain that she was simply floating down the grand staircase, so elated was she at the news. I have done the impossible, she crowed inwardly. She was very careful to keep her expression distant and professional while in the Duchess's presence, but now she let her face break into a radiant smile. It was all she could do to keep herself from skipping through the marble foyer. Oh, Mama, you would be so proud. Duke Alan Hardy was feeling more than a little disgruntled after his interview with the Duchess. He had heard she was a formidable woman, but he had not expected to be on his heels from the outset. It was a disconcerting feeling, having to constantly be on the defensive. Still, he believed they had made their respective positions clear to each other. A footman stood at the foot of the stone stairs holding the reins of the Duke's horsey. With any luck, the Duke would be able to clear away the irritation of his situation with a brisk ride through the park. Had had just reached street level when he reached to his inner jacket pocket. Finding it empty, jerked to a halt. Sorely tempted to roll his eyes skyward, he realised that he had left his riding gloves in the Duchess's salon. He could picture them easily, resting on a small painted side table. Grunting in frustration, he whirled about suddenly. So great was his irritation and introspection that he had paid little mind to his surroundings. Consequently, he ran smack into someone who was coming down the stairs just behind him. 
a leather folder and basket crashed to the ground, scattering papers and sewing tools hither and thither. Oof! the person cried amid this chaos. The Duke's ripe irritation quickly transformed into concern as he saw that it was a young lady he had collided with. Are you all right? the Duke asked immediately. The young miss in question, however, had let out another sound of distress and fell to her knees. The Duke, greatly alarmed, took a steep back until he saw that she was attempting to prevent the scattered papers from blowing down the street. He sprang into action, snatching up any that he could. He winced as he pulled a couple pages from an inconvenient puddle of muddy water. He held it up, trying to delicately shake the water from them. The image caught his eye. Several young ladies standing in identical poses in the same dress, but in different colours. I am afraid these may be a little worse for wear, he said as he handed them back to her. The young lady didn't look up, her face shielded by the brim of her bonnet. She merely sighed and began placing them back into the now scuffed folio. Scooping up the folio and her basket, she stood brushing aside the Duke's proffered hand. Noting her basket, he said, You are a seamstress. It was less a question than a statement of fact. He bent down to retrieve her basket for her and held it out to her. At that, the young lady looked up sharply, surprisingly green eyes flashing. Dressmaker, she corrected firmly, seizing the handle of the basket. The Duke didn't relinquish his hold on said basket, and her eyes met his. Though they stood on a busy London street, it was as if the world fell away. The Duke could not explain, as it defied all of his logical expectations. Something electric passed between them, and he drank her face in greedily. The seamstress, dressmaker's, eyes were deepest green, the colour of emeralds, and her face was sweetly heart-shaped. The curls that peeked out from her bonnet were a coppery blonde, and her mouth was petal pink. The dressmaker, for her part, likewise stood dumbstruck. She stared openly at him in a manner that no society lady would have dared to. Her lips parted slightly, as if she had been about to speak, but could not. Are you all right, miss? A voice broke into the strange dream they were caught in. A footman had hustled down the stairs and was all solicitous concern. The dressmaker blinked slowly and seemed to gather her wits. I'm fine, thank you, she replied firmly. The footman, greatly daring, glanced to the duke, then back at the dressmaker before retreating back up the stairs. Her grasp firmed on the basket handle, and the duke relinquished it reluctantly. Please, allow me to apologise most sincerely, the duke said, genuinely contrite. Very well, the dressmaker said, then looked at him expectantly. The duke glanced about, then back at the dressmaker, who continued to boldly stare at him. Does that mean I am forgiven? It means I am ready to hear your apology. You just did, the Duke protested. No, you merely declared your wish to apologise. A declaration of intent does not an apology make, the dressmaker said, thinly disguised contempt colouring her voice. The Duke was taken aback. His first instinct was to argue the point, but he checked himself. He had never been spoken to by a woman like this let alone on the street. This warranted closer examination as the Duke believed in logic and facts. Replaying the scene in his mind, he was forced to acknowledge that the impertinent dressmaker was entirely correct. Said dressmaker continued to stare at him expectantly. The Duke took a deep breath. I apologise most humbly, he said, full of genuine contrition. He punctuated the statement with a deep bow. The dressmaker accepted this as her due. Thank you, she said, and turned to leave. Wait, the Duke said, catching the handle of her basket again. Who are you? You have some business with the Duchess of Sussex, he demanded. The dressmaker pulled her basket free, taking great care to keep her leather folio clutched close against her. Her eyes flitted over him, and he could almost feel her assessing him. It was a novel experience. 
Most young ladies were too busy throwing themselves in his path, blinded by his title and position, to ever consider him as an actual person. Her eyes lighted upon his left shoulder. That seam is pulling loose, she said coolly. The Duke's eyes likewise flicked to his shoulder. She spoke truthfully. The seam was indeed gaping a little. He frowned, craning his neck to see how far back it was loose. Perhaps you might recommend a good seamstress to... He began, but when he turned back to face her, she was gone. He blinked, spotting a familiar plum-coloured dress in the crowd about to cross the street. Wait! He called after her. She glanced back at him, then shouldered through the crowd. The Duke gathered himself ready to set off after her, when a voice from the Duchess's house called to him again. Begging your pardon, Your Grace, the blasted footman said, hurrying down the stairs again. You forgot your gloves in the salon, he explained as he offered up said gloves. Thank you, the Duke said abruptly. When he turned back to the street again, there was no sign of the dressmaker. She had vanished, loosing herself easily in the crowded street. The Duke's horse, clearly impatient with the whole affair, nudged the Duke's arm roughly with his muzzle. The Duke glanced back at the horse, then down the street again. He could not recall ever in his life feeling so out of sorts, so thoroughly befuddled and out of place as he did at that moment. He also couldn't remember being so insatiably curious about a woman before. Chapter 8 The walk back to Madame Kelly's fine fashions for the discerning lady passed in something of a blur. Annabella did not exactly run, but her feet seemed obliged to move at a quick clip. She did not even stop to admire the scenery of the park at St. James, which was her usual habit when she passed by it. In fact, she did not stop at all until she had reached the quiet safety of her shop. When she attained her familiar sanctuary, she closed the door with perhaps more force than required and slumped with her back against the door. It was easy enough to attribute the pounding of her heart to her quick pace. She closed her eyes for a moment, willing herself to be calm and composed. There was a strange flush in her cheeks, a warmth she had never felt before. Annabella, Penny called from behind the counter. Annabella opened her eyes in time to see Penny scurrying over in a fluff of excitement. With a heave, she stood upright and met Penny halfway. Though Penny was nearly bouncing on the balls of her feet with curiosity, Annabella did not say anything as she made her way to the familiar counter. She took her time, placing her basket and folio down with care, and removing her gloves slowly. Well, Penny demanded at last. Annabella affected a great sigh and Penny put a hand to her mouth in alarm. But then Annabella was breaking into a smile that rivalled the spring sun. You jest, Penny gasped, swatting Annabella good-naturedly on her arm. You horrible tease, tell me everything at once. Annabella laughed softly, speaking as she reached up to untie her bonnet. There isn't much to tell, in truth. The Duchess approved and sent me to spend some time with the daughter. You saw the daughter, Penny breathed. No one else in London has. It's said that she lives like all shut up in that great gothic pile with her mother and no one else. They say that the Duchess keeps company only with a portrait of her departed husband, even bringing him to the dinner table every night. Annabella turned a dubious eye to her over-eager friend. Penny, have you been reading Mrs Radcliffe again? You know how Mr Talbot feels about that. I do not see where that has any bearing on the conversation, Penny sniffed. Annabella merely raised her eyebrows and continued to eye her sceptically. Fine. So I have been. But that doesn't change anything. Bonnet in hand, Annabella sighed as she placed it on the counter alongside her gloves. I don't know anything about a portrait, but I can tell you that the daughter was... She paused, searching for the words. I don't know what she was, but she touched my finer feelings in some way. Penny tilted her head, round eyes wide. In what way? I can't explain it. She was sad, and loneliness seemed to cling to her. She seemed naive and world-weary all at once. Annabella frowned and saw that Penny's brow was creased with concern as well. 
I do not believe she has a single friend in the world. Annabella paused, biting her lip. Penny put a hand on her arm, squeezing companionably. Annabella smiled at her, but her face fell a little again. I couldn't help but think, this poor girl was born into a house of sadness. She has never known a life without mourning defining it. And then it hit me all at once, that she had to bear all of this without the balm of friendship. What would I have done when Mama died without you, dear Penny? She continued. Oh dear, dear Annabella, Penny said, immediately pulling her friend into a warm embrace. You are too good by half. Annabella melted a little into her friend's arms, grateful to have such a bright spot in her life as Penny. Penny pulled back then, holding Annabella at arm's length. Enough maudlin talk! Now tell me what you have in store for the young lady! The smell of dust clung to the Duke of Brandon's London townhouse, making his nose wrinkle. He had little use for it, only coming to London for official functions, such as the opening of Parliament. He had no official court posting just yet, but knew that it could not be far off. He stood in a sitting room, one that was in the corner of the house. Windows overlooked a small but tidy garden. A team of newly hired maids worked to unlatch and open the shutters, while another pair lifted the white dust covers from the furniture. Mrs Moore, the stalwart housekeeper, oversaw the process, barking orders with the precision and fervour of a sergeant major. Never you fret, your grace, she reassured him. We'll have the house opened and presentable within a day or two. The footmen are hard at work on the silver as we speak, and I've already begun ordering in candles. The Duke nodded, turning away from the sitting room, but tilting his head in such a way as to indicate that Mrs Moore should follow him. The housekeeper obliged, stepping into the dim hall with the Duke. And how has your other task been proceeding? He asked with only the barest lift of a brow. The housekeeper, quite a fan of intrigues, leaned in rather eagerly. It's as I suspected, Your Grace. No one has seen hide nor hair of the girl. I have it on good authority, however, that Lady Patience is fond of reading and has a great many dolls that she was obliged to keep company with. Dolls, the Duke repeated. He could picture her now, a spectacled, timid mouse of a girl, dressed like a woman of forty. And her... other accomplishments? Mrs Moore shook her head a little, the ruffles on her cap fluttering slightly. Nothing of note, Your Grace. A parade of fine tutors and dancing masters came and went, but I hear that she was not keen on the dancing part. The Duke sighed. He himself was rather fond of a turn about a ballroom, so this news did not bode well. Still, he nodded and thanked the housekeeper for her efforts, pressing a few coins into her palm. The Duke turned back to look into the sitting room and frowned again. And Mrs Moore, he said, do you think the sitting room is looking a bit pallid? The housekeeper frowned as well, the keys at her waist jingling softly as she turned back to look as well. Perhaps, Your Grace, I don't believe much has been done with any of the rooms here since your father's day. The Duke nodded absently. It's a bit draughty too being on the corner as it is. Perhaps some new wall coverings, Your Grace? I can arrange to have samples sent over, Mrs Moore suggested. The Duke, lost a little in thought, shook his head. Perhaps, he answered non-committally. The housekeeper, sensing that she had been dismissed, curtsied and withdrew to berate a maid for improperly dusting a table. The Duke sighed inwardly. He had little enough expectations of Lady Patience, but now he felt as if a rock had settled in his stomach. Still there was naught he could do about it. His duty was clear and that was that. Within the year, there would be a new Duchess of Brandon. It was almost impossible to imagine a young lady of dubious aspect sulking about the house. He could almost see her now, dressed in a black dress and white collar like a Puritan, looking like a raven amidst the daisies. And what would you have chosen, given the chance? he asked himself smartly. It's not as if you have ever put any thought into it. You only know that you want someone to match wits with and have thus dismissed the ladies of the tarn as being shallow and vapid. That was true enough, and he had little hope that Lady Patience would be up to the task. 
She may have been well-read, but it didn't mean that she would engage his mind. He walked slowly through the townhouse that was slowly being brought back to life. The sounds of shouted orders drifted up from the kitchens and butler's pantry whenever one of the servants' doors was opened. He paused before a front window, which showed the sun beginning to sink below the London skyline. Besides, it's not as if you could marry a dressmaker, he thought, no matter how much she put you on your toes or how lovely her face. Chapter 9 If you could please stand up straighter, my lady, Annabella said for what was easily the dozenth time. Patience winced but complied. She was standing before a large mirror in her dressing room. Annabella and her maid circled her, adjusting her new chemise and stays. The maid held a piece of wood in her hand, carefully sanded and polished and carved with flowers and butterflies. At Annabella's nod, the maid deftly slid it into the front of Patience's stays. Annabella stepped back and nodded, satisfied. Try moving about a bit, my lady, Annabella encouraged. Timidly, the girl twisted a little and raised her arms a little. How does that feel? Are you quite comfortable? Patience looked up, looking a little amazed. I am, actually. Annabella nodded, satisfied. Your stays are the most modern sort. They are corded through the torso instead of boned with reeds. I assure you, this is the most flattering and modern of silhouettes. Your chemise is the new sleeveless variety, too, giving you more movement and options for necklines. Annabella gently encouraged her to turn and pulled the back of her chemise a little straighter. Patience turned about in front of the mirror again, craning her neck to look over her shoulder. You know your craft well, she said softly. It was not exactly the highest of praise, but Annabella smiled with pride as if it were. What is next? Patience asked. I have never had such a fitting before, she admitted. Annabella nodded again. She stepped back, tapping her finger on her lips. This is not just about finding a dress that looks pretty on your frame, she explained. We must ascertain what is the most flattering for you and why it works so that you can take that information with you. We must also ensure that you are comfortable, that you feel like patience. The girl blinked, wringing her hands in front of her. Feel like patience? She echoed quietly. But why would anyone want that? Gently, Annabella stepped forward and took the girl's hands. Because you must live with yourself longer than anyone else in this world, and it simply will not do to have you be uncomfortable in your skin. You are a unique and interesting person, my lady. It would be a crime if the rest of us didn't get to see that. Patience did not answer immediately, merely swallowed and looked queryingly at Annabella. Slowly she began to nod, and Annabella smiled in response. I suspect also that you have not had much opportunity, shall we say, to develop your own tastes, Annabella added quietly, attempting to be diplomatic. Another glum nod met that astute observation. You are not wrong. It feels as if I've lived my whole life in my mother's shadow, Patience admitted. Annabella could not help but feel sorry for her. She gave her an encouraging squeeze of the hand. That is why we are working together, rather than me simply dressing you like a doll. This is a cooperative, not a dictatorship. Patience brightened a little. That does sound promising, she said, smiling shyly at Annabella in the mirror. Very good, Annabella said, clapping her hands once. Let us begin, then. We must ascertain what your assets are and how best to utilise them, while at the same time hiding anything you do not like. She caught Patience's nervous swallow and patted her hand one more time, reassuringly. Pencil and paper in hand, within a quarter of an hour, they had a list of Patience's assets. Porcelain smooth complexion, long graceful neck, pretty face, and the things that required work, a tendency to hunch her shoulders, plain hair, unfashionably slim figure. Annabella scribbled furiously, already working on a rough sketch. A silhouette was emerging, which she obligingly showed patience as the maid helped her into a dressing gown. The Duchess appeared at that moment, 
darkening the doorway a little in her grey dress. Annabella could not help but note that Patience quelled a little, retreating into herself. Good afternoon, Your Grace, she said, curtsying. The Duchess nodded but spoke to Patience. I presume you are getting on well with the dressmaker, then? Patience nodded, studying the floor. Very good. She turned to Annabella, who straightened. When may we see some samples? I shall have a toil of the bodice completed in a day, and shall return for a fitting then. Once that is completed, I shall begin sourcing fabric samples immediately. The Duchess nodded. For a moment she seemed on the verge of saying something, casting her eyes about the dressing room. She seemed to think better of it, then turned to withdraw. At the last moment she said over her shoulder, Do not forget that you have an appointment to attend this evening, Patience. Yes, Mother, she responded so softly that Annabella could barely hear her. I suppose I should begin dressing soon. No doubt Mother expects me to be in the full fig. She nodded to the maid, who began bustling about, laying out dinner dress. Likewise, Annabella began gathering up her things to put in her basket. I shall be on my way then, she said. She found herself forestalled, however, by Patience putting a hand on her arm. Please stay for a moment, she said quietly, but with surprising force. Annabella complied, finding a stool and pulling it up next to Patience's chair before her dressing table. She waited expectantly, but Patience merely played with her hands in her lap for several moments. I... I wonder if I might ask you something, she finally said quietly. You are the nearest thing I have to a friend, and I've no one else my own age to ask, she added hurriedly. Annabella nodded, settling herself more comfortably. Of course, my lady. What do you think of marriage? Patience blurted catching Annabella off guard. Do you mean as an institution? Annabella asked. Well, no, I mean, that is, I know that we are expected to marry, Patience said, clearly struggling to articulate some inner working. What should one's expectations of marriage be? Oh, Patience, I don't know if I'm the person to... I know what my mother has told me, and I know what the vicar preaches from the pulpit, that marriage is a duty and young ladies should enter into it humbly, Patience continued, seeming to become more agitated as she spoke. But I just cannot believe that duty is all there is to it. Annabella bit her lip, unsure. She tilted her head, studying Patience, who had stopped fidgeting with her hands, but still looked down. I'm not sure I've ever really considered it, Annabella said slowly. In truth, I have no expectation of marrying, she confessed. This caused Patience's head to snap up. You intend to be a spinster, she asked, disbelief writ large on her face. Is that something one can just choose to do? This last question was raised with an undeniable note of hope, which caused Annabella to wince slightly. I do not presume to speak for your ladyship, Annabella said carefully. Our situations are very different. I do not expect I shall have many suitors at my door for one thing. The fact of the matter is also that should I marry, I should have to give up my work. But you seem to love it so, Patience objected, gesturing to the tattered folio that sat atop Annabella's basket. Annabella smiled a little sadly. Precisely so. If I marry, I lose my livelihood and I do not know that I could give that up for just a marriage of duty. Patience leaned in, her light green eyes sparkling for the first time in Annabella's limited acquaintance with her. It would have to be a most extraordinary love for you then. Do you believe such things possible? Considering for a moment, Annabella hesitated before answering. I'm not sure, my lady, she said honestly. I know that my own mother loved me more than any daughter could hope for. The memory of her mother made her smile again. My dearest friend is quite happy in her marriage, and there is much mutual affection between them. But I wonder if theirs isn't the exception. Patience's face fell a little as Annabella spoke. I see, she said quietly, 
turning back to her dressing table and nudging her hairbrush despondently. But just because I have no expectations of love or marriage in my life should not deter you from your own courtship, Annabella added quickly. Patience nodded. She lifted her eyes to look at her own reflection for a moment, then turned on her chair to face Annabella again. I wonder if I might... Bong! A loud clang of a gong interrupted whatever Patience had been about to say. As in all grand households, the gong announced that it was time to begin dressing for dinner. On cue, the maid cleared her throat, holding a pair of silk stockings over her arm. Annabella nodded at the maid, acknowledging it was time for her to depart. She stood, but could not resist giving Patience an encouraging squeeze of her shoulder as she passed by. Patience looked at Annabella in the mirror and smiled gratefully. After Annabella had departed the grand townhouse, she couldn't resist pausing on the sidewalk to look back up at the imposing edifice. A light burned from Patience's window and Annabella felt another rush of compassion for the sad girl within. Penny was sure to eat it up eagerly when Annabella recounted the events of the evening. But then she was a devotee of Mrs Radcliffe's and Mr Walpole's, devouring stories of maidens locked in towers and haunted by some unknown tragedy. Slowly she turned away, folding her arms a little tighter about herself. Who needs gothic tales when the reality is just as tragic? She was so wrapped up in her thoughts that she did not notice the grand carriage that was slowly pulling up to the house she had just left. She also did not notice the way the occupant leaned out of said carriage and tracked her movement with interested eyes. Chapter 10 The Duke of Brandon was shown into the Duchess' yellow salon once again. The portrait of the late Duke of Sussex looked down at him with an expression that seemed to mock Alan. The entire room seemed to be forcefully cheerful, almost demanding that occupants acknowledge that it is was so. The walls were a pale yellow, and neatly trimmed flowers could be seen in a variety of vases. The Duke sat uncomfortably on the striped settee, while the Duchess perched regally on another settee opposite him. Her evening gown was a matte black, and she looked so drastically out of place in the light room as to be comical if she were any less dignified. As a rule, the Duke detested small talk, but found him forced into it as they awaited the arrival of the Duchess's daughter, Patiensi. The Duke suspected that the girl's tardiness was some contrivance of the Duchess. It was likely so that the Duke would first see the girl standing and in motion, rather than sitting. The marriage was almost a foregone conclusion at this point, so these machinations especially chafed at the Duke. At last, the door was opened again, and a footman announced, Lady Patience. The Duke was sitting facing the door, and he stood as the young lady entered the salon. His first impression was of a mass of ruffles and crisply starched lace. Patience wore an evening gown of white silk organza, with a heavily ruffled chemisette beneath it, despite the late hour. Rather than draping elegantly like a Roman statue, as was the fashion, her dress appeared to be stuffed with petticoats. The Duke suspected that the Duchess had instructed her to be dressed as such in order to hide a thin figure. Her hair was put up simply in stark contrast to the gown, with its abundance of tightly gathered ruffles at the bust, sleeves and rows at the hem. She wore no spectacles, but she kept her head lowered in such a way that it was impossible for the Duke to get a good look at her. At last there you are, darling Patience, the Duchess said coolly. Patience came forward to stand next to the Duchess, who looked expectantly at the Duke. He made the requisite bow, and he was aware that Patience was bobbing a curtsy, though it was hard to tell in her current ensemble. What little he could see of her expression seemed to suggest that she was as uncomfortable as he was. Well, that's something, he thought wryly as the three of them stood about awkwardly. We've already something in common. A butler came in and announced dinner, and the Duchess turned to the Duke. Would you be so good as to escort Patience? she asked, preempting the customary manners that the Duke should be escorting the Duchess. She twisted her foot while in the gardens today, and I fear she is still a little unstable. 
Patience blanched as she looked at her mother, then quickly down at her feet again. The Duke sighed inwardly, obviously catching that this too was a farce. Still, he bowed and replied stiffly, It would be my pleasure, Duchess. The Duchess led the way from the salon to the dining room. The Duke allowed himself only the smallest of sighs and offered his elbow to Patience. Her hand lighted into the crook of his arm so lightly that he was not even sure that it was actually there. The absurdity of the situation was nearly too much for him, especially as he could not help but imagine that he was escorting a puff of whipped cream to dinner. Dinner passed as well as could be expected, with the Duchess leading the conversation. She spoke to the Duke mostly about matters of managing an estate, and he suspected she was inquiring as to the health of his own. Patience spent the entirety of dinner pushing food about sullenly on her plate. I understand you are fond of reading, Lady Patience, the Duke offered in an attempt to draw her out. She looked up sharply, her pale green eyes darting from the Duke to the Duchess. I suppose I am, she replied weakly. I too am fond of reading, he encouraged. What do you read? I'm sure it's nothing your Grace would be interested in, the Duchess cut in. Mostly fairy stories and sermons. Patience did not correct her mother, merely dropped her head again. The Duke frowned, not because he disapproved as such, but because a pattern emerged in the conversation. He would attempt to ask Patience a question, and the Duchess would answer for her. By the end of the meal, the Duke had no clearer picture as to who Patience was as a person than he had been before. He had learned only what the Duchess told him. This was not what he had hoped for in accepting the invitation. He had hoped to learn something, anything, about the girl herself. As he stared at her from across the table, he tried to reconcile himself to a lifetime of awkward dinners in which his wife would say little and glumly agree with whatever he said. This cannot be all there is to life, he thought. A little desperate. There must be more to marriage than this. Annabella closed her eyes and rubbed the bridge of her nose and brow bone. Her eyes ached and her fingers were beginning to stiffen as the evening grew cold. The candles were burning low, the flames flickering and making it difficult to see what she worked on. She sighed, accepting that she would likely not get much more done tonight. Rising, she stood and stretched, attempting to loosen up the tightness in her back. She had sat on the stool at the cutting table in her workroom for too long. She'd pay the price when she laid down tonight. Still, she was proud of how much she had accomplished. Not only had she created the toil or mock-up for patients to be fitted into, she had also finished drafting meticulous drawings of the new wardrobe. She pulled a small pocket watch from a hidden pocket in the inside of her embroidered belt and was surprised at the hour. Her grumbling stomach confirmed that she had indeed worked right through dinner. Sighing, she snatched up a shawl from the corner of the room and wrapped it about her shoulders. Hurrying with light steps down the dark street, she made her way to a small stand where a woman sold pies and boiled eggs. She bought one of each, the smell of the minced meat filling making her mouth water. She wrapped her humble supper in a bit of muslin and scurried back home. It would not do to be caught out after dark, especially as she had forgotten her bonnet. Safely ensconced back in her shop again, the door locked against the outside world, Annabella sat back at her work table. Though her mother would have chided her for doing so, Annabella was not quite ready to stop working for the day yet. She unwrapped the pie, but instead of eating immediately, her eye was caught by the dress she had begun that was pinned to a dress form. It was only the lining and structure of the gown so far, but it was already an eye-catching piece. Annabella was not entirely sure why she was spending her precious free moments working on it. Perhaps it was something in the way the Duchess had been quietly awed by the design. The truly confounding thing was that Annabella made it to her own measurements. There was no occasion, no possibility that she would ever attend an event in which she could wear it. Dressmakers were generally not invited to balls or grand dinners. A sigh escaped her. She didn't know why she tormented herself so. Perhaps it was because the other stool across the work table was empty. 
not for the first time she was painfully aware of her own loneliness. Her mother had been her constant companion, and now she had no one to share her evenings with. Annabella shook herself all over. It's only Lady Patience's words getting to you, she chided herself. You'd no thought of marriage or love before. She squared her shoulders and nodded firmly to herself, lifting her pie and taking a determined bite. And yet she could not help but imagine what it would be like if a handsome man sat across from her. Chapter 11 Though the smell of sea air permeated the warehouse, it was surprisingly dry and warm within. Rows and rows of shelves holding bolts and stacks of fabric stretched for yards. Every colour and every type of fabric could be found on the shelves of Talbot's fine silks and cottons, etc. The Duke was not entirely sure what had possessed him to undertake visiting a fabric merchant's warehouse. The usual procedure would have been for the merchant to attend him at his home with a book of samples that the Duke would then choose from. Perhaps it was simple curiosity. Perhaps he was bored. Whatever impulse carried him there, he could not help but be a little awed by the premises. He was not entirely sure what he had expected, but it was nothing of this scale. Mr Talbot had greeted him personally, shaking him warmly by the hand and smiling openly. Mr Talbot was a man of advanced middle age, with a protruding belly that was rivalled only by the volume of his sideburns. He was personally conducting the Duke through the aisles, pointing out several notable fabrics as they passed by. While I am more than happy to continue giving your grace a tour of my wares, I feel compelled to inquire if there be something specific you are seeking, Mr Talbot asked as they reached the end of an aisle. There is, but in truth I was unexpectedly taken by the novelty of seeing a fabric merchant's warehouse. The Duke gestured broadly, encompassing the massive warehouse. The large space was lit by several large high windows. Huge shafts of light poured in, bisecting the dim interior. The shelves were cleverly arranged so that none of them stood in these squares of light, preserving the fabric from the bleaching sun. I've never seen anything like this. It's a little overwhelming. Mr Talbot puffed up slightly at the praise. I can assure your grace that no one else has such a broad selection, nor such quality. I believe it, the Duke murmured. He stepped forward a couple paces, peering at some brocades. I have actually come in search of some new wall coverings for my sitting room. Ah, Mr Talbot said with a knowing nod. Many are freshening up their rooms in preparation for the season. We have some fine damasks that I have recently brought from Paris, he continued, gesturing with one hand. The Duke followed, listening to Mr Talbot. A porter came hustling up then, wearing the canvas apron that marked him out as such. Mr Talbot, you'd best come quick, he said, panting. There's something afoot with the shipment from the Indies. Mr Talbot frowned and turned to the Duke. Would you be so kind as to excuse me for a few moments? The Duke waved him off. Please, I've taken up too much of your time as it is. I shall be quite all right here on my own. Mr. Talbot nodded his thanks, then bustled off after the porter. The Duke watched him retreat, amused to note that though Mr. Talbot's arms were working faster in the attitude of one sprinting, his legs stayed at the same pace. Now alone, the Duke turned his attention to the tall shelves lined with bolts of fabric. He frowned, his forehead creasing a little as he realised that he had never paid much mind to the nature of fabrics. He could not say with any precision or certainty what would suit as a wall covering, beyond what colour he liked. Normally this was the sort of task to be undertaken by a wife. But, well. The less said on that point, the better, he groused inwardly. Arms folded behind his back, he ambled slowly down the aisle, eyes roving over the bolts. His ears pricked up suddenly at a feminine voice. Curious, he turned right and peered down the neighbouring aisle. Standing in one of the great shafts of sunlight that illuminated the floor was the dressmaker. The Duke could only stare for a moment, not believing the coincidence. He was a logical man and thus did not believe in this mania of fate and destiny. 
It was a logical conclusion, therefore, that she was availing herself of the best fabric warehouse in London. Still, that does not explain why you chose to come here today, a voice in his heart whispered. He ignored that, not having an answer. Instead, he focused his attention in observing the dressmaker at work. She held the same leather folio he had observed at their first meeting, if it could be called that, and appeared to be consulting a list. She wore a stylish hat that allowed her to display her coppery blonde hair piled at the back of her head. She spoke with assurance, pointing at the shelves and listing off quantities without hesitating. A porter brought a bolt over to her for inspection. To his surprising fascination, the Duke watched as she caught the fabric between her fingers, feeling it and examining it in the sunlight. She frowned and reached into her pocket and withdrew something that he could not identify until she held it up to her eye. It was something akin to a jeweller's loop, allowing her to closely examine the fabric. The Duke had never thought it possible to study fabric with such concentration and a discerning eye before. He had always assumed that the business of selecting fabrics for dresses merely a matter of taste. The dressmaker spoke to the porter again, shaking her head and sending him off, the boy looking a little coed. She folded her arms and turned to Browsy again. As if feeling his eyes on her, she turned to stare directly at him. The Duke inhaled sharply, for while she had been striking while working, she was simply breathtaking when she turned her attention to him. She stood perfectly still. Her face lit from below by the reflection of the sun on the floor. Her eyes glittered in the dim light. She appeared caught like a deer, unsure of what to do next. The Duke found himself walking toward her before he was aware of what he was doing. Likewise, she turned and stepped cautiously closer to him. When they were only a couple feet apart, both stopped and simply stared at each other for a moment. Fancy running into you again, the Duke said finally. Indeed, the dressmaker said, seeming to recover herself. I would almost suspect you of following me. The Duke grinned and shook his head. You imagine me to be scheming and full of plots, do you? She shrugged with one shoulder, balancing her folio on her forearm. Isn't that what all young men get up to in London during the season? Most likely, the Duke agreed. Hmm, she said, eyes narrowed as if she could not decide if he jested or not. She turned away from him slightly to run a hand along a bolt of silk in front of her. And what nefarious plot brings you to Talbot's today? Wall coverings, the Duke answered simply. Wall coverings? the dressmaker repeated. You are here to select wall coverings? She turned a dubious face to the Duke. I would have imagined that the sort of thing best left to a wife. This last statement was made with a pointedly lifted eyebrow. She is testing the waters, the Duke thought. I would imagine so as well, should one happen to have one. The dressmaker didn't respond, but tossed her head a little. You are quite right, however. I find myself rather at sea he continued, gesturing vaguely to the wide selection about them. Would you find it terribly forward if I requested the assistance of an expert? Not at all, the dressmaker said. Should you happen to find one, do let me know. And with that she turned away, leaving the Duke just standing there once again. How does she keep doing that? he thought incredulously. For the first time in his life, he found himself hurrying after a young lady. Even more strange, she seemed to be doing her utmost to ignore him. Wait, he called after her. The dressmaker turned to face him, an arch expression on her face. I was rather hoping that you might, he began hopefully, and then gestured to the bolts of silk on the shelves. Are you in the habit of demanding the assistance of young ladies you are not acquainted with? The dressmaker asked. Or do you presume that because I am a shop girl that I am ever at your disposal? The Duke reared back a little. Though he was inclined to answer immediately in his defence, he checked himself. He had never been one to shy away from examining the facts, even when they reflected poorly upon himself. The dressmaker watched him, her head tilted curiously. 
No, the Duke said at last. I only sought to enlist the help of one more knowledgeable than myself. I had hoped that a dressmaker that visits the house of a duchess would better know the materials in question than myself. He turned a pointed eye on the dressmaker. Now, if I may ask, are you in the habit of biting the hands of prospective clients? The dressmaker blinked at him a couple times, and her posture shifted. No, she admitted. Only when they presume upon my time, and we have not even been introduced. You may have hours at your leisure, she continued, eyeing his embroidered waistcoat, but I quite literally cannot afford to be idle. The Duke processed this for a moment. He hadn't much experience with those who worked beyond his own retainers. You are quite right. I apologise for presuming. He cast a glance about, checking to see if they were observed. Perhaps introductions would help. The dressmaker hesitated, biting her lip. Miss Kelly will suffice, she allowed at last and turned an expectant face to the Duke. He considered for a moment as well. Mr Hardy will suffice, he said with something of an ironic grin. Her expression turned a bit sceptical again, but she nodded in acknowledgement. He was not entirely sure why he was not completely honest with her. Perhaps he hoped to put her at ease by avoiding grand titles. Or perhaps it is simply that you do not wish to acknowledge the wide gulf between you two, he thought. Very well, Mr Hardy, Miss Kelly said. As you have shown yourself to be passing civil, I might spare a moment to assist you. The Duke could not help but smile. Miss Kelly inhaled sharply when he did so, her eyes roving over his face. I thank you for your time he said with a small bow. I spoke honestly, he continued, as they began to walk back toward the section of wall coverings. I do not know in the slightest what I am looking for. Miss Kelly nodded, but her eyes were fixed on the bolts of fabric. Let me hazard a guess. You have recently taken a London home for the season and wish to make it smart. Something like, he admitted, walking with his hands folded behind his back. Perhaps if you told me about the room in question, she suggested, pausing to remove her gloves so that she could run her hands over a damask. The Duke, Mr Hardy, if you please, spent some minutes explaining the look and aspects of his rather drab sitting room. Miss Kelly nodded occasionally, but her eyes and hands kept their attention on the fabric. You have a few options, Miss Kelly began. This row down here is plain silk wall coverings. The row up here, she said while pointing just above their heads, is full of finely woven damasks from France. If money is no object, she said this last part with another eye to his watch fob and waistcoat. Of course the finer damasks are thicker, which will keep your room warmer. They will also last longer. Hmm, he agreed. And which colour do you favour? Miss Kelly paused here. Green, she answered finally. You have something of the country gentleman about you. I don't imagine the trend for red or pink rooms would suit you at all. Most likely not, the Duke agreed. Miss Kelly reached up, sliding a bolt of mossy green damask out. She unspooled a little of the fabric, holding it out to view the pattern. The Duke could not help but notice the way her eyes widened in appreciation. This one is very fine, she murmured. Though she held up the fabric for his inspection, the Duke found himself unable to look away from her. Her face was animated as she explained the finer points of the fabric in question, pointing out its attributes with a delicate forefinger. She looked up at him expectantly, catching him a little off guard. I suppose it must be this one, then, he agreed. What happens now? Do I simply purchase the bolt? Miss Kelly laughed throwing her head back and pausing in the act of replacing her gloves. No, sir, she said, her eyes still twinkling. Not unless you really are as rich as Croesus. No, simply flag down a porter who will note the number. You give this number to your workman, who will tell you the amount required and place an order. The Duke nodded. How may I thank you for your assistance? Do not trouble yourself, she answered easily. It seemed like the least I could do, having treated you in such a prickly manner. I do seem to vex you rather so, 
the Duke agreed, smiling. Why is that? Miss Kelly, fighting a losing battle with a smile of her own, admitted, I am not sure. Why do you seem to take such delight in vexing me? Because your green eyes sparkle so delightfully, he was on the verge of saying, having to bite the words off at his tongue. Instead, he merely looked at her for a moment, and both began laughing like naughty schoolchildren. Chapter 12 Miss Kelly, a moment, please. Annabella, who had been determinedly engaged in the act of quietly slipping away from Mr Hardy, groaned inwardly. She stopped walking, however, and turned back to see said gentleman walking purposefully toward her. She was not exactly a woman of the world, but she knew enough to understand that wealthy men interested in shop girls were to be avoided. Not that she suspected him of something untoward. Something in his air was unaccountably forthright and genteel. But it was still a complication she did not need. Beyond making her escape, she had been calculating yard ages and drafting patterns in her mind, while also trying to determine if she could afford to take on an apprentice. If she were being honest, she would admit that a large part of the reason she was avoiding Mr Hardy was that he unnerved her. His face was far too handsome, and he had a way of engaging her that demanded her attention. Perhaps I'm just lonely, her mind suggested. She had cause to doubt that this was the case, however, when she turned and beheld Mr Hardy. He walked directly toward her, his light tan overcoat open and lifted in the salt-flavoured breeze. His jaw was handsomely square, and his long legs showed to good advantage in shining black boots. He was the sort of handsome gentleman who always seemed to have the sun shining on him, and today was no exception. Annabella's breath caught and she half expected a flock of doves to take flight behind him rather than the cawing seagulls that wheeled overhead. She lifted a hand ostensibly to shade her eyes, but in reality to hopefully hide her flushed cheeks. Miss Kelly, Mr Hardy said again as he neared her. I was wondering if you might require an escort, he asked. Annabella had to resist the urge to bite her lip as she looked up at him. Thank you, sir, but no, she answered automatically. Mr Hardy's brows lifted in surprise. Are you quite certain? The London Quay is not exactly a genteel place for a young lady. Automatically, Annabella's eyes glanced about, confirming that there were indeed a number of sailors and labourers about. Over the sounds of the water and wind were shouts tinged with rather colourful language. True enough, more than one fellow's eyes watched her. Curious what a petticoat was doing down at the docks. I thank you for your concern, Annabella said, tossing her head proudly. But I am not a lady, nor am I unaccustomed to navigating these streets alone. That last part was something of an untruth, for on previous trips to Talbot's warehouse, she had always been accompanied by her mother. Subtly, Annabella traced a small cross on her palm with her thumb hoping that the little fib didn't really count as a lie. Mr Hardy stepped a little closer, casting a sidelong glance to his left. Please, Miss Kelly, I should feel responsible if something should happen to you. Annabella could not help but follow his glance to where a group of sailors watched her hungrily. She swallowed automatically and could feel her resolve weakening. Did you not arrive on horseback? she asked, nodding toward his black leather boots. Mr Hardy hesitated, then nodded back over his shoulder. I did, yes, he admitted, indicating a handsome bay tied to a post outside the warehouse. But I think he will not mind a walk, either. Annabella felt the last of her resolve melting, particularly as Mr Hardy looked at her so hopefully. Very well, she sighed. Wait just here, Mr Hardy said, trotting away to collect his horse. It was probably not the most proper thing to walk unchaperoned with a young man, but in truth, Annabella was a little grateful for his company. If anyone objected, it was perfectly acceptable, chivalrous even, to accept his escort through such a masculine environment as the docks. Still, Annabella placed herself firmly on the right side of the horse, keeping the steed between herself and Mr Hardy. They walked in silence for a while, with only the clopping of the horse's hooves on the cobbles passing the time. 
I have to confess that I have a secret motive for accompanying you, Mr. Hardy said lightly, peeking over the horse's neck to Annabella. She, expecting the worst, preemptively stiffened. And what is that? I have never been to the docks before. I was bound to get lost on my way back and needed a guide, he said. Annabella's head whipped around to look at him. Though she could not see him over the horse, only his brown top hat, she could hear the smile in his voice. Before Annabella knew it, a chuckle escaped her. Well, we can't have that, can we? You'd have been press-ganged for certain. Undoubtedly, he agreed. They continued in amused silence, passing by broom makers and dry goods stores. Forgive me, but I am having difficulty in placing your accent, Miss Kelly, Mr. Hardy offered. Annabella stiffened again. She was aware of how the Irish were treated in England, especially London. Her mother had encouraged her to speak without a brogue, but occasionally it slipped through. My mother was Irish, she said carefully. She waited, braced to see how he would react. Was she indeed? I have a second cousin who settled somewhere in Ulster, Mr Hardy said with as much ease as if he had been commenting on the weather. Annabella breathed a little easier. This Mr Hardy is a man of some contradiction, she thought. He dressed well, but simply. His boots were clearly the finest leather, but his horse was the large, hoofed, thick-necked sort, favoured by men in the countryside. His posture and manners spoke to a gentleman's education, but his air was one of comfortable practicality. Perhaps he is a newly minted gentleman, she thought, having lived on a wealthy relation's largesse and now secured his inheritance. That could explain why he sought an audience with the Duchess of Sussex. It would add a shine of legitimacy to his newfound station if he could claim a titled dowager as an acquaintance. Craning her neck to peer at Mr Hardy from around the horse, Annabella was pleasantly surprised to find him looking about with interested eyes. You do not spend much time in London, or at least this part of it, she stated. No, he agreed. I had heard there was good shopping at the new arcade, though. He quickened his steps a little, letting him get a little ahead of the horse so that he could converse with Annabella easier. I am happy to see that your folio has survived our first encounter, he said with a nod. Annabella looked down at the scuffed, battered cover. It did, which is more than I can say for the fashion plates that ended up in the puddle. Mr Hardy winced. Ah, yes, I do feel quite bad about that. Annabella said nothing, merely shrugged a little with one shoulder. Would you allow me to make it up to you, perhaps? He continued. Perhaps I might take you to a tea room, or... Thank you, sir, for your kind offer, but no. Frankly, I haven't the time, she said, attempting to let him down gently. Ah, uh, so you won the Duchess's commission, then? He responded, eyes suddenly showing more interest. You are to be congratulated. That is quite a boon for a young artisan. I hope that I am up to the task, she blurted, not sure what compelled her to be so open. Perhaps it was his easy, familiar manner or the way he appeared to be listening to her with an open face. Well, I have only seen a couple examples of your work, he said, using his free hand to indicate her current ensemble. But you appear to be competent. Competent? Annabella repeated. Ah, inspired, talented, Mr. Hardy offered, walking a little sideways in order to face her. Annabella refused to look at him, putting her nose in the air of a haughty society lady. The effect was somewhat spoiled by the way that she glanced at Mr. Hardy sidelong. He clearly noticed and grinned at her, which only resulted in Annabella attempting to keep a straight face. They turned another corner and Annabella stopped short, facing Mr Hardy. Thank you again for your gallant escort, but I am safely at my doorstep again, she said. You are, Mr Hardy said, surprised. He looked about, clearly looking for a dressmaker's shop. Thank you again, Annabella said, curtsying so hastily that it was really more like a brief dip, and scurried off while Mr Hardy was occupied. She did not particularly want him to know exactly where she lived and work, as she suspected that it would could only lead to trouble. 
she darted quickly down an alley and then right around a corner. More importantly, she thought to herself as she reached into her pocket for the large brass key that unlocked her shop, you cannot afford the distraction. Annabella pushed open the door of her shop, feeling a little relieved as she closed it behind herself again. Even if it is a very amiable and handsome distraction, she added. The Duke could not remember feeling such a beguiling mix of frustration and amusement before. Once again, he found himself standing on the street as the little dressmaker, Miss Kelly, eluded him. She had scampered off as quickly and cleverly as a hare. He could not help but look to his horse, who only stared back with lipid brown eyes, looking for all the world just as mystified as his owner. The Duke chuckled a little to himself and passed the reins over his horse's neck. As he swung up into the saddle, he glanced around the neighbourhood again. It was upscale, not as modern as the new arcade, perhaps, but thoroughly respectable. A haberdasher was sweeping his doorstep and the Duke nudged his horse in that direction. Good sir, the Duke called. The rasp of the haberdasher's broom paused as he looked up to the Duke. I've heard there is a fine dressmaker hereabouts. Might you know where she is? Ah, you must mean Madame Kelly's, the haberdasher said, stepping a little closer with his broom in hand. Just around the corner there, you'll find no finer gloves for a lady, the man said, nodding. But if you're after quality accessories for yourself, I have... Thank you for your time, the Duke interrupted. Urging his horse onward again, he proceeded forward only enough to peer around the aforementioned corner. There was indeed a dressmaker's on the corner opposite, painted a dark pink and with a sign that advertised Madame Kelly's in gold-painted letters. He wasn't sure what it signified that he knew where the elusive Miss Kelly's shop was. He only knew that it did signify. Chapter 13 There was always a thrill of excitement that Annabella felt at a first fitting. It was a heady mixture of pride and anxiety making her chest feel light and as if she had butterflies in her stomach. She was standing to the side in Lady Patience's dressing room, watching as the young lady turned this way and that. This is... Lady Patience began in her soft voice. As she hesitated, Annabella could not help but exchange a look with the maid who was standing nearby. I cannot believe this is me, Lady Patience finished at last. Annabella exhaled a breath she had not realised she had been holding. This is just a mock-up, she said, coming forward to gently repin a dart on the plain cotton bodice. If the fit satisfies you, then you must start thinking of what colours you would like. Patience smiled shyly. Would you help me choose? I'm not sure what I should like. Annabella nodded, then began helping the maid slip the bodice carefully from Patience. Once the young lady was dressed in her own day dress again, they sat in their customary places in her sitting room. Annabella had brought a massive book of swatches with her this time, and they began leaning over it together. Tea was rung for, and Annabella was very pleased to see cucumber sandwiches were on offer. Where to even begin? Lady Patience said, her light green eyes sparkling with excitement. I would suggest starting with the cottons particularly the calicoes and muslins for day dresses, and then the silks, Annabella advised. Patience nodded her agreement, then using a ribbon marker, found the correct section. Oh, this one is lovely, Patience said, pointing to a small square of lilac with a crimson print of small flowers. I rather like that one too, Annabella agreed between bites. It would look very nice on an afternoon dress. You don't think the print is too much for me, do you? Patience asked, suddenly uncertain. Oh no, not at all, Annabella said. She reached for her trusty folio and flipped to a blank page while balancing it on her knees. Holding her sandwich in one hand, her pencil quickly flew across the page. If we keep the design simple, it will allow the print to speak. You are such a tall and elegant lady, it will be quite striking. Elegant? Striking? Patience repeated, looking up through her eyelashes at Annabella in shy disbelief. Me? And why not? Annabella demanded. 
You are not a toothless old crone, nor a hideous troll from the moors. Patience laughed softly, exhaling through her nose. Could you imagine? she asked, leaning forward. Maybe I am, and you are the fairy godmother who will make me beautiful for a prince. Both girls laughed at that, but Patience withdrew, becoming thoughtful, as she continued flipping through the swatches. Her nose wrinkled a little, and Annabella asked, Is everything all right, my lady? I'm not sure it would matter if I was a hunchbacked shrew with warts all over, Patience said. Though her voice was soft, there was a surprising amount of bitterness in her words. It's not as if I have suitors lined up for my beauty. Is that what you want? Annabella asked gently. Patience appeared to think for a moment, the finger that she had been using to browse shining silk swatches pausing. I know vanity is supposed to be a sin, but is it so terrible to wish my future husband to think me beautiful? Certainly not, Annabella said decisively. I think, I think mostly I should like my husband to just love me and not to marry me for my fortune or duty or, well, any of that, Patience said with more force than Annabella had heard before. That is an admirable goal, Annabella agreed. Though Patience nodded, her gaze was far away, wistful even. Absently, she began playing with the bit of light blue ribbon tied about her neck that held an enamelled pendant. I wish, she began trailing off. All at once, she seemed to come back to herself, her eyes finding Annabella's and staring into them intently. Might I tell you something in confidence? Annabella put her pencil down and used her right hand to draw an X over her heart. Dressmaker's honour, she said solemnly. May my scissors be forever dull and my needles blunt if ever I should betray your secret. The two young women grinned at the silliness of the vow, but Patience grew serious again. I am to marry a man I have never met before, she began. He is obligated to marry me out of familial duty, but I have no wish to marry him. It's not what I want for my life, a marriage of duty. What do you want? Annabella asked. To her surprise, Patience stood, upsetting the book of swatches. She began to pace about the room, biting the nails of one hand. I do not know, she admitted. I only know that I want more. My mother thinks that because she found happiness in her own marriage of duty, then I will do likewise. Well, what does this suitor bring to the marriage? Immense wealth and land, security for mother and I. In truth, he rightfully owns all that is ours, save an allowance for mother to live on, Patience explained. She paused before the windows, where rain was pattering against it. And if you don't marry him, then you will both have nothing, Annabella finished. Rising, she went to Patience and took her hands, squeezing them sympathetically. I am so sorry this is a difficult choice. Patience nodded, her delicate face unhappy. What would you do? she asked suddenly. Annabella took a step back. Me, my lady? You have experienced more of the world than I have, Patience explained. You know what it is to live on your wits, and more importantly, you seem a woman that knows her own mind. I have not seen you hesitate once in the few weeks we have known each other. Annabella let Patience's hand slip from her own, and she shook her head. I really am not the one to ask. Please, Patience said, darting forward and taking Annabella's hands again. I haven't a sister to ask, nor an aunt, or, well, anyone, she pleaded. Annabella took a deep breath and held it as she studied Patience. Though the girl was only a year or so younger than herself, she seemed so much younger. Annabella blew out a sigh, and still holding her hand, guided Patience back to their seats. To be without is a terrible thing, she began. My mother was Irish, and we were treated very poorly when we first came to London. Being hungry and cold is no small thing. Patience nodded, her shoulders slumping. That is true. I don't know what it is to not have every comfort, she admitted. But, Annabella continued, 
I don't think I could ever live in a marriage that was not based on love, at least at the beginning. My experience with being poor was temporary, whereas a marriage is for the rest of your life, God willing. Her head tilted. Patience peered at Annabella with renewed interest. So, you are saying that while your corporeal situation may change, a life without love is more permanent, she said slowly. Yes, that is it precisely. Patience agreed suddenly, her face lighting up. Is it more terrible to be hungry or to be trapped with someone you do not love? Annabella shrugged one shoulder, then spread her hands wide. It seems to me that the question is a simple one. Is a fine carriage worth it? For some, the answer to that is yes. I suspect for you, my lady, that the answer to that is a resounding no. It is, Patience agreed. She sat back in her chair and Annabella followed suit. How did you become so wise? Annabella barked out a laugh. I cannot say that I am, but if that be true, it is due entirely to my mother. You speak of her often, Patience said mildly. You and she were close. We were, Annabella said. It was just the two of us facing the whole of London. We were each other's everything. I envy you for that, Patience said, sadness colouring her voice. I don't know that Mother and I have ever had a real conversation. Well, perhaps this is an opportunity for you to grow closer, Annabella suggested. Patience rolled her head back and forth in a gesture of uncertainty. There was a companionable silence then, and Annabella reached for another triangle of cucumber sandwich. She had lifted it halfway to her mouth when Patience asked, What about you, Miss Kelly? What about me? Annabella replied, lowering the sandwich again. Would you trade a fine carriage for a marriage of convenience? Annabella thought for a moment. No, I don't think I would. It would take more than wealth to lure me away from my shop. Then a cheeky grin spread across her face. Of course the real aim would be to have both. Miss Kelly, you mercenary thing, Patience gasped, playfully swatting Annabella on the arm. Both girls laughed, and Patience looked askance at Annabella. Unless you have some candidate in mind already, Patience said archly. Annabella shrugged again and attempted to wave the question away but she found her cheeks colouring. You do, Patience said, scooting across the settee so that she could rest her elbow on the armrest. She settled her chin in her hands and stared at Annabella. Tell me everything at once, she demanded. Annabella laughed and ducked her head, but Patience would not relent, staring hard at Annabella until she relented. There isn't much to tell, she protested. The young lady was having none of it. That is nonsense, else you would not be blushing so. Well, I have only seen him a handful of times, Annabella explained. I'm not sure who he is, really. I rather suspect he is a gentleman slumming in all honesty. Never, Patience breathed. Tell me more. So Annabella did. She wasn't sure why, but it felt quite good to tell someone about her encounters with the handsome young man. When she had done, Patience was staring at her with starry eyes. Ah, springtime in London, she sighed. Annabella cut her eyes to her, attempting a baleful expression. It was for naught, however, as both young ladies quickly devolved into a fit of girlish giggles. Chapter 14 Penny Talbot was supervising the maid laying the table for dinner when her husband poked his whiskered head into the room. Ah, there you are, dear, he said. Penny looked up and smiled at him. Is everything all right? Penny asked. No, you silly girl, that fork goes over where, she said to the maid, pointing imperiously at the correct spot. The maid dipped her head and placed the fork in the correct place. Oh, yes, William said, coming more fully into the room. I simply wanted to give you a bit of a heads up, as the saying goes. About what? Penny asked, her attention suddenly sharp and pointed. Well, William said slowly, drawing the word out. I wouldn't want to speak out of turn, nor to be accused of being a gossip. He paused here, knowing that Penny lived for gossip. William! Now, you cannot say anything, but today, when Miss Kelly was at the warehouse, 
I believe she caught the eye of a young man, he finished. Penny simply stared at him for a long moment, completely agog. Are you certain? As certain as I can be. They seem to spend a deal of time in each other's company, discussing fabric, he explained, coming further into the dining room. His gold watch chain sparkled in the candlelight. What sort of fabric? Penny demanded, coming round the table. Why does that... William, this is not the time for your questions. What sort of fabric? Penny repeated. Wall coverings, damasks, I believe, William answered. Penny could feel her eyes going wide. She put a hand to her mouth and began pacing as much as she could. This was a bit futile, however, as their dining table took up the lion's share of the room. Her pale yellow silk taffeta dress rustled as she did so. A domestic textile, to be sure, she murmured. Was he there before or after her? He arrived to look at wall coverings separately. I believe their meeting completely coincidental. William paused, then scratched his fluffy white blonde sideburns. Strangest thing, though, he continued. It seemed almost as if they knew each other already. Really? Penny asked, pursing her lips. She paused her pacing to tap on her chin with two fingers. I wasn't aware that Annabella knew any young men. Now, wife, you must promise to remain calm, William said. Penny turned searching eyes to her husband. He paused again, clearly enjoying stringing Penny along. She was on the verge of stamping one of her little feet when he said, one of the porters claims that they left together and were last seen walking down the street in each other's company. What? Penny gasped. The maid, alarmed, looked up. Suddenly remembering that the servant was present, Penny waved her off, not even watching to see if the girl curtsied. Oh, Annabella, she murmured, beginning her limited pacing again. Now let's not get ahead of ourselves here, William cautioned. We cannot assume any sort of attachment between them. No, nothing like that, Penny replied, waving him off a little. She's a young woman. It is only natural for young men to be interested in her. I'm not worried about that. William pulled out one of the dining chairs and settled himself into it and grumbled a little when he had to push it out a bit more to make room for his round belly. Then what troubles you, my dear? Annabella has lived such a sheltered life. Prudence was a good woman, but it was always just the two of them. I'm worried about Annabella's heart, Penny explained. Her pacing was halted by William catching her hand gently and pulling her to a stop. Annabella must learn to navigate these new seas herself, William said softly. Penny sighed. Yes, you are right. But that does not mean she should do so without guidance. To her delight, William's face broke into a smile and he nodded his agreement. You are a good woman, Penny Talbot. Preening under her husband's praise, Penny dropped a kiss on his forehead, then straightened and smoothed her dress. In any event, I am certain that we can learn more over dinner when she arrives. There was a very good reason why Talbot's fine silks and cottons, etc., was such a success, and it was not simply because Mr. William Talbot had the great luck to negotiate contracts during the limited peace times with France. In truth, it was because he formed a great partnership with his wife. Mr. Talbot had an eye for detail and an ability to spot quality from a mile away. Mrs. Talbot understood people, read them as easily as some ladies read novels. Over the years, they had developed a kind of perfect, silent communication with each other that many married couples do. This enabled them to negotiate contracts and size up suppliers with them being none the wiser. For her part, Penny relished the fact that under the guise of simply being a dutiful wife, she gleaned more information than many suspected at her table and in her parlour. Annabella, therefore, was completely unaware of the fact that she was being categorically observed from the moment she arrived. Penny acted no different, being a solicitous host and helping her with her capelet and bonnet. William, too, greeted their guest as warmly as ever, ushering her into the dining room directly. William tells me you paid a visit to the warehouse today. Penny said offhandedly after the conversation and food, and flowed easily for a while. I did, and it was as difficult as ever to pull myself away, Annabella replied, 
smiling at William. Oh, Penny said with forced casualness, shooting a brief glance at William from over the rim of her wine glass. Oh yes, there was such a quantity of new sprigged muslins and shot silks you would scarcely believe, Annabella enthused. Ah, so you found what you needed for the young lady then? William asked. I believe so, yes. I'm hoping to be able to deliver a new tippet and day dress by Monday next. Here, Penny sighed sympathetically. You poor thing, so busy that you scarce have time to enjoy the London season. You must tell me if I can be of any assistance. I may not have your skill, but I can sew buttons and mind the counter whenever you need. Annabella smiled gratefully at Penny. Thank you, dear Penny. I should appreciate the help very much. She paused as she cut into her mutton. Though I'm not sure what I might be missing, really. It's not as if my social diary is bursting. Oh, come now. Everyone should have the chance to take a walk in the park or visit Vauxhall, Penny tutted. Still, I suppose you are right to be so dedicated to your work. There was another silence as Annabella looked down, apparently in thought. Penny shot a glance to William over the platters of mutton and vegetables, who shrugged imperceptibly. I do worry about you, Annabella, especially visiting the quay on your own. Please tell us next time, and William shall see you safely home, Penny continued. We don't want impulsive young men to be impudent with you. Oh no, I was fine, Annabella replied, looking up a little in alarm. Her eyes quickly darted between William and Penny, who both pretended to be very busy navigating roasted potatoes about their plates. Penny heard rather than saw Annabella sigh and slump a little in her chair. Keeping her eyes firmly on her plate, Penny blithely asked, Is everything all right, dear? I think so, that is, yes. I mean, well, no, Annabella said. What does it mean if a young man asks to escort you home? Penny nearly dropped her fork at this question taking a moment to sip her wine again. I imagine that would depend greatly on the young man and lady in question, she replied. And if the young man was a gentleman, William interjected. I believe he was, yes, Annabella said, distractedly pushing some peas about her plate. Penny caught William's eye and exchanged another look with him. Well, then I would say that it would seem to me that this gentleman was showing interest in the young lady. Penny said slowly. Oh. This small word was uttered with such a degree of enlightenment by Annabella that Penny looked directly at William again. This time his face broke into a wide grin and he ducked his head and hid his mouth behind his napkin. Penny too coughed delicately and reached for her own napkin to hide a matching grin. In the warm light of the candles, Annabella's eyes were far away and soft but her cheeks were colouring. It was quite clear to those veterans of love that Annabella was in great danger of forming some sort of attachment. Silently, indicated with only the smallest lifting of the brows, it was decided between Penny and William that they would remain silent on the subject. Though this would be something of an ordeal for Penny, she knew that her dear friend was a novice in love and was likely to shy away if Penny pried. Annabella was always a beautiful girl, but with her shining eyes and glowing cheeks, she was positively radiant. Though Penny was dimly aware that she should be giving a lecture on the dangers of attachments she couldn't bring herself to. By the time dinner was concluded and Annabella had walked home, the sun was well and truly set. Her feet ached, and she was thinking longingly of her small but comfortable bed. A small drizzle had begun to fall, just enough for the streets to become slick. It was understandable then that by the time she reached the shop door and began to unlock it, she nearly missed the package secreted in the doorway. It was about the size of a large book and slim. The wrapping was plain, being brown paper tied with string. There was nothing on it to suggest who it was from, but it was clearly intended for her. Her hand still held the large key which was inserted in the door, partially turned. Annabella was unable to take her eyes from the package. Feeling a little as if she were in a dream, she bent down to retrieve it. Her fingers fumbled a little as she tried to untie the string. When at last the contents were revealed, Annabella inhaled sharply. 
Within was a beautiful new folio, dark purple in colour with gold embossed filigrees at the corners. It was tied with matching purple satin ribbon. It was a beautiful thing. As she liberated it further from the brown paper, a small white card fell out. Picking it up, she read the one-line note written on it. A fine modista should have a fine folio. Chapter 15 Lady Patience could not stop stealing glances at herself in the mirror. She turned this way and that, lifting her arms a little. The sight made Annabella smile. It had been worth the long night to complete this ensemble for the young lady. Lady Patience wore a day dress of pale green cotton with ribbon work flowers at the hem. The bodice was closely fitted, with the skirt draping elegantly from the high empire style waist, emphasised with velvet ribbon the colour of dark gold. The maid had dressed Patience's hair simply but elegantly, applying the curling tongs judiciously at her temples and the nape of her neck. A matching tippet of dark green lined and tied with matching ribbon draped from Lady Patience's shoulders. It was lined in a deep pink silk satin which peeked out whenever Patience moved. I still cannot believe this is me, Patience murmured for about the dozenth time. Annabella gently straightened the tippet, brushing the back so that it fell smoothly. It is all you, my lady, Annabella said with a smile. Lady Patience is due to attend her first society event, an informal tea at a friend of the Duchess. It was hoped this would give her a gentle test run of being out before she was formally presented. Annabella had worked through the night to ensure Patience would be well turned out for the occasion. I do hope they like me, Patience fretted as she turned about one more time before the mirror. Why shouldn't they? Annabella scoffed lightly. You are kind and clever. Just look up occasionally and they will adore you. Patience, smiling gratefully, turned away from her reflection to take Annabella's hands. Thank you, Miss Kelly. You really are too generous by half. Annabella pressed her hands fondly before releasing them to begin gathering her things. I must be going. I would not wish to delay you. I wish you were coming with me, Patience said wistfully. But then who would finish your new evening gown, hmm? Annabella replied, teasing. The effect of the tease was somewhat lost, however, when she had to stifle a yawn. I really do hope you aren't working yourself too hard on my behalf, Patience said, coming forward solicitously. Please tell me that you are allowing a little time for yourself, or I shall be very cross indeed. Annabella glanced up from where she was putting pins and measuring tapes back into her basket. In her delicate dress and with her angelic face, it was hard to imagine Lady Patience being cross about anything ever. Annabella had never met such a sweet, serene girl. Still, Patience did her best impression of disapproval, folding her arms and tapping one of her shiny brown leather walking boots. Annabella straightened and lifted her hands in surrender. Don't fret. I haven't been neglecting myself. At Patience's sceptically lifted eyebrow, Annabella continued hesitantly. I even took the time to walk with a friend just the other day. Did you? Patience inquired, her light green eyes searching Annabella's. Why, Miss Kelly, you are blushing? Annabella clapped a hand to her cheeks, highly disturbed to find that they were, in fact, rather warm. Oh, dear, she muttered. Lady Patience gasped and seized Annabella's wrists. Was it your suitor, the one you mentioned last week? You must tell me everything. Helpless, Annabella allowed herself to be directed to the chair in Patience's sitting room. Patience took her customary place on the settee, leaning her elbows on the armrest. I'm not sure there is much to tell, Annabella admitted. He simply escorted me home from the quay. Patience made a sound of disbelief. That cannot be all else you would not colour so. Well, Annabella allowed, there may be more to it, but I am not certain. We must get to the bottom of this immediately, Patience announced, reaching up to untie her tippet so that it slipped from her shoulders. Start from the beginning. I believe that he is a gentleman, Annabella explained. He speaks well and dresses like one. Where did you meet him? Patience demanded. 
on the street outside, if you can believe it, Annabel said with a grin. Well, that speaks well to his chances of being a gentleman, Patience said with a thoughtful nod. Her eyes flicked to the window and back again. This is a terribly tunny neighbourhood after all. Annabella nodded her agreement. Very much so. So how did he come to escort you home? Annabella grinned a little at Patience's eagerness. The girl was clearly a hopeless romantic, and a clandestine liaison with a handsome stranger was exactly the sort of thing she loved. Purely by happenstance, we happened to be at the fabric warehouse at the same time. He asked that I help him select some wall coverings, hardly the most romantic of activities, and then offered to escort me home. Naturally, Annabella omitted the part, where he had a smile that made her heart flutter like an anxious butterfly. Patience, however, was not in the least deterred. It must have been fate, she breathed. She clapped her hands together, fingers knitting together. What are the odds that you would run into each other like that in the whole of London? she demanded. Annabella, though a bit more sceptical, did have to admit that the chances were slim. It does seem unlikely. Is that all? Patience inquired, leaning forward again. Annabella hedged her words for a moment, looking up at the ceiling as she thought. Patience, ever the perceptive one, immediately reached out to grasp Annabella's hand. There is more. I can see it. Well, I have no proof, but I did return home to find a gift on my doorstep two nights ago, Annabella admitted. Patience gasped a little again. A gift? What sort of gift? she demanded. Rather than answer immediately, Annabella reached into her large basket and withdrew the new folio. Patience exhaled appreciatively when she saw it, admiring the lovely colour and sheen of the leather. Annabella put it into Patience's hands, who traced some of the gold embossing. Oh, Annabella, this is so lovely, and so well suited to your tastes. Annabella was inclined to agree, but said nothing. Truthfully, it had unnerved her a bit how much she liked the gift. She was not sure what it was supposed to mean, and had even hesitated to use it until she had seen how shabby her old folio was. There's more. Annabella said, reaching into her pocket and withdrawing the little card with the note written on it. She handed it over to Patience as well and watched as the young lady mouthed the words written on it. I am just not certain what to make of it all. Patience turned wide eyes on her. Isn't it obvious? When Annabella shook her head, she continued. He could have given you a generic gift, the sort of thing any young man might give to just any young lady a box of sweets, a piece of ribbon, all of that nonsense. Instead, he has given you something that is for you. Annabella's eyes shifted to the folio again. She couldn't help but smile a little when she saw it, her cheeks colouring again. It really was beautiful, and exactly the kind of thing she would have wished for, but never bought herself. So, you believe there is more to this gift? Patience shook her head slowly, smiling her small smile. I can't say that for certain. What I do know is that through his words and actions, he has told you that he values you as a professional and as a woman. That is quite the compliment, if you ask me. We should all be so lucky. This last sentence was said with just the whisper of a sigh. Annabella looked down at her hands for a moment, her thumb rubbing the callus on her forefinger from holding a needle. I suspect that he is a country gentleman in London for the season, possibly even titled. Why is that? He seemed most reluctant to give me his name, Annabella sighed. Oh, Patience said, deflating a little. Precisely, Annabella agreed. Both girls sagged a little. The implications of that were enough to put quite a damper on their hopeful romanticism. A clock ticked away the minutes the sounds from the street carrying in through the partially open window. Miss Kelly, Patience asked at last. Annabella lolled her head that rested on the back of her chair over to look at Patience. Would you forgive me if I said something truly scandalous? Perhaps, Annabella said, one side of her mouth lifting in a grin. 
particularly if it is delightfully amusing or saucy. Patience blushed a little. Well, maybe it shouldn't matter if he's a gentleman, or titled, or a monk, or the King of Spain. What do you mean? Maybe it should only matter that a handsome young man wishes to pay you attention, Patience said with a sly look. Annabella blinked. Why, Lady Patience, are you suggesting that I should pass the time with a young man simply because it is nice to do so? Patience didn't answer immediately, and the silence stretched. Both girls turned to each other at exactly the same moment. When their eyes met, they both made identical one-shouldered shrugs. This, of course, only sent them laughing again, which is precisely how the Duchess found them when she arrived to announce that it was time for them to depart. Annabella wasn't sure why, but the Duchess's eyes lingered on both her and Patience for a moment too long. Perhaps it was simply maternal disapproval, Annabella thought as she resumed readying herself to return to her shop. But the Duchess hadn't looked cross. For just the briefest instance, she had looked unbearably sad. Chapter 16 The smell of meat roasted on an open spit wafted out the door of the so-called restaurateur, inviting passers-by in. There was always a small crowd milling about outside, usually a mix of those awaiting dining companions, and those lured by the delicious smells, but unsure of the propriety of eating in public. Annabella suffered from no such compulsions, particularly as her fingers were sore and stiff from work. Moreover, she was quite confident that she deserved a bit of a treat. She had completed two day dresses, a tippet, two evening chemises, and one evening gown in record time. Her eyes felt gritty from the strain of staring down at the stitches so small they were almost invisible. She was particularly chuffed to see that a small corner table was available. The high-backed benches provided a feeling of seclusion, muffling the boisterous sounds of the establishment quite a bit. Annabella was happy to settle in and watch the other patrons. Though the smell of roasted meat was what drew customers in, it was the bouillon that those in the know kept returning for time and again. The chef was French, rumoured to have fled Paris with his master at the beginning of the terror. In gratitude to helping him escape, the story went, the master helped the chef to establish his own restaurateur. Annabella was not sure if the story was true, but the chef did sport a thick French accent and French snobbery, as well as a curious scar on his upper lip. Annabella gratefully accepted the glass of ale that was poured for her, happy to be off her feet for a while. As the crowd was quite mixed, she was glad of the chance to observe them from a distance. It was an opportunity to keep an eye out for new fashions and trends. After all, it was here that she had seen her first pair of full-length trousers on a man. Her eyes were generally browsing the crowd, not particularly focusing on anything, when she spotted a familiar face headed her way. At first she thought that she might have been dreaming, for time did seem to slow unnaturally. But no, it really was Mr Hardy moving through the crowded restaurateur. Annabella felt helplessly rooted to the spot, as Mr Hardy turned in a slow circle his eyes surveying the tables and other patrons. It would have been easy enough for Annabella to turn away and shield her face, or even to duck out of sight. But strangely, she found that she did not wish to. In fact, her heart was beating faster and faster as Mr Hardy's gaze languidly searched, coming closer and closer to herself. When at last his dark blue eyes met hers, Mr Hardy broke into a slow, genuine smile that Annabella was unable to stop herself from reciprocating. He made his way through the crowd easily, coming to stand before her. With the limited space, he was only able to remove his dark grey hat and bow his head, which Annabella acknowledged with a dip of her own head. Miss Kelly, Mr Hardy said, still smiling, would you mind terribly if I joined you? It would seem that yours is the only table with an available seat. Annabella quickly darted a glance about the crowded room. It was perfectly believable that he spoke truthfully. It was some concern that someone might see her dining in public unchaperoned with a man, but Annabella could not help but think of Patience's earlier advice. So she found herself nodding, tacitly inviting Mr Hardy to sit. 
watching him wrangle his tall frame into the small space of the booth, was worth the price of accepting his invitation. He caught Annabella grinning at his struggle and cast her a baleful look, which only made her laugh. Have you ordered something for yourself yet? he asked when he was finally settled. Annabella nodded. They are rather famous for their bouillon, she explained. Mr Hardy nodded and flagged down a waiter to order some as well. As they waited, Annabella found herself in something of a quiet panic. She had only thought far enough ahead to allowing Mr Hardy to sit, thinking of how pleasing he would look across the table from herself. It had not actually occurred to her that they would be in quite close quarters and expected to make conversation. But what does one even say to a man in this situation? She thought, just a touch frantically. She had never been one for novels, and her mother had never prepared herself for this moment. Likely she never thought I would do something so brazen. Annabella grumbled inwardly. Suddenly she became aware that Mr Hardy was watching her intently from across the table. Am I very amusing to you, Mr Hardy? Annabella asked it archly. More of a vaguely frustrating mystery, Mr Hardy replied, the corners of his eyes creasing. You appeared to be having an entire dialogue within, and I was attempting to guess what it might be about. Mostly wondering what my mother would make of this situation, Annabella admitted with a nod toward Mr Hardy. We dined in public on occasion out of necessity, but to do so unchaperoned with a single young man. I can only hope she would not be too scandalised. Mr Hardy laughed. My own father would very likely have been in quite the state as well. Annabella's ears perked up at that. Your father would disapprove? Without a doubt, though it would have more to do with the fact that I was eating in London than the present company, I am confident, Mr Hardy said dipping his head in thanks as the waiter deposited his own glass of ale. He did not approve of London then? Certainly not. He was a countryman through and through, Mr Hardy confirmed. Is your mother's opinion of great concern to you? Annabella was taken a little aback by that. I think that is true for any young lady. An inscrutable look passed over Mr Hardy's face again. True enough. But you speak of your mother without bile or bitterness, only the barest hint of sorrow. Annabella could feel her inner defences weakening. She was not sure how much to share with this stranger. But then the entire point of the evening was likely to become better acquainted. In fact, she suspected Mr Hardy was haunting the neighbourhood on the chance of seeing her again, and reticence would not help. Besides which, Annabella thought a little mischievously, Let's see if he's not a little put off by my unconventional history. Well, to understand fully, you should know that the woman I called Mama was not actually my mother, Annabella began, carefully watching Mr Hardy's face. She adopted me when I was quite young, not even two years old. Were you a relation of hers? he asked, taking a small sip of his ale. Annabella smiled a little when his eyes lit up in pleasure as he clearly had expected it to be fool. Not at all, Annabella continued. According to her, she found my washed up on a beach near Belfast, barely clinging to a piece of wood. There had been a terrible wreck the night before, any drowned as I understand it. Something in Mr Hardy's expression changed, and Annabella was alarmed to think that he might be pitying her. Please do not feel sorry for me, she said hurriedly. Prudence Kelly... The woman who adopted me was the kindest and best of mothers. Ever were we each other's companions, not just mother and daughter, but best friends too. Annabella fell silent, finding that her throat had grown a painful lump. She reached for her glass and swigged, hoping to wash down the emotions. You miss her greatly, Mr Hardy said with surprising softness. Annabella, still unable to speak, only nodded. She taught you your trade then? Again, Annabella nodded. How wonderful for you to have a part of her with you always then. Startled, Annabella looked up. Again, some shadow seemed to pass over Mr Hardy's face, but it did not diminish the gentle expression she found there. Whatever she had expected of Mr Hardy, it was not for him to be so perceptive, so understanding. 
This is part of why my work is so important to me, Annabella said. I feel a duty not just to my mother as a person, but to her memory. She wished for our shop to be a success, for us to be comfortable and secure. If I fail, it feels like not only would I be disappointing her, but plain disrespecting her too. They were interrupted briefly by the arrival of their bowls of steaming bouillon. Annabella inhaled deeply, the thick, dark broth giving off a rich smell. Mr Hardy, too, seemed surprised again by the quality and scent, if not the humble nature of the bowl and spoon provided. Annabella watched him expectantly as he took a first hesitant spoonful. His eyes went a little wide, and his brows lifted in slight astonishment. That really is quite good, he said. Annabella nodded smugly and tucked into her own bouillon. They ate in enjoyable silence, letting the sounds of the crowd wash over them. What of you, then? she asked when they were nearly done. Were you very close to your parents? I didn't really know my mother, Mr Hardy said. I had always entertained the notion that I was close to my father. I was his only child, after all. But, Annabella prompted, unable to stop herself, when Mr Hardy paused. But I suppose after his passing, it made me question how much it's possible to really know another person, Mr Hardy finished. I suppose in the end, I never asked the right questions, and thus he never gave me the answers I would need later, he said cryptically. I know a little of what you mean, I think, Annabella said carefully. They are always in our lives, so we expect them to be a permanent fixture. It doesn't occur to us that we will have unanswered questions when they are taken too early. Yes, that is it precisely, Mr Hardy agreed. There was another lull in the conversation as they finished their bouillon. When they had finished, Annabella found that Mr Hardy was studying her again. She swallowed and avoided his gaze, pretending to be engrossed in watching the crowd again. You are staring, Mr Hardy, she said at last. From the corner of her eye, she could see him smile his slow smile. I am, he agreed. Forgive me, I was just wondering at the strange state of the world when a dressmaker understands death and duty better than any poor tutor my father found for me. Annabella grinned, which quickly turned mischievous. Perhaps he would have been better off to hire a seamstress to teach you instead she suggested. Mr Hardy laughed at that, a rich, full sound that made Annabella blush again. When he had composed himself, it was her turn to study him. He was clearly a man of means, but humble enough to eat in public with a dressmaker, without a trace of shame. If he were truly just a rich man slumming, only looking for a bit of amusement, he wouldn't have bothered with such a personal gift. Nor would he have spent so much time getting to know you, Annabella thought. I must thank you for your beautiful gift, Annabella said suddenly. Ah, so you received it then? I was a little concerned an urchin may make off with it, Mr Hardy said. If I had known your initials, I might have had it monogrammed for you. No, thank you, sir, that would have really been too much. Annabella looked about herself, realising that she had been lost in conversation for too long. The other patrons were slowly filing out, leaving the room much quieter and calmer. She stood suddenly upsetting the table a little as she did so. Forgive me, I've lost track of the hour, she said hurriedly over the sound of the spoons rattling inside the bowls. I really must be going. Mr Hardy, looking a little alarmed at this sudden change, rose too. If you would permit me, I could... But Annabella was already halfway across the room weaving her way around and through a group of men finishing their ales and pipes. She could hear Mr Hardy attempting to catch up to her, but Annabella was nimble-footed and knew this neighbourhood well. Once she was out on the street, it was easy enough to lose him. It wasn't that she hadn't enjoyed his company, she had far more than she had expected to, but she couldn't afford an entanglement. This was especially true when everything in his manner seemed to point to him being a country squire or baron and there was no way for that to end in a way that didn't break Annabella's heart. Mama always did say that work would be your truest companion, Annabella thought. Only a little sadly, 
as she made her way up the back stairs to her living quarters. Chapter 17 The Duke of Brandon did not mean to stare. He was quite unconscious that he was doing so until Lady Patience looked up at him briefly and then blushed deeply. The young lady had undergone something of a transformation in her appearance since the Duke had last seen her. Gone were the awkward frills and full skirt, replaced by smooth lines and a chic simplicity. She wore a white muslin dress, tied about the waist with a green embroidered ribbon. The Duke's gaze was drawn to that ribbon, and he could not help but smile a little when he saw tiny golden butterflies hidden in the pattern. Of course, he thought with a surprising amount of fondness, Miss Kelly has been working her magic. It was a strange sensation to know Lady Patience's modiste better than he knew the young lady herself. He could not help comparing the two, for there was something alike in their colouring. The main difference was that where Lady Patience's eyes were pale green and frequently downturned, Miss Kelly's were deeper green and sparkled with lively interest. The weather is quite fine today, is it not? The Duchess of Sussex said pointedly and a bit louder than to simply be conversation. The Duke started a little, looking about himself and nodded automatically. Yes, very fine, he agreed without really meaning to. The Duchess watched him closely, a satisfied look crossing her face. She clearly thought the Duke's staring had been the product of Lady Patience's transformation. He supposed it had been in part, but not in the way in which the Duchess assumed. In actuality, his mind had been far from the small table which had been placed in the Duchess's back garden. Alan knew that it was quite wrong to be staring at one's intended and be daydreaming of another, or even to compare the two, but he felt a strange sort of helplessness when it came to Miss Kelly. He could not keep her from his thoughts for any length of time, a most strange phenomenon he had never experienced before. The Duchess continued speaking and Alan nodded politely when it seemed conversation required him to. He bent his head and focused on his plate, which was loaded with cold meats, asparagus in a cream sauce and miniature egg-filled pie. The Duchess of Sussex had invited him to luncheon, which was served al fresco to celebrate the warm spring sun. The garden had been brought back to life rather hastily, the planting beds still showing freshly turned earth between the flowers. It was a small space with thick, high walls that blocked the sounds from the surrounding streets. There was an ancient oak tree in one corner that provided shade, but the rest of the garden was neatly ordered rows of hedges and plantings. It unfortunately made Alan feel a bit claustrophobic, in spite of the aesthetic beauty. In fairness to the garden, it could just as easily have been the situation he found himself in as much as the garden itself. Lady Patience looked every bit a respectable young society lady and would doubtless make a very proper companion. Alan didn't have any real objections to her as a person. A large portion of his discomfort was no doubt brought on by the fact that he had been pushed rather forcefully into the arrangement. I understand that the gardens at your estate are very extensive, Duke, the Duchess said, clearly attempting to draw him out. The Duke nodded politely, placing his fork on his plate. Yes, Duchess. My father and grandfather both made many improvements. I heard your father brought back some fine statues on his tour of Athens, the Duchess continued. I've been considering if this garden might benefit from a little ornamentation. Of course, I don't trust my own judgment on this subject. Perhaps you would be willing to take a turn about the grounds and see if one might suit. I'm not sure I'm the person to ask, Duchess, the Duke replied blandly. It was my father, not me, that had the eye for landscaping. Oh, pish posh, the Duchess said with a dismissive wave of her hand. You have been surrounded by it your whole life. You surely have absorbed something. Patience, perhaps you might show the Duke about. I would show you myself, Duke, the Duchess continued but I'm afraid that my joints are a bit put out by all the rain we've had recently. The Duke cast an eye up to the sky, which was blue in every direction. It took much of his willpower to repress an audible sigh. He knew this game all too well, 
society matrons would arrange convenient excuses for young people to spend thoroughly respectable time in each other's company. In the Duke's mind, it would be far easier and simpler if everyone would just speak their intentions openly. Still, he rose dutifully, taking his napkin from his collar and placing it on the table. Would you be willing to show me about Lady Patience? he asked. Lady Patience blushed again, but nodded her head as was expected. A footman darted forward to carefully pull her chair out as she rose. The Duke and Patience walked in uncomfortable silence across the garden, their shoes crunching along the gravel path. Again, the Duke could not help but compare this to his walk with Annabella. There too had been silences, but they had been ones of mutual enjoyment and contemplation. This silence was awkward and born of uncertainty. Have you been well, my lady? The Duke asked finally, out of desperation. Now it was Lady Patience's turn to start, clearly having been deep in her own thoughts. Yes, thank you, she answered so softly that the Duke barely heard her. Another silence followed. This time he did not bother to suppress a sigh. They had reached the corner of the garden that was opposite the large tree. They both stood around, shifting from side to side and doing their utmost to avoid looking at each other. I'm... I'm very sorry about all this, Lady Patience said in a halting, trembling voice. The Duke turned to look at her, eyebrows twitching upward in surprise. Patience nodded toward the Duchess, who was busy acting as if she wasn't watching their every move. The Duke smiled a bit at Patience. Don't trouble yourself. I've grown rather used to it. Patience tilted her head, inquiring. Ah, mothers frequently invent contrived ways for me to be in the company of their daughters, he explained. Oh, she replied softly. I wouldn't know. No, I expect you wouldn't, the Duke agreed before he could catch himself. To his surprise, Lady Patience shrugged her shoulder with a little tilt of her head. The gesture was familiar somehow and made the Duke frown in thought. Don't apologise. I know my situation is unusual. Her honesty astonished the Duke a little. While she bent to look at some roses that were just bursting out of their buds, the Duke studied her again. Have you really not been out into society at all? Patience shook her head her blonde curls bouncing. Not once, unless you count a few dreary neighbours that call for tea or dinner twice a month. Does this bother you? The Duke asked, finding himself stepping closer to Patience. His curiosity about the girl was winning out over his apprehension of the situation. Again, Patience made a delicate little shrug. It might, if I knew what I was missing. I'm not sure I should mind even then. I am a simple person, Your Grace, and I wish only for simple things. The Duke pulled back a little, struck by her frank openness. She really isn't a society lady. She is far too good and honest, he thought wryly. He recognised in her a kind of simple purity. She was uncomplicated and would make for an uncomplicated marriage. There was something to be said for that but the Duke did not want a wife that would simply fade into the background of his estate. It wasn't that the Duke was overly fond of parties or the like. It was that he wished for a wife as strong as he was in personality and mind, someone that would help him fulfil his ambitions for his family and title. The Duke turned and studied Patience with fresh eyes. Standing in the sun, her dark blonde hair shone, and her ivory skin showed to good advantage. Her features were delicate, the very picture of an English rose. The Duke couldn't deny that she was a beautiful girl. For many, this fact and her name would have been enough. But it wasn't enough for the Duke. It may have been once. But that was before he had met Miss Kelly. Her presence haunted his memories. The way she had smiled at him, nearly glowing in the dim light of the restaurateur, had lived in his mind in the few days since. She had spoken so elegantly of duty and dedication that it stung a bit at his own sense of responsibility. He was treading a dangerous path, and he well knew it. There was no other way for a flirtation with Miss Kelly to end other than heartbreak.
likely for the both of them. For all his heart was conflicted, the Duke knew his duty and he would not abandon it. His eyes were drawn to patience again, and he wished that he could just love this strange, silent girl for all their sakes. Chapter 18 Annabella pulled the silk thread through the small block of beeswax, then rapidly threw her thumb and forefinger twice, ensuring an even coating. In a movement so practiced that it was automatic, she deftly looped the thread around her finger and pulled it tight, forming a knot. With steady, sure hands, she then began making a series of stitches in the delicate, snowy cotton batiste before her. She was absorbed in her work, humming a little to herself as she sat at the counter of her shop. It was mid-afternoon, and the streets outside still hummed with activity. In her shop, however, it was quiet and still. The few customers that entered spoke in low tones. As they were typically seeking small, sundry items, Annabella left them to the girl she had recently taken on, Mary. So great was her attention to her work that Annabella did not even look up when the bell above her door clanged. That changed, however, when she heard a familiar voice. I am looking for Miss Kelly, Lady Patience said so quietly that Annabella could barely hear her. Mary was not a particularly worldly girl, being a sturdy country lass at heart, but she had a peasant's instinctual recognition of a great lady when she saw one. She bobbed an ungraceful curtsy to Lady Patience and said, This way, if you please, my lady. Lady Patience, Annabella greeted her without her hands missing a beat. What on earth are you doing here? Patience approached the counter shyly, but couldn't keep herself from grinning. Mother was occupied this evening and was under strict instructions to entertain myself. And you took this to mean coming on your own to my shop? Annabella asked. Though she spoke with a sceptically arched brow, she couldn't help but returning Patience's grin. There was just something inherently likeable about her. But I'm not on my own, Patience protested. She tossed her head and moved to the side slightly, revealing her maid trailing behind her by some feet. Annabella paused her work, looking at Patience with a new light. Did you really walk all the way here? Patience shrugged a little and gestured to the street. Outside, a stately carriage was parked at the curb with a pair of gleaming chestnut horses. Not exactly no, Patience admitted. Annabella sat in stunned silence for a moment. Well, you're here now, she said at last. Would you like some tea? I would, thank you, Patience said. Annabella nodded to Mary, who scuttled off, no doubt chuffed beyond belief that she would wait on a duchess's daughter. Annabella rose and gestured to one of the plush upholstered chairs that clients sat in while being waited on. Annabella took the chair opposite a small table with a vase of dried flowers between them. She looked at Patience expectantly. You're wondering why I'm here, aren't you? Patience asked. Annabella nodded. Well, I was hoping we could speak. I don't really have anyone else to talk with and... I am glad of the company, Annabella said with a smile. I could probably do with a break anyway. Oh, Patience said, blinking rapidly. You were working. Of course you were. What a silly thing to ask, she chided herself. You will think me very foolish, but it didn't occur to me that you would actually be working. At your job. Where you work. A crease appeared between her brows. Annabella laughed lightly and attempted to wave off her concern. Don't worry about it, my lady. No, I should worry about it, Patience insisted. You see? This is what a sheltered, naive child I am still. I have never known what a life of work meant. Peering closer at Patience, Annabella saw her bite her lip. She did not speak immediately, waiting for Mary to come and hand them their tea with another awkward curtsy. We'll have to work on that, Annabella noted mentally. Though her personal china was rather plain, her mother had always insisted on keeping a couple nicer cups for their customers. The cups were white with delicate pink and blue flowers on the sides, with handles that had a tiny moulded butterfly at the top where it met the cup. Is something troubling you, my lady? Annabella asked neutrally. 
Patience didn't respond, only stared down at her teacup that she held carefully in her lap. Annabella waited, not chivying her for an answer. She sipped the tea, appreciating the warm blend. I luncheoned with my intended today. Patience sighed at last. Annabella paused mid-sip and gave her a significant look over the top of her cup. It wasn't... Terrible, Patience continued. But it wasn't brilliant either, Annabella asked gently. No, Patience agreed. He's nice and biddable enough and handsome, but... She gave a sort of flip-flop gesture with her free hand. I can't help but feel like I am a disappointment to him, and truthfully I'm not thrilled with the match myself. Did he speak disagreeably to you? Annabella asked, her eyes sharpening on Patience. The protective feelings that surged through her were unexpected, but she couldn't help it. She had a soft spot in her heart for Patience. Oh no, Patience said with a shake of her head. The pink feathers on her bonnet fluttered as she did so. It's more that we are so very poorly suited. He is a duke from an old and grand family, and I know that he expects a wife that will be a helpmate in that regard. You are also the daughter of a duke, Annabella reminded her. Patience nodded. Oh, I know that, but the thought of spending time at court, in the company of the Queen and the Prince Regent, all seems frightfully grand. I just don't think I am made for that sort of life. Annabella watched Patience thoughtfully. It was a trifle difficult to imagine her in the company of princes. She would be completely overshadowed and wilt away. Well, Annabella said slowly, what sort of life are you made for? Patience seemed taken aback by the question, straightening and toying with a small gold crucifix she wore around her neck. I don't know, not yet. Something quiet, where I might raise my children in peace, away from all of this, she said, gesturing broadly about her to encompass all of London. I know the ton goes rushing into the city for the season, but I just do not see the appeal. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Want to just be Mrs Smith or whoever, not a grand lady? That's it precisely. I see Mother dealing with the tenants and the land agents and all of it just overwhelms me. I would like to think I could do good in that sort of position. But the idea of someone under my charge coming to me for help or advice is just terrifying, Patience said, growing more certain as she spoke. Annabella sat quietly, not having an answer for her. Patience, too, fell silent, looking not precisely unhappy, but troubled at least. Glancing over at her, Annabella couldn't help but feel another stab of pity. Well, she said with a coy glint to her eye. Seeing as you have trusted me your confidences, I wonder if I might do the same. Instantly, Patience was sitting upright, her remaining tea sloshing dangerously in the cup. Have you seen your mystery suitor again? Annabella said nothing, but shrugged and grinned in such a manner that it was certain what the answer was. Tell me everything! Annabella complied, sparing no detail. Patience listened with rapt attention, gasping in the right places and putting a hand on Annabella's arm when she described her mother finding her as a babe. He must be fond of you, there's no doubt of it, Patience said authoritatively when Annabella had finished. You may be right, Annabella agreed, but I am not sure that it matters. You still believe him to be a member of the ton, then? Annabella nodded a little grimly which cannot end well. I won't be a rich man's mistress, and a rich man would have to be a fool to marry me. Patience reached over and took Annabella's hand with an automatic swiftness. Both sat, lost in thought about the poor state of their social lives. Annabella looked down to where Patience held her hand in her own, her dusty periwinkle glove smooth and supple against the calluses of Annabella's fingers. I know that you came to confide in me, but I confess that I am immensely relieved to be able to confide in you too, Annabella said. Patience looked up, her shy smile growing. 
I have only one other friend and no mother to ask about these things. Whereas I have no friends and entirely too much mother, Patience supplied. Annabella nodded and both girls chuckled. Annabella stood. Well, since you are here, perhaps we should take advantage of your presence and fit you for your last evening gown. I hope to have it completed this week, and then your first ball gown soon after. Patience paled a little at the mention of the ball gown. Annabella, seeing this, hesitated and bent down to make eye contact with Patience again. Now, none of that. When we are done, you will be like a butterfly spreading your wings for the first time. Chapter 19 Though the Duchess had long been sitting out the complex dance that was high society, she still knew the steps. Her friends may be old, but they were from old, highly influential families. She had been busy ever since she had arrived in London with patients, paying calls, sending out cards, having notes delivered. It was all in an effort to add a veneer of respectability to present situation. Rumours had run rampant in her absence, which would have been troubling for most. Duchess Lavinia Carnegie knew that the real trouble was when they stopped talking about you. Her financial situation was precarious, and she was trading much on her husband's good name. Still, nearly every day a messenger or footman came bearing gifts and tokens from the friends that remained. A posy of pink carnations had arrived at regular intervals, accompanied by a card from the Vicomte Soissons du Lac, written in a shaky hand. This always made her sigh in exasperation, but always with a hint of a smile. The Duke of Brandon's reluctance was not helping the Duchess to sleep at night, in spite of her myriad connections. There wasn't a mother in London who wouldn't envy the catch, and she was thoroughly determined to successfully reel him in, no matter how much he strained and wriggled. Even if he dragged his feet, all signs pointed to an engagement before the end of the season. A marriage couldn't be far behind. The hastiness of it all was leading to more than a few raised brows. That will be forgotten soon enough, the Duchess reassured herself. She was sitting in bed, sipping a glass of wine while her long-suffering maid bustled about. Scattered all about her across the dull pink bedspread were letters and invitations. She would lift one, inspect it carefully with a frown, and then place it into one of three piles. To be accepted, to be seen to be considered, and to be rejected. Occasionally she would state a name, and her lady's maid would stop what she was doing to add it to a growing list. These names warranted further investigation in order to decide if they were respectable and tony enough. The biggest hurdle by far was Patience's impending presentation. The Duchess had made up her mind to cancel it on more than one occasion, putting it off to next season. But no, it wouldn't do. Patience could only attend dinners at home until she was formally presented at court, curtsying to the Queen. She had already placed the order for the court gown from the traditional maker. In the hopes of making it as easy as possible, the Duchess had already paid an informal visit to the Queen Mother. The Duchess had been received warmly, especially as she had once been lady-in-waiting to the Queen. They had spent a congenial afternoon sipping tea and tippling something a bit stronger as the hours wore on, it must be admitted, full of reminiscences. The King's health was a matter of much speculation and few knew the extent of his condition. Not even the Duchess had been fully aware, but a few indirect questions to the Queen had given her all the information she needed. Quite unexpectedly for a royal couple, the King and Queen had been well suited and immensely fond of one another. Though ostensibly still married, the Queen had lost her husband years ago. The Duchess commiserated with her, knowing what it was to lose such a love. Though it had cost her a pounding head the next day, the Duchess considered this visit well worth the effort. The Queen Mother was disposed to be kind to Patience, and the approval of a Queen could go far in smoothing any of the other troubles. The Duchess reached for another envelope and deftly opened it. The heading said Madame Kelly's fine fashions for the discerning lady, and below that was a neatly itemised list with a total at the bottom. It was the latest bill, signed with a flourish by the dressmaker herself. 
A sigh filled the room as the Duchess considered. She couldn't deny that the young dressmaker was worth every penny. Patience had never looked so well, and she seemed to be finding it a comfort to have someone her own age to speak with. The Duchess felt an unaccustomed prick of guilt, wondering if she had done the right thing in keeping patients sequestered as she did. There was something that unsettled the Duchess about the dressmaker, however. She had no complaints about Miss Kelly's work, quite the opposite, in fact. But there was still some niggling detail that bothered the Duchess. The dressmaker is a trifle over-familiar. She has little sense of the correct boundaries, the Duchess thought, waving the bill slightly as she mused. Even so, it was entirely possible that this had been done in an effort to put patients at ease, which she couldn't really fault Miss Kelly for. But that couldn't really be the only thing for the Duchess had found her unsettling even before she had agreed to the commission. The dressmaker laughed openly with a little shrug and wave of her hand that the Parisians were so fond of. Every time the Duchess saw it, it made her teeth grit for some unfathomable reason. Well, there's your answer, the Duchess thought with the snideness inherent in her class. One should endeavour to have a Parisian accent, never their manners. The Duchess smirked to herself, studying the carefully printed bill again. That surely must be it. The dressmaker was simply too impertinent and lacking refinements. The Duchess leaned her head back against the bed's headboard. The fabric canopy above her was dark pink to match the bedspread, edged in gold fringe. The last time she had been in this bed, she had been a newlywed, full of hope for the future, believing all things were possible. She had been dreaming of the countless sons she would have, brave, strong boys to carry on her husband's name and title. Now here she was twenty years later, with only the one daughter left to her. Her heart squeezed a little to think of patients being married, living apart from her. It wasn't just that she would be facing the dangers of childbirth and the tribulations of marriage. She expected and understood that, knowing she could do nothing to change it. No, it was also that the Duchess would be losing her only steady companion for the last eighteen years. It had always been the two of them together, and now Patience was being sent out into the wide world, alone. I should have prepared her better, the Duchess thought, tears springing to her eyes. I should have done more. She shook her head a little, trying to clear it. That may well have been true enough but she also knew that she could not have borne putting her darling girl, the only piece of her heart still living, into any kind of danger. Every time a dancing master or tutor came into the home, the Duchess's heart flooded with worry about contagion or undue influence. A log in the fireplace snapped and split open, the fire that had been built against the evening chill flaring for just a moment. The Duchess lowered her eyes to see seizing the poker, jabbing at it fiercely, determined to put it in its proper place. The Duchess smiled wryly, feeling very much the same these days, constantly trying to prod those around her into the place she believed best for them. Duchess Lavinia placed the bill to one side, thought for a moment and lifted it again. Miss Annabella Kelly, she said finally. The maid immediately put the stockings she had been laying out over one arm and bent to write the name down. She paused for a moment and dared a glance at her mistress. The modiste, your grace? she asked. The duchess nodded. The same. Patient spends time in her company. It's imperative that we are sure she is quite respectable. That dispensed with, the duchess took up a fresh sheet of paper. She needed to begin preparations for the ball to celebrate Patience's entry to society. It would have to be a grand affair. The ton would expect it, would accept nothing less from a duchess. More importantly, it would help put the rumours of her precarious situation to rest. It was imperative that she enter negotiations for the marriage contract from as strong a position as possible. If she were lucky, she would even be able to secure a settlement for herself. She glanced to the bill from the dressmaker again. The expenses were adding up. Much can be done on credit and with a title, the Duchess reassured herself. As always in moments of weakness or strife, the Duchess put her hand to her chest, feeling the locket that hung from a long golden chain. Discreetly, she released the catch, 
and couldn't help but smile at the image within. It was a painting of the Duke's eye, all the rage when they had been courting. All the ladies of the court wore them as brooches or pendants. It was something of a game, attempting to match the tiny painting to the owner. Tonight, however, the light green eye that stared back at her seemed to do so disapprovingly. The Duke had always spoken vehemently about the evils of the mania for credit. It was not hard to guess what his feelings would be on the Duchess, largely living on it now. It was easy to blame the wine and the late hour for her maudlin state of mind as the Duchess stared back at the tiny picture in the locket. The miniature began to blur the longer Lavinia looked at it. The Duke may have disapproved of her methods, but in the end he understood duty in a way that went right down to his bones. And right now the Duchess had a duty to their only remaining daughter. Their patience. I won't fail this daughter, the Duchess thought, swiping her thumb across the portrait. I won't let you down, I promise. Chapter 20 I cannot possibly be hearing this right, Penny said for what felt like the dozenth time. Annabella sighed, covering her unease by continuing to pin silk to the lining-covered dress form. Penny was in rare form, round little body pacing back and forth across Annabella's workroom. The flounces on her dress wavered with every step, emphasising her words. A young man has paid you marked attention, a thoroughly respectable young man, I might add, and you have a mind to refuse him? Penny continued. He hasn't made me an offer for me to refuse yet, Annabella protested. She pulled another pin from the small cushion strapped to her wrist, frowned at the way the silk was draping, and refolded it. Penny huffed, clearly having none of it. Annabella spared her a glance and saw that she was removing her bright green wool tall hat. Inwardly, Annabella groaned. To remove her hat meant that Penny was intent on delivering a full-blown sermon. This Mr. Hardy, whoever he is, has made every effort to spend time with you in an acceptable manner, no? Penny demanded. Her hands were curled into fists, which she planted on her hips. I'm not sure I can say that for certain, Annabella said, moving to put the dress form between herself and Penny. Particularly as I'm unconvinced that our meetings were more than coincidence. And he has presented you with a lovely gift that suits you perfectly, Penny continued, as if she hadn't heard Annabella. Her dress seemed to fluff up with indignation, the blush-tinted muslin somewhat underscoring her temper. Only to replace the folio that he ruined, Annabella argued. It was Penny's turn to sigh. Honestly, Annabella... Sometimes I think the only thing you inherited from your mother was her stubbornness. Annabella straightened, fully prepared to make her case, when they were interrupted by the familiar jingling of the bell above the shop door. Glancing at the dress form and down at the pins on her wrist, Annabella exhaled audibly through her nose. Is Mary still out? Penny asked. When Annabella nodded, Penny said, Well, then allow me. Annabella sat down gratefully on her stool again and resumed her pinning, only half listening to what was happening in the front of the store. I'm looking for Miss Kelly, a familiar voice said. Annabella froze, somehow forgetting to breathe. In spite of herself, she found herself leaning toward the door, ears straining. Of course, sir, I shall see if she is available to attend, Penny said in a voice that was positively dripping with relish. Hurriedly, Annabella busied herself, putting on a marvellous show of being too occupied to be eavesdropping. She stuck a pin in erroneously, managing to prick her finger at the same time. She winced, then stuck the finger in her mouth for a moment. Honestly, compose yourself, she chided mentally. When Penny reappeared at the workroom door, her face was smugly bemused. Someone is requesting to speak with Miss Kelly personally she announced. And is this someone a gentleman? Annabella asked without looking up. He is, Penny confirmed. Blonde hair, blue eyes, tall. Penny nodded, and then her eyes grew wide. You didn't say how handsome he was, she said, sotto voice. I thought I may faint when he smiled. 
Penny's eyes narrowed as she looked harder at Annabella. And this is the man you are attempting to refuse? Annabella said nothing, trying to hide her blush by ducking behind her dress form again. She lifted an edge of the silk and began pinning it into pleats. I am indisposed, was all the answer she gave. Penny stood in the doorway to the workroom for a moment, lips pursed in disapproval. At last, she blew out a sigh and returned to the front of the store. Unable to help herself, Annabella dropped the silk and scurried to the workroom doorway. She pressed herself flat against the wall and edged closer, hoping to listen unnoticed. Miss Kelly is regrettably unavailable, Penny announced. Is there something that perhaps I might assist with? We have a fine selection of clocked silk stockings just now. Do you indeed? Though Annabella could not see his face, she could hear the amusement in Mr Hardy's voice. Yes, sir, just over here. These are handmade right here in the shop, using only the finest silk threads. It was clear that Penny was intent on squiring Mr Hardy all about the shop, likely in the hopes that Annabella would make an appearance. For his part, Mr Hardy seemed to bear this good-naturedly. He hemmed and hawed enough to seem as if he had indeed come in simply to browse stockings before delicately extricating himself. When he had left, as signalled by the ringing of the bell again, Annabella scurried back over to her dress form. She put all of her attention into making her face as blank and steady as possible. Penny reappeared some moments later, and her own face was thoughtful. This was vaguely perplexing to Annabella, who had fully expected another whirlwind lecture. Instead, Penny merely sat in the other stool, tracing invisible shapes with one finger across the scratch surface of the work table. Dear, dear Annabella, you know that you are my closest friend, and I have long thought of you as something of a niece, she said eventually. So I say this with all love and regard for you. You are a fool. Annabella looked up, startled. You don't understand, Penny she sighed. What do I not understand? That a man of means has developed a sincere regard for you, Penny demanded. No, Annabella said, a touch more forcefully than she had intended. She stood up, and now it was her turn to pace about. It's not just about him. I believe that he may, in fact, have some measure of feeling for me. We may even be well suited, I don't know, she said, speaking simply as she thought the words. But our lives are not compatible. What do you mean? Penny asked, leaning forward. For one thing, he is a country gentleman, and I suspect a titled one. What do I know of that life? What possible benefit could I be to him? Penny made a sort of snorting, dismissive sound. Now you are being silly. Do you really mean to tell me that you think yourself so dull that you couldn't learn to make yourself useful? Do you believe that you would be the first city girl who found her feet in the countryside? That's not the whole of it, Annabella continued. It's this, she said with a wave that indicated the whole shop. While he may be willing to overlook my occupation and humble origins, I cannot just abandon my mother's life's work. Oh, Annabella, Penny began but was cut off. No, I mean it, Annabella insisted, leaning with her hands on the work table. My mother built all of this for me and left it to me. That would be enough for me to feel no small amount of obligation, but there's more than that. She paused, taking a deep, shaky breath. In her last hours, I promised her that I would be a success. I will not fail her, nor break my promise. There was a profound silence for a moment, filled only by the sound of Annabella's harsh breathing. She wasn't entirely sure why her eyes were filled with tears, but she fixed her eyes wide and refused to shed them. So this is the crux of it, Penny asked softly. This is what you believe your mother wanted for you? Annabella nodded. Oh dear, dear girl, Penny murmured. She placed one hand on Annabella's and sighed again. Annabella tensed up, a lump growing in her throat. For some reason... She could not bear any kindness in that moment. She swallowed hard, then turned away, jabbing pins into the dress form again. Thank you for coming by, Penny. You were most helpful. There was a slight rustling as Penny no doubt straightened up. 
Though she had spoken politely enough, Annabella had clearly dismissed her. Are you certain? There would be no one to mind the shop. Mary will be back at any moment, Annabella insisted. Right on cue, the back door to the shop opened, and Mary breezed in. Ah, there we are, Annabella said pointedly. Penny stood gathering up her hat and gloves. Annabella turned back to her work, refusing to face her again. Annabella, you know I did not mean to offend, she began, but Annabella waved her off. Think nothing of it. It was a pleasure to see you again, Annabella said brusquely, her voice cracking slightly at the last. Wordlessly, Penny departed. Annabella bent over her work, angrily swiping at tears that insisted on falling. Mary, the new assistant and shop girl, entered the workroom and instantly began chattering away. I've posted the parcels as you asked, miss. The post coachman says prices are likely to go up at the new year. You wouldn't believe it, the cheek. One of the guards had the nerve to wink at me. Why, if my mum had seen him, she'd have given him a right boxing on the ear. Oh, and I saw Lady Johnson out in her new barouche. You've never seen such a carriage. On and on the girl prattled. Annabella was not really listening, nodding occasionally, but remaining focused on the task at hand. Or at least attempting to. It was rather hard to pin correctly when her vision was blurred by tears, for some reason. Don't pretend like you don't know why, her heart accused. You simply won't admit it yourself. Chapter 21 The Duchess pinched the bridge of her nose between the thumb and forefinger of her left hand. Patients watched this but refused to be deterred. She stood firmly before her mother, staring straight ahead for once. Patience, you cannot possibly be serious, the Duchess grumbled. An idea had sprung into Patience's mind that morning, one which she refused to ignore. Ever since her mother had announced that they would be attending a ball, Patience had been filled with a keen sense of dread, it was just so very public. The ballroom would be filled with people she did not know and the potential for her to be made a fool of was enormous. Patience simply did not want to attend it on her own. So she had come to her mother with a suggestion. She wished to attend with the one person that she felt comfortable around. The Duchess had agreed, assuming that Patience had made a friend at one of the luncheons or dinners they had attended. Naturally, the Duchess was a little put out, when Patience had announced that she intended to invite the dressmaker, Miss Kelly. It is in poor taste to arrive with an extra guest, the Duchess began. You did not object when you believed it to be a peer, Patience interrupted. Well, certain allowances can be made for persons of quality, the Duchess sniffed. One does not show up with an errant seamstress in tow. But she's not a seamstress, Patience argued, with a vehemence that surprised them both. She's a modiste, and a good one at that. More importantly, she's the only person I've spoken to my own age. She makes me feel seen, and like I can be myself. You will make other friends, the Duchess said, turning back to the letter she was holding in her hand. Patience took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. She knew from experience that arguing outright with her mother was a lost cause. It was far better that she should be clever and persuasive. I dearly hope that I do as well, Patience said carefully, sitting on the settee next to the Duchess. But the fact remains that just now, I do not. You have always said that confidence is one of a lady's most important attributes. Well, Miss Kelly helps me to feel more confident. The Duchess sighed and lowered the letter again. She turned and studied Patience from head to foot. Patience, aware that the Duchess was taking her measure, resisted the urge to shrink under the scrutiny. That is true enough, the Duchess admitted grudgingly. I cannot deny that the dressmaker has done wonders for your appearance. I can't wholly condone your new penchant for arguing with me, but you certainly look more the thing. Well, what if I have a wardrobe crisis while I'm at the ball? Patience asked. What if I am in the middle of dancing and I trip and tear my hem? There are maids in the dressing room there, the Duchess replied. Patience affected great offence. Oh, mother, really? You have ensured that I have a wonderful new wardrobe and you want me to entrust the care of it to maids? 
not even proper ladies' maids. The Duchess' eyes closed a bit too long to be merely blinking. Patience waited, not believing that she was within arm's reach of winning an argument with her mother. That may be fair. We wouldn't want them snagging that expensive silk. Patience nodded, all enthusiasm suddenly. Right you are, mother, she agreed, as if it had been the Duchess's idea all along. Miss Kelly has worked so very hard for me. Us too. Does she not deserve some sort of special thanks? The Duchess considered, while Patience endeavoured to appear like the good, dutiful daughter she was. She could almost see the wheels spinning in the Duchess's head, calculating the benefit versus the risk. Patience resisted the urge to cross her fingers. Very well, the Duchess said at last, grudgingly. We shall allow the modiste to accompany us. Let's hope that her manners are up to snuff. Oh, thank you, Mother, Patience said, impulsively throwing her arms around the Duchess's neck and pressing a soft kiss to her cheek. Yes, well, don't become overexcited, the Duchess said, gently patting Patience on the back. The Duchess's eyes flicked over Patience's shoulder to the portrait that hung on the far wall of the salon. Whatever would your father make of us taking a dressmaker to a society ball? The Duchess asked with a rueful shake of her head. Patience turned around, studying the picture of her father. Though the painting had ever loomed large in her life, she couldn't remember if she had actually ever stopped to fully appreciate it before. It had simply always been there, much like the rest of the furniture. Now, however, she took the time to look at the father she had never known. She looked up into his sparkling eyes and caught the mischievous tilt of his mouth. Patience turned back to the Duchess after some consideration. With identical eyes and smile, Patience confidently said, he would say, you've done the right thing looking after our daughter. The Duchess didn't answer, simply stared. A muscle worked in the Duchess' jaw, and Patience began to falter, wondering if she had misstepped. The Duchess' eyes danced between the portrait and Patience, shining with some unnamed emotion. He probably would, the Duchess said at last. Her voice was husky, as if her throat were thick with tears. You've always favoured him in your looks, but this is the first time you've sounded like him. Patience, sensing that something had shifted between them, dared to scoot just a little closer. The Duchess was speaking to her as an adult woman, not like a child for the first time in her life. What was he like, Mother? The Duchess's gaze went soft and far away at the question. Though her eyes were turned to the portrait, Patience had the sense that the Duchess wasn't actually looking at it. He was good, she answered simply. He was loyal to a fault, like you. He believed in the best in people, also like you. He loved a good bit of mischief. Once, when he was young, he and the king switched clothes at court to see if anyone would notice. Patience inhaled sharply. And did anyone? Eventually, the Duchess admitted, though by that time it had gone on so long that no one wanted to admit that they hadn't noticed for hours. Laughing breathily, Patience squeezed, took her mother's hand then turned to the portrait again. I wish I had known him, she murmured. Oh, he would have adored you, the Duchess said, placing her hand atop Patience's. He was expected to want sons above all else, but he was so delighted by your sister. The Duchess trailed off, and when Patience turned to look at her, she saw that her face was screwed up with pain. Mother, Patience said carefully. Thank you for telling me about him. A sort of wall seemed to come down between them then, the Duchess' face becoming closed off and distant. It was a familiar expression, one that Patience had seen most of her life. Well, we mustn't dwell on the past, hmm, she said with a flippant pat of Patience's hand. Though she had not said so outright, it was clear that Patience had been dismissed. Quietly she stood and walked from the salon. She paused only long enough to look back at the portrait again, looming over the room and staring from over the Duchess's shoulder. Patience sighed and went up to her private rooms. Once in her sitting room, the sat at the desk. 
she had directed a pair of footmen to move it, so that it now resided just under the window that faced the street. It wasn't much, but it allowed patients a chance to observe the masses without having to be part of it. It also had the benefit of sunlight much of the day, which patients quite liked. Opening a drawer, she reached in for a clean sheet of paper and her writing supplies. She intended to write to Miss Kelly immediately. She would likely need all the warnings she could get in order to be prepared in time. Patience toyed with her mahogany and inlaid pearl pen for a moment, twirling it in her fingers. She wasn't entirely sure how to begin. A little thrill of excitement fluttered through her stomach like excited butterflies. A grin spread across her face. She would simply be honestly herself, as Miss Kelly had always encouraged her to be. She dipped her pen in the glass jar of ink. Miss Kelly, should you live to be one thousand years old, you would never guess that I have persuaded Mother to do. Chapter 22 Light poured from the windows of Carlton House, out across the portico and even touching the sidewalk and street. The Duke of Brandon couldn't help but sigh and feel his lip curl a little as his carriage pulled to the grand front of the royal mansion. Leaning forward a little to peer out the glazed carriage window, he could see the powdered and trussed members of the ton striding with noses held high into Carlton House. It's not too late, some part of Alan murmured. You could still turn right around and leave. It was a tempting prospect, and one he seriously considered. But no, he had arrived in his crested carriage, and it had no doubt been spotted already. To turn back now would be a gross insult to the Prince Regent, the Queen Mother, and any number of noblemen and women. So instead he heaved a sigh and checked the buckle at the knee of his breeches. Better for him to get all of his sighs and disapproving looks out now in the safety of his carriage. The horses pranced smartly up the drive, the driver guiding them into place in the line of other vehicles passing under the portico. The doors of Carlton House were thrown open wide, guards and footmen alike posted at attention to receive guests. Even before the door to his carriage had been unlatched by one of the liveried footmen, Alan could hear music and raucous laughter tumbling from the door to the house. This was not an official court function, especially as Parliament had not been opened yet, that was scheduled for a couple days away, but the very highest echelons of society were expected to put in an appearance at one of these informal soirees thrown by the Prince Regent. The Duke had been avoiding it for as long as he could, first crying off because of his father's death, then under the pretense of sorting out his London home. It could no longer be avoided, however. The Duke had been at his club, and one of the old codgers there had made an innocent enough comment about the Regent missing the Duke at his evening functions. The meaning was implicit, and gave the Duke pause. His absence had been noted, and further avoidance would be interpreted as disapproval of the Prince Regent. Of course, it didn't matter that the Duke did, in fact, disapprove of the Prince Regent as much as a man could. It was the appearance of the thing that mattered. For the Duke to snub the fat prince would have meant ruin for the Hardy family. There was a plush carpet underfoot, rolled out to the drive to welcome the guests. The moment the Duke's foot touched the red carpet, his senses were under assault. Each step brought him closer to the brightly lit house, every surface and fixture polished to a high shine and reflecting brilliantly. It had likely started the evening as a beautiful display, but the candles were burning down, the wax dripping languidly down and pooling on tables and floors. There were flowers everywhere, in tribute to the unfurling spring, but they too were beginning to droop. Their own pleasant smell was nearly drowned out by the cloying tide of perfume worn by the ladies, making the Duke's nose sting and his head throb. The windows were not open, and the air was close and humid. Bodies were jammed into the front apartments of Carlton House, standing in clumps, draped over any piece of furniture that could be pressed into service. It was rumoured that the Regent had a fear of being left alone for any length of time, and seeing the sheer amount of people clustered about him, the Duke believed it. The Regent himself was seated on a grand chair in the centre of the best room. The wall coverings were a bright red which fairly glowed under the chandeliers loaded with candles, while any of the furniture that could be gilded was. 
it was enough to make the Duke wince and think longingly of his own quiet, subdued home. It wasn't that he disliked parties or balls on principle. In fact, he rather enjoyed them on occasion. It was more that the artificiality and cloying nature of this particular function was throwing his life into sharp relief. Still, the Duke had to make his presence known, paying ceremonial compliment to the Regent. With some effort, the Duke began sidling and gently pushing his way through the thronging masses. The ostrich feathers the ladies were obliged to wear, the Prince Regent found them fetching for some reason, tickled the Duke as he passed. He murmured apologies and excuses as he made his way to where the Regent was holding court. A crowd of standing onlookers surrounded the fortunate ones who were lucky enough to be offered a seat near the Regent. The Duke pressed his way into an open space in this ring of standing room only. A veritable harem of ladies, some young, some firmly middle-aged, were clustered about the Regent. They lounged in various stages of repose, draped across chaise lounges, settees, chairs, even the floor. Equally decorative young men were stationed around the Regent as well. No doubt the Prince of Wales believed this reflected his own youth and vigour. In truth, it only highlighted his rotund frame and the sagging flesh of his face. He was rouged and powdered like a dandy of the previous generation, the points of his collar stiffly starched and pressing into his jowls. The ladies about him too were rouged and powdered, livid circles of red standing out on their cheeks through either artifice or drink. The Duke could only stare for a few moments. He had been at the court once when the King was still in health. The King had been a simple, frugal man in his prime, more fond of farming than ruling. He had greeted the late Duke of Brandon warmly, and the two had strolled beneath the trees in their shirt sleeves, discussing crop rotations as if they were a pair of gentlemen farmers. Ah, the Duke of Brandon has graced us with his presence this evening, the Regent called suddenly, having spotted the Duke. His eyes were small and beady in his florid face, scrutinising and studying the Duke. Compelled by manners and protocol, the Duke stepped forward and made as elegant of a bow as he could manage in the tight quarters. It is a pleasure to see you, Your Royal Highness, the Duke offered with no real amount of feeling. The Regent shifted about in his chair, glancing around. The pleasure is ours, I am certain, he said. I am sure that you will bring a breath of fresh country air with you. A few of the ladies about the Prince tittered behind fans and gloves. The Regent glanced about and puffed himself up a bit, certain that he had been witty. Here now, why don't you find a place to sit and entertain us with news of whatever has kept you so occupied of late? The Duke resisted the urge to clench his jaw. Instead, he offered a light, easy smile and a shallow bow to the ladies. And dislodge one of these charming creatures? That would be a cruelty to your highness, surely, and a hardship for them to be deprived of your company. The regent chortled and preened, positive that he had been paid a great compliment. He was a vain man, and the easiest way of assuaging him was to cater to that vanity. Thus appeased, he dismissed the duke with a nod of his head. Gratefully, the duke withdrew, pulling back to a relatively quiet corner of the room. From this vantage point, he cast an eye about. The party had clearly been in full swing for quite some time, the melted candles, drunken singing, and half-eaten piles of sweetmeats testified to that. At the largest table piled with food was a sugar sculpture in bright white of the Parthenon. It sagged now listing to one side from the heat of the room. The entire affair had Alan's stomach feeling a little at sea. Navigating the regent's court was treacherous. The man was a great fool, but he had a streak of cruelty and vindictiveness that all the Hanoverians did. If the Duke didn't play the game, and play it well, his standing could suffer. He could be passed over for important court appointments, or worse, given humiliating ones. Poised as he was at the edges of this glittering world of pointed looks and double-edged words, it was hard to imagine Lady Patience having the fortitude for it. They would swallow her whole without even chewing, the Duke thought with a grim sort of humour. A twist of guilt accompanied that thought, as it always did whenever he thought of Lady Patience. It wasn't the girl's fault, and the Duke didn't think ill of her per se. 
It was more that the Duke couldn't imagine his marriage attaining its full potential with a wife he could not treat as a partner. The ton would not look favourably on the Duke either if he were responsible for the reduction of circumstances of such a renowned person as the Duchess of Sussex. The Duke had great plans for his title and inheritance. If he wished for any of them to come to fruition, he would need a perfect wife. Chapter 23 Conversation flowed around the Duke, largely fading into an indistinguishable hum. The night was wearing on, words slurring as the wine and brandy flowed. Those less inclined to partake and faded to the fringes of the apartments at Carlton House. Such was the case with the Duke. He had retreated to a dimly lit corner, remaining at the party only so that he could be said to be there. A few other gentlemen, most of them middle-aged or more advanced in years, had also found their way to his corner. They gossiped openly, not caring for the absurdity of double talk and innuendo. It's a fool's errand to think Napoleon will be satisfied with the land he has. We should never have tried to appease him, one man said to another, his white sideburns fluffy and somehow indignant. Well, it's hardly a surprise that our illustrious prince should choose a course, another agreed. A round of general grunting met that statement. You cannot blame him entirely, a third said, gesturing with a nearly empty brandy glass. We all remember the terrible business with his father after the American colonies were lost. More grunts and curled lips, more than a few pockets had become significantly lighter as a result of that particular blunder. The Duke ignored this idle gossip, not wishing to get drawn in. His mind wandered, and he found that his thoughts turned to Miss Kelly. It was difficult to imagine her in this situation, not by dint of her standing and occupation, but because he couldn't imagine her tolerating the absurdity of it. She was far too practical and strong-willed for court life. The image of the Prince Regent's clumsy charms and dull wits breaking against the sharp, clever Miss Kelly brought a smile to the Duke's face unbidden. He made her into an object of pity and humiliation, a voice broke into the Duke's daydreaming. He started, irrationally panicking that he had somehow been found out. A glance about himself showed that those around him had turned their attention to the figure of a hunched crone, diamonds in her ears and the silk of her gown shabby, seated before the fire. She stared into the flames, paying no mind to her surroundings. It was this lady that was the subject of discussion now. It was an ill-advised match by every account, the gentleman with the impressive sideburns said surely. They were so fond of each other, another protested. What has that to do with anything? We all hope for affection in our marriages, but that is neither here nor there, is it? The other retorted. Well, a third said, stroking his dimpled chin. There was no one to object, really. There were no parents, no relations to tell her otherwise. And she paid the price, didn't she? Her fortune-hunting, adventurer of a husband wasn't welcome at court, and thus her standing was lost along with her fortune, the Lord with the sideburns argued. She is only here now because, as you said, she is to be pitied. The Duke shifted uncomfortably, his eyes darting from one speaker to the other and then back to the lady they were discussing. The conversation was hitting entirely too close to home for his comfort, and guilt was beginning to pool in his stomach. He could very well be staring at Lady Patience's future, should he refuse her. He could be staring at his own future, truthfully. A snort interrupted the trio of gentlemen. A woman with dark hair and sharp eyes snapped her fan shut as the gentleman turned to her. Now, Sir Robert, you know the only reason you speak so is because she turned down your own suit, she said smoothly, tapping him on the arm with her closed fan. The gentlemen all had a titter about that, save Sir Robert of the prodigious facial hair. He remained stone-faced, though he did colour in embarrassment. Even if that is true, and I'm not saying that it is, Lady Jenkins, he said with great dignity, it does not change her situation, does it? She is still in dire straits. Hmm, Lady Jenkins said, tapping her chin with her fan. That is so. Of course, we must not forget your own humiliation. A great man such as yourself being passed over for a country doctor. 
Tell me, how did you bear the shame of it? There was a collective sucking in of air from all who were listening. The Duke could take no more of it. Pushing himself away from the wall, he straightened his jacket and put his untouched glass of champagne down with more force than was strictly advisable. The group of gossipers started, clearly not having seen him in his dimly lit corner. They all gave him hasty nods and bows, which he didn't deign to acknowledge. Instead, he made considerable use of his long legs and tall frame and shouldered his way quickly out of the room. There was little doubt in his mind that they followed his abrupt exit with curious eyes. No doubt he had inadvertently provided the impetus for more gossip. It didn't matter. The only thing he cared about was leaving this farce far behind him. The party had only grown more debauched and chaotic, with some engaged in singing bawdy songs, while others had drunk themselves into a stupor. As he sidled his way through the flagging crowd, the Duke passed a grand gentleman ambassador, his sash of office stained with wine. He was slumped in a plush armchair, his head tilted backward, mouth open and snoring at such a volume that it would have been remarkable if the room hadn't been so noisy. The Prince Regent was seemingly engaged in a game, wherein he was attempting to toss candied nuts into the ambassador's slack mouth. The Duke turned away from the sight, feeling dismayed by the entire evening. It was not that he had expected anything different. He knew what the Regent's court was like, and he had known the Prince of Wales long enough to know that without the moderating influence of his father and the Queen Mother, he would only become worse. No. The real trouble was that the knight had only served as a highly polished looking glass through which the Duke was obliged to examine his own life. So eager was he to be away from Carlton House that he practically burst out the front door. He drank in the clean, crisp night air in greedy lungfuls, wishing to rid himself of the fetid air he had been forced to breathe for the past hours. The footman, clearly caught off guard, scrambled to summon his driver and coach. They were all fumbled apologies and bows but the Duke waved them off. He was grateful for the time outside. Unfortunately, this also gave him time to reflect, now that the chaos of the party was behind him. He had known that his responsibility was great, but now it was crystal clear to him that it was within his power to ruin not only himself, but the Duchess of Sussex and Lady Patience as well. He hadn't fully considered what their lives would look like if he should refuse the marriage. He had intended to be kind, and allow them to remain in their ancestral home. But that wasn't enough. They would have no money for servants, living entirely on his largesse and dependent on him for the home's upkeep. There would be no cash for dresses, trips to London, not even a new ribbon. He could not possibly be expected to maintain them, particularly as he would have to see to his own new wife and growing family. More importantly, they would have no protector. Without a husband or father, the ladies would be unable to travel safely, to socialise. They wouldn't even be allowed to access bank accounts, nor own property should they somehow find the funds. The Duke's stomach clenched, the image of the worn, shabby lady hunched before the fireplace haunting him. The carriage pulled up before him, and the Duke alighted with automatic movements. The sounds of debauchery were cut off as his carriage door clicked shut the well-padded seats and lush interior insulating him from the outside world. The driver hesitated, clearly awaiting instructions from the Duke. Several moments passed, and no direction came. The Duke felt pulled in every direction at once, torn between his duty, his heart, and guilt. He should just go home. He should get to bed so that he could call on Lady Patience tomorrow. His mind's eye readily conjured images of all the things he should do, each one feeling like a nail in a coffin. Alan had never been a rebellious man. It simply wasn't in his nature, or so he had thought. He found himself in the curious position of having his horizons broadened, possibilities laid before him that he had never even known existed, at an age when he was expected to marry and settle down. And now he found himself feeling trapped by tradition and duty for the first time in his life. Your Grace? the driver asked hesitantly, speaking into the tube that allowed the Duke to give direction without having to lean out the window. There's quite a quay forming behind us. Alan believed the driver. 
there was a steady stream of carriages at Carlton House depositing passengers, others picking up their masters that swayed and stumbled. There was a growing sound of impatient horses snorting and pawing, and drivers began shouting to get moving. Drunken voices began shouting too. What would you like me to do, Your Grace? The driver asked again, his voice becoming more nervous. But that was the trouble. Alan did not know. He knew that he was exhausted by the night, down to his very soul. He felt wearied and depleted. The very notion of being the Duke of Brandon was exhausting. He just wanted to be Alan. Just Alan, who could smile and jest with a dressmaker on a London street. Your Grace? The driver asked again, more insistent. What are your orders? Again, Alan did not speak. He was not being intentionally belligerent. His tongue, like his mind, was paralysed. Indecision weighed him down into stillness. Your Grace? Chapter 24 The hour was so late that it was early. The sky was no longer inky black, but rather a deep blue that would soon lighten to grey. The sounds of the coal delivery men and maids hurrying to get the morning's milk and newspapers would start announcing that the city was awakening before long. Annabella paid all of this no mind. Her attention was riveted on the waxed linen thread she was pulling carefully through the Duchesse silk. The nature of the work was slow and precise at this point, her needle making dozens of stitches per inch. The candle nearest her spluttered, and her eyes automatically flicked to it, frowning. She sighed. The Duchess had been reluctant to pay her mounting bills, and Annabella was beginning to scrape the bottom of her savings. Corners had to be cut where she could. That meant cheaper candles, which tended to gutter and throw off poorer light. Her eyes ached, and she rubbed them with the forefinger and thumb of one hand, while the other held the fabric and needle. It had been a spring of working all night more often than not, in order to meet the pressing deadlines imposed by the Duchess of Sussex. Annabella allowed herself a brief moment to stretch her neck and to look about herself, giving her eyes a moment to adjust. She had set up working in the front room of her store for the night, taking advantage of the windows on two sides for better, and more importantly free, light for as long as she could. She sat at the counter, fabric pinned to her tailor's ham to keep the tension very precisely as she worked. She had carefully arranged candles about herself, but they were beginning to burn low and sputter out. Outside, in the pre-dawn gloom, a lone bird began to sing. Annabella smiled a little wistfully at the sound, thinking longing thoughts of her bed. The unmistakable sound of a carriage coming down the street made her stomach flip for some reason. She had no reason to presume it was Mr Hardy, and she felt more than a little ridiculous for hoping that it was indeed him. But she was consumed by a strange sort of longing these days a strange ache about her heart that she could neither name nor understand. It was an odd sensation, one that could be dulled but not wholly erased by work. Even now she sat forward on her stool, her entire being tense as she attempted to listen with her whole body. After a few moments, it was clear that the carriage had merely been passing by. Annabella chuckled at herself, shaking her head. You are an adorable little fool these days she chided herself. It was hard not to feel more than a little ridiculous, what with her heart leaping into her throat every time she heard a carriage or horse pass by. She wasn't even entirely sure why she was hoping so fervently. It wasn't as if Mr Hardy had declared any intentions, they had only shared a couple of chance encounters. And yet, those limited interactions had left Annabella feeling... Well, she wasn't sure what but it left a most delicious flush feeling in her cheeks, and her heart felt considerably gladdened. A hearty sigh escaped her lips, and with one more rolling stretch of her neck she turned back to her work. She had just taken up the needle again when she heard the faintest sound. It was a tapping, the barest of knocking. So faint was it that Annabella was not even entirely sure she had heard it at first. Her head instantly snapped up, and she looked to the door of the store. It was almost impossible to see, and it very well could have been wishful thinking 
that had her imagining she saw the tall and lithe silhouette of a man. In fact, she was halfway convinced that she had imagined hearing the delicate knocking to begin with. She stared hard at the door, frozen, willing herself to hear the rapping again, a little scared that she would. Tap, tap, tap. There was no mistaking it now. Slowly, Annabella slid off her stool, her heart pounding. Are you really going to open the door on a dark London street? The more rational part of her brain demanded. She hesitated, her gaze landing on the counter. Laying there, gleaming silver, were her immense tailor's shears. Quickly, she lifted them and carried them with her to the door. There, she thought smugly, that ought to give any would-be robber pause. As she reached the door, she hesitated for a moment, blowing out a breath she wasn't aware she had been holding. With a hand that trembled more than she would ever admit, she reached up to the bolt that held the door fast. Tap, 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 came the knocking again as if the person outside were only using their fingertips. Annabella hesitated again, trying to peer out into the dark. Miss Kelly, a familiar voice called, are you there? Mr Hardy, she replied breathlessly. With disobedient fingers, she quickly fumbled with the lock and opened the door only a crack. What on earth are you doing here? Standing there on her doorstep was Mr Hardy. He was looking a little sheepish, sweeping his black beaver-skin top hat off his head quickly. I... I was rather hoping, that is, I was passing by and saw a light on and I thought that you might be awake, he said, turning his hat over and over in his hands. Annabella just stared for a moment. She opened the door a little further, unwedging herself from behind it a bit. I suppose you had better come in before the neighbours see you and begin gossiping, she said finally, turning aside and opening the door to allow him in. Mr Hardy hesitated, his grip tightening on his hat for a moment. The moment passed and he nodded, stepping inside. Annabella closed the door behind him, turning the lock again. Self-consciously, she pulled her shawl tighter about herself and patted her hair. She had spent the entire night working, not preparing to receive a caller. I'm afraid that I cannot offer you anything, she said, stepping around him and walking back to her place at the counter. I wasn't expecting company. No, Mr Hardy agreed. He didn't immediately follow her, but simply stood for a minute. His gaze wandered around the shop and Annabella, too, took a moment to view her store through fresh eyes. Only the best pieces were on display or available for perusal, and judging by Mr Hardy's face, he was impressed. With a clank, Annabella replaced her hefty scissors on the counter. Mr Hardy's eyes followed the sound, and he grinned a little. I was worried about you opening the door to a stranger at night but I see now that you are capable of taking care of yourself. Annabella's only reply was a baleful look as she took her place on her stool again, which made Mr Hardy's grin broaden. The Duchess satin was still pooled on the counter before her. In the candlelight, it looked like liquid pearl. Mr Hardy stepped closer, curious. What are you doing at this hour? He asked, his head tilted. Ruining my eyes with cheap candles. Annabella grumbled automatically before she could catch herself. Mr Hardy looked up at her, surprised. Cheap candles? he repeated, then glanced about as if he had never seen candlesticks before. Annabella gave a shrug and a rueful smile. The best candles are white, made from pure wax. They throw off a brighter, more steady light. Seamstresses and dressmakers are always desperate for good light, she explained. She tipped her head toward the waning candles positioned around her. These, as you can see, are not the best. Though she was busy picking her work back up, she couldn't miss the way Mr Hardy frowned. I had never considered such a practical aspect of your work before, he said, his brow creased. Annabella laughed softly. Do you mean to say that you have never seen the poor women clustered about the streetlights? Well, yes, Mr Hardy said reluctantly, but I had assumed they were simply socialising. Annabella arched her eyebrow. You mean gossiping, 
she said. At Mr Hardy's shamefaced nod, she couldn't help but laugh. Well, truthfully, that was definitely happening as well. No seamstresses who take in piecework or work to make shirts use the free light on the streets as much as they can, she explained. Does the city watch not harry them? Mr Hardy asked, head tilted in curiosity. Oh, certainly. But as soon as the watch moves on, the sewing women are back in place, Annabella said with a small smile. Mr Hardy too smiled for a moment, but then his face fell again. I am rather ashamed that I have never actually seen them. Annabella shrugged again, her hands never losing the rhythm of their stitching. It would be rather hard for you to, from upon whatever high pedestal you have just descended from, she said, eyeing Mr Hardy's wardrobe significantly. Ah, yes, you are. You notice that, he winced, looking down at himself. Annabella gave him an arch look. She would have had to have been blind not to have noticed. His ivory-coloured waistcoat was made of a dull, worsted silk, unostentatious but beautiful. The buckles on his breeches were frosted with tiny diamonds that sparkled in the low light. It was impossible to deny that Mr Hardy was a man of means, dressed as he was. It did nothing to ease the tension that Annabella felt about the disparity in their standing. The one comfort she took was that though his clothing was very fine, it looked crisp and brand new, as if it had never been worn before. Mr Hardy, too, seemed poorly suited to the finery. It did not suit his personality in some way. Annabella had a sneaking suspicion that he had purchased it for the London season. Cheap candles, Mr Hardy murmured. His eyes sharpened on Annabella suddenly. Please forgive my forwardness. But are you in financial troubles, Miss Kelly? Annabella's first inclination was toward haughtiness. With a thunk, she dropped her hands to the counter and stared at Mr Hardy. I am not, she said with a proud toss of her head. Mr Hardy glanced to the dingy yellow candles and back at her. Well, at least I won't be, she allowed, particularly when clients pay their outstanding bills. Are they withholding payment? Mr Hardy asked. Not as such. It's common for them to settle at the end of the season. But I have undertaken a large commission and have received very little to cover it. I have had to purchase materials from my own pocket, she sighed. Why do you not ask for it? Annabella sighed again. Because I must keep them in my favour. Much of my business relies on my reputation. One bad word from the wrong client, and I'm finished. And you cannot risk the wrath of this client by insisting on payment, Mr Hardy supplied. That's it, Annabella agreed. Mr Hardy's frown was hard to ignore. I don't suppose there is anything I might do to help. No, but thank you, Mr Hardy, Annabella said with a small smile. But you might tell me about the ball or whatever you were at, she suggested. Mr Hardy stared at her for a moment and Annabella became afraid that she might have unintentionally offended him. Those fears were banished, however, with the spreading of a slow smile across his face. Her own smile grew to meet his, and she couldn't really remember feeling so warm and content. Chapter 25 It was a simple enough request that Miss Kelly had made of him, but Alan found himself struggling to answer it. He didn't know how to describe the evening he had spent without it sounding scandalous. More to the point, he couldn't announce that he had lately come from Carlton House. Any hope he had of maintaining the ruse of being simply Mr Hardy would vanish with that. If my request was too bold, please feel free, Miss Kelly began. No, it's not that, Alan reassured her. It's more that, well, on reflection... I find that I have not spent my evening at all constructively. No? Did you at least get a good supper out of it? I arrived after supper, Alan admitted. Any dancing then? When he shook his head again, Miss Kelly gasped in faux outrage. Goodness, you really didn't do anything worthwhile, she teased. Alan couldn't help but grinning at her. There was something in her easy nature that soothed his mind and soul. She lent a kind of perspective that he had lacked about the dismal evening. 
Are you fond of dancing, then? For the second time that night, Miss Kelly's hands ceased their repetitive motions. I'm not sure, she admitted quietly. No, Alan asked. He found himself leaning forward, his hands planted on the countertop. Ducking his head to try and catch her gaze, he felt equal parts pity and amusement as the dressmaker tried to avoid him. It may come as something of a surprise to someone as illustrious as yourself, Mr Hardy, but dancing was not a major part of my childhood education, Miss Kelly said dryly. You spend every waking hour creating these, these works of art for the young society ladies to wear, but have never partaken in a dance yourself, Mr Hardy asked. Placing one hand solemnly over his heart, he straightened and said, Madam, I am offended on your behalf. Miss Kelly snorted, unconcerned whether it was ladylike or not. Do not concern yourself. After all, who knows what life holds? I may end up dancing at a ball ere my life is spent, she said cryptically. Why, Miss Kelly, Alan said with a note of hope creeping into his voice, have you been granted an invitation? Miss Kelly gave another of her characteristic shrugs and sphinx-like smiles. Alan's heart was thudding in his chest, and he found that he could not identify how he felt. His whole self was a swirl of eager anticipation at the notion that he might see Miss Kelly in a social situation and equal amounts of dread and guilt at the prospect. Dread because there was no earthly way that he could prevent her from learning his true identity. Guilt because of how much he wanted that to come true. She is a woman of great honesty and fortitude. She will have no tolerance for your having lied to her, his heart warned. He could feel the truth of that. Miss Kelly would drop him like an old handkerchief the moment she realised he was not being forthright. The thought of losing her good opinion and her companionship made his mouth go dry. But it was more than that, too. He didn't want to lie to her. A reasonable portion of his ongoing guilt was the knowledge that he was lying, even if it was only by omission to Miss Kelly. Though he was sure that others of the ton would dismiss her out of hand, as they did those of the lower orders, Alan had never met anyone more worthy of his regard and respect. Mr Hardy, she asked, breaking into his reverie. Are you well? He blinked a few times, coming back to himself. Miss Kelly's face was a study in concern, and she had put her work down to touch his sleeve with one hand. The simple gesture warmed the deepest recesses of Alan's heart, hammering home his guilt. Miss Kelly, I... His voice broke and trailed off. A strange flush swept over his face. He should tell her. He meant to tell her. The words were at the very tip of his tongue, caught only by his own hesitation and fear. Miss Kelly stared at him, tilting her head in curiosity. There were no lies or duplicity in her face nor any part of her being. Alan knew this, and he knew that to continue his charade diminished them both. But the fear of it driving a wedge between them, the possibility that it would mean the end of their acquaintance was too much for Alan to overcome. Coward, he shouted inwardly. He shook his head, trying to clear it. In the end, he forced his face into a smile and said, Would you care to dance, Miss Kelly? What? she blurted. Her green eyes darted about. Here, now. Unless you've a secret ballroom hidden in the back of your shop that I'm unaware of, he replied with a teasing smile. It was rather amusing after all to have the upper hand over her for once. Certainly, it's next to my lavish apartments with the cedar closets and the solarium, she retorted quickly. Alan laughed softly and stepped around the counter to stand before Miss Kelly. He bowed one arm behind his back, and offered his hand to her. Miss Kelly shrank back a little, as if his hand might burn her. I... No, thank you, she said quickly. Better that you should practice here in private, lest you stumble over your feet in public and shame yourself forever, Alan said far too reasonably. He could see her beginning to relent, and so he simply waited. But I don't know how, she muttered, barely audible. Alan could feel a laugh threatening to bubble up. He was not mocking her lack of knowledge. It was the fact that the very notion of dancing had transformed this strong, formidable woman into a timid, shrinking violet. 
I'm not sure I quite believe that to be the problem, Miss Kelly, Alan said gravely, his tone somewhat undermined by his teasing grin. I think it's more that you don't care to do anything lest you can do it well. Miss Kelly's head snapped up at that, her green eyes blazing. You think me proud? Alan shook his head, raising his hands and backing up a step. Think you proud? No, not at all, he said, quell serious. A beat of silence, and then with a mischievous grin he said, I know you to be proud. With a surprised guffaw and gasp all at once, Miss Kelly's face burst into amused outrage. You rake! she exclaimed and tossed a convenient pincushion at him, which he easily dodged. I never said it was unwarranted pride, he protested. I believe you are fully justified in your high opinion of yourself. Miss Kelly regarded him with mock apprehension from the side of her eyes. Mm-hmm, she hummed, clearly fighting a losing battle at being amused. Alan approached her again, palms spread wide in supplication. My offer was genuine, Miss Kelly. I promise that I shan't mock you once, no matter how many times you step on my toes. Miss Kelly waffled for a moment on her stool, considering. At last she sighed, jabbing her needle into the fabric to keep it secure before sliding to her feet. I shall hold you to that, she muttered. Still grinning, Alan bowed gallantly and offered his hand palm down to Miss Kelly again. Hesitantly, she placed her hand on the top of his at which he nodded. Thus, supporting her hand, he carefully escorted her out to the shop floor proper. We haven't the space for much here, but we can make do, I think, he said, noting the placement of the shelves and dress forms. Now we face each other like so, he instructed, gently taking Miss Kelly by the shoulders and steering her into place. First we bow to each other. Yes, that's right. Now, for this dance, I begin. I step forward like so, he continued, stepping lightly forward one fist on his hip. You follow, and we form two sides of a square. Despite her inexperience, he was wholly unsurprised to find that Miss Kelly was a quick study with a naturally light step. She floated across the floor easily, as if she were a butterfly in a garden. Alan was delighted, especially when it became clear that she was capable of holding a conversation while she danced. It wasn't long before her eyes were sparkling and her cheeks were flushed, and Alan was very certain that he had never seen a woman so beautiful. She was vibrant and real in a way that the other ladies of the town were not. She laughed, she teased him openly, she did absolutely nothing to chase after him. It was strangely thrilling having to coax and court a woman like this. Alan, too, was certain that his own face was flushed with the excitement of it all. His heart thrilled every time their hands touched. For the brief moments when he was permitted to put his hand at her waist or the small of her back, he felt as if some measure of her natural lightness flowed into him. He was not one for flights of fancy, but he wouldn't have been surprised to look down and find that their feet were no longer earthbound and they danced among the clouds. As the set was coming to a close, Alan found that as they came face to face again, they were standing perhaps a bit more near than was strictly necessary. Some locks of Miss Kelly's golden copper hair had worked their way loose from the hasty knot at the back of her head. Breathing hard, they both stared directly into each other's eyes. Alan felt as if Miss Kelly were looking directly into his soul, and vice versa. Quite of its own volition, Alan's right hand reached up toward Miss Kelly's temple where a lock of wavy hair rested against it. He hesitated, feeling as if she were an easily startled fawn, and if he moved too hastily or clumsily, the moment would be lost forever and she would flee. Gently, so very gently, with just the barest whisper of his fingertips, he pushed the hair away from her face, tucking it behind her ear. She didn't move or speak, seemingly holding her breath. Thus encouraged, Alan dared to barely whisper his fingers along her jaw. I'm going to kiss her, he realised with a start. Everything in his brain yelled at him to stop while he could, that once he crossed this line, there would be no turning back. He summoned up all of his father's lectures about duty 
and the logical knowledge that he was very likely ruining not just his life, but the lives of several others as well. Strangely enough, the mind that he had always prided himself on being so logical was being drowned out by the pounding of his heart. If he was doomed to an unhappy marriage, he at least wanted to know what a kiss given freely, out of pure emotion and regard, was like. Closer, as if drawn together by some kind of invisible tide, Alan and Miss Kelly drew closer and closer, their lips just a bare whisper apart. Five of the clock! I say, it is five o'clock! A shrill voice cried from outside, completely shattering the silence. This loud cry was accompanied by a rapping knock on the windows of the apartments above them. It was the knocker-up, the man who for a few pennies would rise before Dunn and awaken those who paid him at a specific time. He boasted an impressive set of lungs and a stick long enough to reach the windows set on the second floor. Whatever spell had been woven between Alan and Miss Kelly was broken. When he turned back to her, he found that a sort of invisible wall had come up between them. She had retreated to a respectable distance, and she had folded herself into her shawl more securely. Forgive me, I've completely lost track of the hour, she said dimly. It was clearly a dismissal. Alan nodded, though he wished to beg to be allowed to stay. He knew that he could not. He had his own duties to attend to and it wouldn't do to be caught leaving the dressmakers before dawn. He pulled out his watch and consulted it as if the time were somehow still a mystery. Yes, I have taken up too much of your valuable time, he agreed stiffly. He bowed formally to her, then moved to the counter to collect his forgotten hat. She made a brief movement then, as if she were going to catch his sleeve as he passed. He waited for a moment, but she apparently thought better of the gesture. Don't worry, he said, turning back to her as he clapped his hat to his head. I shall leave by the back way so that I do not shock your neighbours. Miss Kelly said nothing, but her throat worked for a moment. At last, she nodded. Without another word spoken between them, Alan turned and fled into the growing dawn. Chapter 26 All day Annabella felt as if she were moving about in a strange kind of trance. Once, when she was very young, her mother had taken her back to Ireland. While there she had been allowed to play in the shallow surf at the beach. The water had simultaneously buoyed and dragged at her, slowing her steps no matter how hard she trashed against the waves. That was precisely how she felt now. It was absurd that her whole day should be so altered from, what really? Not even a kiss. It was too ridiculous for words. Yet here she was, dropping pins and needles, fumbling as she unfolded fabric from the bolt, tripping over her words and her feet. Mary said nothing, as was only right, but Annabella could feel the young girl staring at her. She finally grew tired of it and sent the girl home with a stack of fabric pieces that needed buttonholes made. Annabella was quite aware of the fact that she needed to be working if she were ever to meet the deadline of the ball in two days. Lady Patience was going to be presented earlier in the day, and thus her season would commence. Not only did Annabella have to finish a stunning piece for Lady Patience, but another, besides, if she were to believe the letter she had received from Patience last week. But her mind simply would not stay focused on the task at hand. She was in some sort of fugue, and the only thing she could reliably manage to do was to sit on her stool behind the counter, chin in her palm, elbow on the counter. It was a posture that was wholly unacceptable to be waiting on customers on, but she couldn't rouse herself to care enough. She just stared straight ahead at a spot on the shop floor. Suddenly, seemingly from nowhere, a cup of steaming tea was waved under her nose, then gently placed on the counter. Annabella started blinking like an owl. Penny, hands on hips and brows lifted sceptically, stood next to her. Annabella had not even heard her come in, let alone heard her prepare tea. Penny, when did you get here? Annabella asked dumbly. Over a quarter hour ago, Penny replied. It was about the time I asked you the fourth question without an answer that I realised things were in a dire situation. I figured that tea was the only solution. 
Annabella let out a strangled sort of laugh, but it was cut short by her lifting her tea and sipping it gratefully. It was milky and sweet. Penny had always espoused a belief that tea with lashings of milk and sugar cured most ills. It did seem to help, and it was only then that Annabella realised she was quite famished. This was likely due to the fact that she had entirely forgotten to eat the whole day. Right on cue, her stomach began to grumble loudly. Penny, clearly hearing the sound, let out an exasperated sigh. Lucky that I brought some of Cook's streusel for you too. She disappeared for a moment and reappeared with a basket, out of which emanated the most delightful smells of cinnamon and apples. Annabella accepted a serving gratefully, not caring that should a customer come in, they would see her wantonly eating sweets. Penny put a fork into her hand and firmly ordered her to eat. Meekly, she obeyed, trying her best to eat slowly. Penny stayed long enough to ensure she was eating, then went to the workroom to retrieve another stool. Once Penny was comfortably seated, she folded her arms and stared at Annabella expectantly. What? Annabella asked around a mouthful of strosel. Penny sighed disapprovingly and reached into the basket for a crisp white linen napkin which she passed over to Annabella. Oh, I am just waiting to hear the explanation for why you have been moving around in a fog today as if you were a ghost, Penny said airily. Annabella's chewing slowed. She could feel herself shrinking under Penny's knowing stare. It's nothing, she protested weakly. Penny tilted her chin down and looked at Annabella from beneath her lashes. Well, it's not much of something, Annabella relented. Am I to suspect that this daze you find yourself in is entirely due to Mr Hardy? Penny asked, smoothing invisible wrinkles from her bright mustard-coloured calico dress. When Annabella didn't answer, Penny only sighed. Annabella was under the distinct impression that she was very much going to be treated to a lecture from Penny, except just then the shop door opened. Miss Kelly? A soft voice called over the tinkling of the bell. Annabella rose at once and came forward to greet Lady Patience, who nearly bounced on the balls of her feet in excitement. Oh, I am so glad you are in, she said, rushing forward to meet Annabella. I have come to see if you intend to accept Mother's invitation. Annabella only stared for a moment. She had never seen Lady Patience so excited, so full of life before. The light spring bonnet she wore was trimmed with curled feathers, which bounced right along with her. I haven't fully decided yet, she admitted. Oh, please say you will come. It promises to be a positively dreary night full of dreary old friends of mother's. And you will be my only friend there, Lady Patience pleaded, seizing Annabella's hands. Annabella could not help but laugh softly. My lady, describing the ball as dreary is not the best way to entice one to attend, she said with a tired smile. But it's true! Lady Patience protested, which elicited another laugh from Annabella. What's this about an invitation? Penny asked from her spot near the counter. She too had risen from her stool and stood some few paces behind Annabella. Remembering her duties, Annabella gestured Penny forward. Lady Patience, may I present my oldest friend, Mrs Penny Talbot. Mrs Penny Talbot, this is Lady Patience daughter of the Duchess of Sussex. A round of curtsies and head nods resulted from that hasty introduction. A small return of Lady Patience's inherent shyness also resulted, unfortunately. Annabella caught the young lady viewing Penny with a bashful curiosity. Worry that Lady Patience might be overwhelmed by Penny's natural penchant for conversation. Briefly unsettled Annabella but she need not have worried. Penny may have been naturally verbose, but she was just as naturally kind and seemed to appreciate Lady Patience's shy nature. Now, what's all this about an invitation? Penny repeated once introductions were completed. Patience looked to Annabella, who nodded her encouragement. Mother has invited Miss Kelly to attend my debut ball, Lady Patience explained softly. Well, now that is a great honour. Penny said approvingly. That is most generous of the Duchess. To Annabella, she said, you ought to go. 
It would do you some good, maybe even flow some of those cobwebs away. Have you been unwell, Miss Kelly? Lady Patience said, all gentle concern. Penny waved off her concerns. Oh no, it's not that. I suspect our talented friend has simply become love-struck. Love-struck? Lady Patience breathed, one lace-gloved hand pressed against her mouth. Annabella groaned. She was beginning to regret introducing her friends to each other. Now she would have both of them after her for romantic plots. Already she could see Lady Patience's love of romance shining out through her eyes. Combined with Penny's penchant for gossip, well, that could only be a recipe for disaster, likely at her own expense. It seems to be the only explanation to me, Penny continued. What else leaves a girl so starry-eyed? Lady Patience peered closer at Annabella. Oh, you are right. She has been struck by Cupid's arrow. Annabella's eyes fluttered closed, just a bit too long to be merely blinking. I'm really not, she protested weakly. But Lady Patience was sidling up to Penny, and the pair were examining Annabella as if she were a display at a gallery. Do you believe it to be her mysterious gentleman? she said in a low voice to Penny. Penny started staring at Lady Patience for a moment. You know about him? Well, in any case, I do believe you are right, dear, dear Lady Patience. This time, Annabella did not bother trying to suppress her groan. Penny likes Lady Patience, she groused inwardly, pinching the bridge of her nose. It's serious. She's already calling her dear, dear. Have you any notion who it is? Lady Patience breathed to Penny. No, our Mr. Hup. Penny, Annabella warned. If Lady Patience learned his name, she had the time and resources to ascertain his true identity. She also had the inclination, given her commitment to the attraction of a mysterious suitor. Well, in any event, I expect things are rather more advanced than our dear Annabella would like to think, Penny sniffed. Annabella sighed. This was getting nowhere productive, mostly because she hated to admit that there was truth in what they said. She was at odds today, and it was entirely due to Mr. Hardy. She slumped her way back to her stool and sat heavily. Her friends followed close behind, their faces concerned. If you must know, I did see him again, Annabella confessed. It was... She trailed off, and a blush crept up her neck at the memory of their near kiss. Was he perfectly beastly? Lady Patience asked. A slow smile spread over Annabella's face. No, she said softly. It was perfectly wonderful. She looked up into their waiting faces. The trouble is, it has cemented my suspicion that he is a gentleman of no small means. I suspect he is titled. He speaks most eloquently on matters of duty, that I suspect his father has put much expectation on him. Well, that doesn't narrow it down at all, Lady Patience said grimly. The nobility have rather perfected the art of putting pressure on their children. Penny tapped her chin with one finger. But wait, isn't this all the more reason to attend Lady Patience's ball? Surely a great many of the ton shall be there, no? At Patience's nod, Penny continued. Well then, perhaps you shall spy him there. Then you shall get your answers and you can demand to know his intentions. But that's just it. Annabella said quietly, looking down at her hands. She brushed the calluses from holding and pricking herself with needles every day for years on end with her thumbs. Why should I assume he has any intentions? What sign has he given me? Perhaps he simply enjoys my company as a friend. He gave me that lovely folio, but that was in amends of the one he ruined. Even as she said it, she was aware of how ridiculous it was. The ladies had nothing to say to that and exchanged unhappy looks. Won't you please come anyway? Lady Patience said, quietly. Her light green eyes were wide and pleading. I should be very grateful, and I know that you will have the most splendid time. Mother and I shall introduce you to positively everyone, and then you shall be the most famous modiste in all of London. Annabella gave Patience a small smile. At the precise moment she was opening her mouth to answer, the bell over the door chimed out again.
as the door to the shop was pushed open. All three turned to look at the new entrant. All were equally surprised and curious to see a messenger boy standing there. Be this Madam Kelly's fine fashions for the discerning lady? The lad asked carefully. His clothing was simple but in good repair, and he carefully cradled a wooden box in his arms. That's what it says on the door, Penny informed him haughtily. The messenger was clearly nonplussed by her grand manner. He grinned a gap-toothed grin at her and said, Never learn to read, Mum. Look for the golden butterflies on the sign, as what he said. You are in the right place, Annabella said, coming forward. I am Miss Kelly. The messenger hustled forward, holding the wooden box carefully as if it contained priceless glass or porcelain. I'm to put this direct in your arms only, Miss, the messenger said with all the seriousness that a boy of about twelve could muster. Obligingly, Annabella put her arms out to receive the box. Gingerly, the boy put it into her care, doffed his floppy cloth hat and turned to scamper off. The box was heavier than Annabella had anticipated, and her arms wavered for a moment. Wait, she called after the boy. But who sent it? she asked. The lad didn't answer, merely turned around long enough to give her a cheeky grin again. Then he was off, out the door, and galloping down the street on cultish legs. All three ladies stared after him for a moment, then quickly turned their attention to the box in question. Perhaps there's a note, Penny suggested. Annabella nodded and carefully toted the box to the counter and gingerly set it down. There was no note on the outside, but when she slowly slid the lid free, there was indeed a folded piece of paper within. Brown paper covered whatever the contents of the box were. Oh, how mysterious! Lady Patience cried, clapping her hands together. Who is it from? Tell us quick, my dear, Penny agreed, leaning forward eagerly. Slowly, Annabella unfolded the note. It was short, only a couple lines, and she read it quickly. Her friends watched her closely as she did so, and she tried mightily to not give it away. It was all in vain, however, as the moment she was done reading, a smile began spreading along her face, accompanied by the twin roses of a blush on her cheeks. Oh, it must be from him, Lady Patience surmised, bouncing slightly on the balls of her feet again. Don't keep us in suspense, Penny chided. Obligingly, Annabella passed over the note while she made her way behind the counter again. Penny held it up for both her and Patience to inspect. Annabella could still see the words floating before her eyes, as vividly as if she, too, still looked at the note. The best that I can offer to protect the most precious emeralds in the kingdom, it read in neat, precise script. The most precious emeralds, Lady Patience repeated, whatever does that mean? Annabella reached forward, already suspecting she knew what was in the box. Carefully, she pulled back the crisp brown paper. Nestled within, stacked in neat rows, was the largest quantity of pure white candles that she had ever seen in one place. They were smooth and perfectly formed, the wicks uniformly trimmed. The amount of money represented in this one box was enough to feed a family for months. Penny let out an appreciative breath. Oh. Oh, Annabella, that is the loveliest, most thoughtful, kindest. She stopped, clearly overwhelmed. Annabella was inclined to agree with her, but was still unable to speak. Candles, Lady Patience asked sceptically. I have never heard of tapers for a love gift before. Annabella was still staring down into the box, so Penny answered. Light is vital to any needlewoman, she explained. The pure white ones like this give off the best light and burn the most evenly. It saves their eyes much strain and discomfort. The trouble is they cost more than a few pennies. And her mystery suitor has given her a whole box, Lady Patience said. He clearly knows how valuable they are to Miss Kelly then and what they would mean. But why emeralds? Penny nudged Lady Patience and gestured to Annabella with a significant look. Perhaps if you examined Miss Kelly's eyes, you would find the answer to that particular riddle.
Immediately, Lady Patience's gaze slid to Annabella and then she blinked in surprise. Your eyes really are the most startling shade of green, she observed. A beat of silence, and then she was exclaiming, Oh, oh, oh! The most precious emeralds in the kingdom, indeed! Penny nodded, sighing happily. Ah, young love. Love? Annabella croaked. She still held the wooden lid to the crate in her hands, holding it before her a little, as if it were a shield. Oh, Miss Kelly, you are such a lucky girl! Lady Patience agreed. It can only be love. Love? Annabella managed to utter again. She looked up at her pair of friends, standing on the other side of the counter. Though separated by age, social standing and experience, they stared back at Annabella with twin expressions of dewy-eyed wonder. Both had their hands clasped beneath their respective chins, waiting with bated breath. It is a most considerate gift, Annabella said slowly. It is extravagant, but practical. He values my work and understands how important it is to me. He listened to me. She couldn't explain why, but her eyes were suddenly wet. And that note... Annabella looked down at the box again, at the candles that gleamed back up at her. It can only be love, she murmured, not entirely believing the words. Well? Lady Patience demanded. Does this mean that you will be attending the ball then? Annabella bit her lower lip, looking up at her friends, first one, then the other. She didn't speak, but began smiling, which quickly grew to giggling. Chapter 27 Annabella had never particularly understood the function of young ladies of the ton being presented to the Queen, and suddenly they were women. It seemed strange that a nod and a tap from a scepter could confer such a status. But then, she was just a simple dressmaker. As nonsensical as it was to her, it was a matter of great importance to Lady Patience, and Lady Patience was dear to Annabella. It was how she marked a milestone of her life. At Lady Patience's request, Annabella had arrived at the Duchess of Sussex's home early under the pretense of Annabella helping Patience to dress. In reality, they would dress together, with Patience lending her maid to Annabella to assist with her own toilette. From the moment that Annabella had arrived, Lady Patience had been chattering in an endless stream after first greeting her with airy kisses to her cheeks. Annabella bore this all with good humour, finding Lady Patience's transformation delightful. She would like to think she might be able to take some of the credit for helping this shy creature out of her cocoon. Carefully, with the help of the maid, Annabella was lifting the white silk gown over Patience's head. And you wouldn't believe the hideousness of the court gowns. It defies belief. It really does, Patience was saying, her voice muffled as the gown has passed over her head. I've heard that the Queen Mother entertains some... unusual notions about fashion, Annabella agreed. Gently, she set the gown on Patience's shoulders, the tiny white peaked sleeves fastening around her upper arms. The maid stepped forward and began buttoning the back. I felt as if I were the world's most ungainly souffle, Patience continued, her little nose wrinkled in distaste. Just imagine it, lacage and petticoats all crammed under one of these sleek empire-style gowns. It's a wonder we could curtsy to Her Majesty at all without falling over. Annabella smiled. Well, the fact that you managed it is a testament to your ability. Or oh, my luck, Lady Patience muttered as Annabella helped the maid to fasten the robing about her. Carefully, while holding on to Annabella for balance, Lady Patience stepped into her silk dancing slippers. The maid pulled up her evening gloves to her upper arms, encasing Patience's arms in the smoothest of silk. At last, after fixing a spray of pearls and feathers at the back of Patience's head, both Annabella and the maid stepped back. Guiding Patience by both hands, they gently escorted her over to the large mirror in her dressing room. When she opened her eyes and beheld herself, she gave a little gasp. This cannot be me, she exclaimed. Annabella's face almost a shed from smiling, 
not only from the pride in her creations, but out of happiness for her friend. I am transformed, Patience murmured, and indeed she had been. Her evening gown was pure white silk, cut into a daringly dipped neckline that showed her delicate collarbones. Instead of a plain chemise beneath, Annabel had cleverly included a small spray of feathers at the centre of the bust. The sleeves were small and puffed, supported from within so that they always maintained their shape. The truly remarkable thing about the ensemble, however, was the robbing that fell from Patience's shoulders and fastened about her waist. It was made of palest champagne-coloured velvet, shot with silver, so that it appeared to be gold one moment, silver the next. Embroidered flowers and vines cascaded down the edges and about the waist, with some of the flowers being set with pearls and crystal beads. The neck of the robing was high along the back of Patience's neck, with a small trim of pearls and feathers, much like the sprig at her chest. Combined with the subtle pearls and curled feathers in her hair, Patience resembled nothing so much as some sort of mythological goddess in the midst of transforming into a swan. The cut of the gown emphasised her long, elegant neck and arms, and the colour made her skin appear so pale as to be porcelain. Oh, my lady, you are the loveliest of girls, the maid sighed, her eyes wide and dreamy as she stared at her mistress. Annabella nodded in agreement. You will awe them all, she said certainly. Perhaps now even my intended will truly see me, Patience said, her voice coloured with hope. Annabella took the younger girl's hands in her own. He would be either blind or a fool not to notice you, I dare say he shall have to fight the other gentleman for a spot on your dance card. What if... Lady Patience hesitated, biting her lip and looking at herself in the reflection. What if I make a fool of myself? You will do magnificently, Annabella said with all the confidence that she could muster. You are far more than you believe yourself to be. Just remember to breathe. Oh, I nearly forgot. Your dress has a secret, she said, lifting the robbing. When you wish to dance, slip your fingers into these loops, here. Lady Patience smiled a trembling smile, lifted her head, and prepared to descend down the stairs. Annabella could not help but feel another swell of pride. The feeling persisted as she watched Lady Patience wait at the top of the grand stairs as she was announced to the waiting ton. Annabella stayed to the side, hidden on the edges, from here she could see Lady Patience make her debut into society. Dozens of glittering, beautifully dressed members of the ton turned as one to look up at the stairs. A sort of gasp travelled like a wave through the assembled. Patience paused part way down, radiating poise and demure beauty. Under the light of the chandelier and the myriad candles, she appeared as fine and graceful as a marble statue. Even the footman whose duty it was to announce her seemed dumbfounded and had to be nudged to remember his task. Lady Patience Carnegie, daughter of the late Duke and Duchess of Carnegie, he called out at last. Patience began to descend again to a polite refrain of applause and was received at the bottom of the stairs by the Duchess. Instantly, a crowd of admirers and well-wishers. Even from her perch still on the upper floor, Annabella could see Patience blushing delicately in both pleasure and bashfulness. The Duchess, taking Lady Patience by the hand, prepared to escort her to the ballroom. Annabella was fully expecting to wait for the proper moment to descend. It would be the height of impropriety for her to detract in any way from Lady Patience's moment. To Annabella's great surprise, however, before the Duchess could pull her away, Lady Patience was turning back around. Her eyes were searching the crowd behind her, and at last she spotted Annabella standing behind the balustrade on the upper floor. With a charmingly childlike gesture, she reached up to Annabella with an outstretched hand and gestured in such a way that it was clear she wanted Annabella to take said hand. Annabella instinctively stepped back, shaking her head. The last thing she wanted was to anger the Duchess and having a modest escort her daughter into the ballroom was, she was fairly certain, high on the list of things that would anger the Duchess. 
Lady Patience would not be forestalled, however, no matter how much the Duchess insisted. She simply continued to reach up to Annabella. Some members of the crowd were turning to stare back up the stairs, and in order to avoid a scene, Annabella swallowed hard and stepped forward. She attempted to remember her own advice to Lady Patience to simply breathe. As she descended, however, into the crowd of the great and good of the kingdom, she could not shake the feeling that she was entering a nest of vipers. They watched her with curious, assessing eyes. She kept her hand tight on the railing and refused to be cowed by them. While she did not cut the figure that Lady Patience had as she descended, Annabella could still hold her head high. She wore a gown of ivory silk, but the sleeves were slashed to reveal a dark emerald green silk beneath. A coordinating belt of dark velvet green was fastened about her waist, but cut into a sharp dip at the centre to emphasise her figure. A butterfly was embroidered on the centre in gold silk, surrounded by golden laurels. A matching dark green stole draped about her elbows. The crowd parted obligingly so that she might join Lady Patience. Annabella swallowed hard but held her head high. She did her utmost to ignore the staring eyes that noted her every move, her every breath and glance. Lady Patience, as if sensing Annabella's recalcitrance, looped her arm through the modistes. Annabella couldn't bring herself to look at the Duchess but once, and she got the distinct impression of a firmly set jaw and rigid smile. The procession made their way to the ballroom, the doors of which were grandly opened to admit them. Lady Patience, upon seeing the splendour within, let out a soft sound of awe. Annabella was inclined to agree with her. The room was polished to a high shine, the gilding shining as if from its own inner light. The ceiling was richly painted in a scene depicting gods and goddesses lounging as they listened to poets and musicians. Nestled in one corner on a slightly raised platform were the musicians, who sat at rigid attention. The large windows, the frames also painted gold, overlooked the garden, which was lit with torches so that guests might take the air. As was the custom, before the dancing was to commence, a series of dignified persons were arrayed on the dance floor to give speeches. This was supposed to be their chance to decry the virtues and beauty of Lady Patience on the occasion of her entrance to society, but as she was relatively unknown, this proved to be somewhat difficult. Annabella, with Lady Patience still holding tightly to her arm, could feel her brows rising as they described poor Patience in the vaguest of terms. It seemed that the speaker's preferred strategy was to praise her worthy late father and redoubtable mother, who preened under the tribute. Annabella glanced to Patience, looking to see how she was taking all of this. To her great relief and surprise, Lady Patience appeared to be finding the whole thing amusing. Though her face maintained the placid, serene mien expected of young ladies, Annabella could see the occasional twitch of the corner of her mouth. Her light green eyes, too, twinkled with bemusement. As if she felt Annabella's eye on her, Patience glanced at her and made the briefest of eye contact. Greatly daring, Patience gave her the briefest of eye rolls, which forced Annabella to duck her head and bite her lip to keep from laughing aloud. This did not engender any great sobriety in Patience, who tightened her grasp on Annabella. The two young ladies found it quite necessary to hold on to each other with the tightest of hands in order to forestall raucous giggling. The Duchess, meanwhile, seemed determined to carry the dignity and sobriety of the entire event herself. She maintained a most serious expression, her nose thrust so high into the air that it would have been comical on a lesser person. Whenever she deigned to look down at Patience and Annabella, it was to give a thinly disguised grimace at their interlocked hands. Mercifully, the speeches were concluded in short order. A brief toast was given, footmen deftly circulating with trays of champagne glasses. Annabella accepted hers, judiciously ignoring the way the Duchess stiffened as she did so. As she took a first experimental sip, Annabella really did nearly burst into surprised laughter. She had never experienced the strange sensation of bubbles on one's tongue before. It tickled most unusually. At last, the crowd was released to mingle before the dancing commenced. This was necessary so that gentlemen might put their names to the ladies' dance cards. As was expected, 
Lady Patience had to stay within the protective shadow of the Duchess, so that any hopeful dance partners had to pass muster. However, the Duchess was soon occupied accepting what she clearly felt was her due, as no fewer than a dozen well-wishers had lined up to chat with her. Have you ever seen so many people? Lady Patience whispered to Annabella. Not like this, she admitted. The ladies, all in shades of white, all sparkled beneath the candlelight. Everyone seemed to know the correct steps and things to say. It was more than a little unnerving to Annabella, who had never considered such a thing before. I think Mother has invited everyone in London, Patience continued, her eyes scanning the crowd. I'm sure I shall have to dance with any number of dreary neighbours and old friends. Probably, Annabella agreed. Best hope that there isn't much wine served at the dinner break. Your feet are poorly armoured in those silk slippers. Oh, my poor little toes, Patience groaned. No doubt I shall be expected to dance with my intended as well. I hope that Mother doesn't feel compelled to make any unfortunate announcements tonight. I would like to dance with at least one eligible young man tonight, and they will be frightened off by a terribly grand duke waiting in the wings. Oh, Patience said, seizing Annabella's wrist. You must tell me if you see your suitor as well. We shall solve that mystery tonight. I'm sure of it. But Annabella was not listening any more. A most curious sensation was stealing over her. Her mouth had gone quite dry, and her heart felt as if it had leapt up into her throat. Approaching across the dance floor, looking resplendent and like a dream made real, was none other than Mr Hardy. Chapter 28 I wonder if anyone else can hear my heart. Surely they can. It's louder than a galloping horse, Annabella thought distantly. She was aware that she was staring quite openly so at Mr Hardy as he approached. His eyes were fixed on the Duchess and he wore an expression of concealed drudgery. Annabella felt herself breathing faster and faster, silently willing him to see her. Mr Hardy's eyes did not meet hers, however, until he was only a matter of a couple feet away. At first, his eyes slid away from her, passing her over as if she were simply another guest. Within a split second, however, his blue eyes were snapping back to Annabella. A strange expression came over his face. At first, he looked at her with wonder, and then his eyes were drinking her in, like he were a wanderer in the desert, and she were an oasis. Annabella could feel a blush starting, and she wished it away with every fibre of her being. And then, most terribly, Mr Hardy beheld her companions, and it was as if a door were slammed shut. There had been the briefest instant of some species of dread or panic in his face, and then his expression became closed off and unreadable. Annabella did not know what to make of this, for though it felt as if hours had passed, in reality it had happened in a matter of seconds. Within that time he had continued walking toward them, looking for all the world like a fish being dragged to shore. Annabella did not know what was happening, only that it was something awful. Her hands had suddenly gone cold in their pristine white evening gloves. The sound of the ballroom seemed distant and muted. Ah, there you are, Your Grace, the Duchess said, cutting into the horrible spell Annabella seemed caught in. Your Grace, Annabella thought dumbly, staring at Mr Hardy, who barely concealed a wince as he bowed to the ladies. Have you come to favour patience with a dance? It is nearly time to open the ball, after all the Duchess continued, a look of triumph on her face. Surely that can wait a moment, Mother, Patience said with surprising force. Your Grace, may I present my very dear friend, Miss Annabella Kelly. She is a most talented modiste, to whom I owe my success this evening, the young lady enthused, turning to gaze at her friend adoringly. Miss Kelly, this is Alan Hardy, the Duke of Brandon, Patience continued. Annabella did not hear her, though. Not really. Every syllable felt like a hammer stroke. Her vision narrowed in a most peculiar way so that it felt as if she were viewing events from the bottom of a deep, dark well. Waves of hot and cold passed over her in quick succession, her hands numb. Guided by pure instinct, Annabella could feel herself dropping an acceptable curtsy. Mr Hardy, 
No, that is not right, Annabella thought. He was never Mr. Hardy. The Duke of Brandon returned her salutation, neither speaking. What of it, Your Grace? the Duchess said. Shall you open the ball with Lady Patience? The Duke, as if unable to help himself, spared a glance for Annabella. A strange mask settled over his face, one of perfect composure and dignity. He nodded, then bowed to Lady Patience. Shyly she offered him her wrist around which her dance card was secured, as if the beautifully embossed dance card weighed as much as an iron anchor. The Duke lifted it slowly and scrawled his name on it. Annabella watched all of this happen from far, far away, as if it were happening to someone else. It felt almost as if she were outside of her own body. You are such a fool, she thought to herself, as she watched her little friend and the Duke take their places on the dance floor. They make a handsome pair, do they not? The Duchess said to Annabella, never taking her eyes from her daughter and the Duke. Yes. Annabella managed to choke out. They make a handsome pair. I must compliment you, Miss Kelly, the Duchess continued. You have outperformed all of my expectations, and you may trust that my expectations were quite high. Thank you, Your Grace. I'm glad that I could enable Lady Patience to shine, Annabella replied. As if on cue, the musicians took up their instruments. In the quiet moments before they began to play, Time that was pregnant with anticipation, Lady Patience slipped the loops that Annabella had shown her earlier on her fingers. As the music began, and she sprang into motion along with the other ladies, the movement caught the robbing. The silk was so light that it caught in the air a little, and Lady Patience looked as if she had gossamer wings. All about the ballroom there was a kind of sigh of appreciation at the spectacle. Though she still reeled from the shock and hurt, Annabella could not help but feel a surge of pride. She really had made something beautiful, and she could not wholly begrudge that it was for Lady Patience. She had grown genuinely fond of her, and was in some way glad that she was having her moment in the proverbial sun. Lady Patience was a timid dancer, but moved with precision as was required. Annabella wished she could look away as the pair danced, tripping lightly across the floor, but her eyes were riveted to the scene. Every time the Duke took Lady Patience's hand, every time she passed under his arm, Annabella could feel some small piece of her heart shrivel up. The Duke, too, seemed in some kind of torment, for his eyes kept flicking to Annabella. She knew that she should be angry at him, furious even, but she could not bring herself to be so. He had withheld the truth from her, possibly even trifled with her heart. But was she no less guilty? She had presumed exactly as much as he had. All of this was beside the point, that though she felt very much as if she did not know him, he still wore Mr. Hardy's face. She couldn't bring herself to hate him. No, there was a sort of crushing acceptance to her sadness. A line of people was forming about the Duchess, a combination of those who wished to congratulate her on Lady Patience's stunning debut into society and those jockeying for a dance. In a great show of condescension, she directed some of the praise to Annabella. Through her eyes burned with unshed tears and her throat felt entirely closed off, Annabella dipped her head and smiled graciously in recognition of the compliments she was being paid. You should be happy, she chided herself. You have at last learned the truth, and your work is the toast of London tonight. Your mother is surely smiling down on your success. What else could you, the orphan daughter of a dressmaker, expect? The song finally ended, and the Duke escorted Lady Patience back to the tender embrace of her mother, his hand supporting hers as they walked. Annabella felt in great danger of screaming or crying. If it had been anyone else but Lady Patience, if it had been anyone but her. Oh, Annabella, Lady Patience breathed, taking her friend excitedly by the hands. Everyone is staring at me and not because I have done or said something foolish. It's all thanks to you. Annabella smiled, but it felt rather more like baring her teeth. The Duchess, overhearing, smiled indulgently at Annabella, then at the Duke. Yes, Miss Kelly has been most helpful in Patience's debut. We are most grateful to her, I'm sure. Oh, yes, 
patience enthused. Why, the Duke was just complimenting me on my fine gown, she said, smiling adoringly at Annabella. That's so kind of him, Annabella said, still showing her teeth in what she hoped was a smile. Not at all, the Duke said, staring directly at Annabella. I believe we should always compliment fine artisans, he said pointedly, a muscle in his jaw working. It was as if he were trying to say something to Annabella without actually speaking. But we must do something kind for you too, Patience said, suddenly seized by a notion. Your Grace, as you are still unengaged for the next dance, perhaps you would be so kind as to partner Miss Kelly. Patience, the Duchess said tightly through her teeth. You cannot invite people to dance with others. I do not, the Duke began. Besides which, the Duchess said, her pointed smile still in place, a duke dancing with a modiste, perish the thought. Patience looked suitably cowed. Gone was the interesting burgeoning young woman that was beginning to unfurl like a freshly hatched butterfly. She shrank back into herself, ducked her head, and looked as if she wanted nothing more than to disappear. Beyond everything else that had transpired that evening, Annabella discovered that she still had enough feeling to find this heartbreaking. You are so kind to offer, Lady Patience, Annabella said suddenly, wishing to come to Patience's rescue. But I haven't even a dance card, see? She continued, holding her wrist up for inspection. Oh, Patience said, her eyes lighting up again. That's easily rectified. Fishing about in a pocket cleverly hidden in a seam, the young lady produced a spare dance card. I carried an extra, in case I should lose mine. Annabella really was trapped now. There was no other excuse she could offer. Dumbly, she held out her arm and allowed Patience to loop the card about her wrist, the tassel on the string fluttering. The Duke, too, seemed to take some offence on Patience's behalf. Your grace is the soul of kindness to be so concerned for myself, he said coolly to the Duchess. But I assure you, I feel no impropriety regarding the offer. Indeed, I would be honoured to dance with the young miss. Surely one who creates such beautiful things must be celebrated as a true artist. Annabella was unsure if he spoke in defence of herself or patience. Either way, she felt a swell of gratitude for him. For the first time since he had completed his dance with Patience, she found herself able to make eye contact with him. What about it, Miss Kelly? he asked carefully, bowing slightly and offering his hand. Would you do me the honour of, um, of dancing with me? he asked. Annabella stared at him for some moments. It was all that she had wanted for the evening, deep in her most secret of hearts to be on his arm, to dance with him. And yet she had not forgiven him. She was at the point of refusing him, the consequences of publicly cutting a duke be damned. But something in his deep blue eyes gave her pause. There was a profound, poignant sadness within, tinged by a glimmer of hope. He was not merely being polite. He wished to dance with her. Her heart cried out for her to say yes. Before she was aware of what she was doing, she was nodding her head and offering up the wrist with her dance card. Slowly, with great care as if she were as delicate as a butterfly's wing, the Duke took her card and wrote on it. With the lightest of touches, as if his hand burnt her, she laid her hand on the back of his and allowed him to lead her out to the dance floor. Annabella had never been one for signs or premonitions that had always been much more her mother's remit than her own. But she could not help but feel that for the rest of her days she would divide her life into before this night and after. Chapter 29 Alan was trying to come up with a word strong enough for what he felt at the moment. It was not despair, and it was not shame, not exactly. It was some horrible combination thereof. There was another sensation hidden within as well a kind of sickening joy and happiness at seeing Annabella in this setting. He had long harboured a secret desire to know what it would look like if she were to find her way into society. He had suspected that she would be dazzling, a rose among the thorns. The truly awful thing was that he was right. She was stunning. 
though all eyes were meant to be on lady patients, and they were at first thanks in no small part to her stunning ensemble, there was no denying the beauty and poise of the young lady next to her. Gossip had roared through the ballroom as fast as a wildfire. The general consensus had been at first that she had been hired as a companion to the young lady. Though Miss Kelly was dressed less ostentatiously than Lady Patience, she cut no less elegant of a figure. Alan would not forget the terrible moment her eyes found his. Her face had been full of excitement and eager anticipation for the evening, her green eyes wide as she took in all the sights and sounds. Even if he had not known her, the lively intelligence and quiet confidence in her face would have induced him to requesting a dance and an introduction. And then she had seen him, and her face took on a rigid paleness that was so far removed from the expression she had worn that Alan felt as if he had been shot. Whatever his hopes had been, he had never intended for her to be hurt in such a way. For that alone, he would never forgive himself. Now they had to pretend that all was normal. They had to pretend not to know one another. Annabella stood across from him on the dance floor, having allowed herself to be led to the proper place. She did not even deign to regard him, holding her head aloft with a splendid aloofness. Privately, he had to admire her manner. There was little doubt that the society matrons were watching and were already concocting grand stories to explain her pride. The music began, and Alan quickly realised that this would likely be his only chance to explain himself. How could you begin to do that, he thought wryly. The set was comprised of three couples each, with multiple passes and promenades, perfect times to pass a clandestine word or two. It was then that he took his chance. With a glance to left and right to ensure they were not being overhead, Alan said, I did not know that you were familiar with this dance. Instantly he winced inwardly. It was such an insincere opening that he would not blame her for simply ignoring him. I've had to learn many things rather quickly, she said blithely as she passed by him. I... Yes, I suppose you have, he agreed lowly. They passed several moments in silence before he tried again. You must believe me. I never intended for you. Lady Patience looks splendid tonight, does she not? Annabella interrupted, stepping to the side lightly and around him. Annabella, please! Miss Kelly, she hissed as they joined hands for a moment. It was the first display of temper he had seen from her. Alan wished that she would upbraid him, give him the verbal thrashing he deserved. Anything would have been better than this distant coldness. This isn't what I wanted, he said simply. No, I expect it isn't, Miss Kelly agreed. Then, what does this mean for you and I? he asked, holding their hands aloft for the other pairs to pass under. Miss Kelly was prevented from answering by the other coops passing between them. When at last it was their turn to pass under the others' joined hands, both of their own hands laced together, she spoke. You know very well what it means, she said. There is no you and I, and there never was. There were only the delusions of a duke afraid of his commitments and the girlish dreams of a foolish dressmaker. She paused before him, staring directly up at him with fire in her eyes for just a moment too long to be part of the dance. Do you really think I would do anything to cause Lady Patience a moment of unhappiness? She has borne enough in her life, and she counts me among her friends. Everything I have worked for, everything I have poured myself into, do you believe yourself to be worth it? These last words were not said in the manner of one wishing to insult another. They were uttered in perfect honesty, an open question. Alan despised that she was so forthright and, well, right. Under the circumstances, he had no refutation for her query. He had behaved poorly and he could not rightly argue that he was worth any of her trouble. The song ended, the notes fading about them as they stared at each other. This is it, he realised. This is how it ends. This is how we part. The notion was almost more than he could bear. He had not fully appreciated what Miss Kelly meant to him until he was facing a future without her. Miss Kelly was still searching his face, looking for something. Whatever it was, she did not find it, for her expression changed and became closed off again. Abruptly, she turned and raised her hand. 
waiting for him to escort her from the dance floor. He obliged, knowing that he had failed her again in some way, that he had likely failed them both. You were splendid, Lady Patience said quietly, but with great enthusiasm the moment they had rejoined her. Miss Kelly smiled demurely, her face a study in disinterest. Before the Duke released her hand, he took a chance and pressed her fingers one last time. She did not return the gesture, but she froze like a doe caught before the hounds. Her whole body seemed tense, as if she were listening hard for something. The moment passed. The Duke made his bows and withdrew under the scrutinising gaze of the Duchess. Though she had been absent from society for nearly two decades, the Duchess was as sharp as ever. Her late husband, the Duke of Sussex, had always said that she had impeccable instincts. If something caught her eye, there was a reason for it. Something about the modiste bothered her. She could not put her finger on it, but it was there all the same, like a splinter in her palm. The Duchess had made inquiries, but had turned up nothing of note. The girl was the daughter of a widow from Belfast. They were of decent family and came to London about fifteen years ago. There were no skeletons in their closet, no unpaid debts or scandals lurking. By all accounts, they were decent, hard-working people. Though the Duchess had initially had some reservations about Miss Kelly's age and experience, those concerns had long been laid to rest. The modiste delivered what she said she would, and always exactly on time. The girl was undeniably talented. She had worked something of a miracle with patience. It may have been as simple as her looks, with her beautifully straight nose and large green eyes. Something about her face was unsettlingly familiar. It was therefore more than a little annoying that the feeling of unease persisted. The Duchess took some amount of umbrage with the overly familiar manner in which Patience and Miss Kelly addressed one another, but that was nothing that could not be managed. And then it was like a bolt of lightning from the skies. The Duke of Brandon's face had given him away for just a moment. If she had not been so attuned the strange air that pervaded the introduction, the Duchess would have missed it. The modiste, too, had seemed pained. To her credit, she had made a great show of disinterest. So, the Duke has been having a bit of a London tryst, has he? The Duchess thought shrewdly. Both the Duke and the modiste had ducked their heads, avoiding looking at one other so studiously as to almost be amusing. The Duchess had even doubted herself for a moment, wondering if she had read more into the situation than was actually there, it was the dance that had sealed things. Patience had watched them with the eager, delighted face of one whose dear friends were themselves becoming friends. The Duchess, however, had watched them with the eyes of a hawk. The modiste had snatched her hand away from the Duke whenever she was forced to take his hand. It was only in the last moments of the dance when she had said something to the Duke, staring up into his face with an expression somewhere between hope and outrage, that the Duchess had been certain. Once the Duke had deposited the modiste back among the ladies, a cold and calculating feeling crept over the Duchess. She was not to be trifled with on the best of days, and she certainly was not about to let an uppity modiste ruin her daughter's chances. A young man with floppy brown hair and unfortunately large front teeth approached shyly and requested a dance with patience. The Duchess smiled warmly at the young man and nodded her approval. Patience, blushing prettily under the attention, allowed herself to be squired to the dance floor again. Lady Patience is in fine form this evening, the Duchess commented mildly to the modiste. Miss Kelly started as if she had been lost in thought and very likely was. She is a credit to you, Your Grace, she agreed. They make a handsome pair, the Duchess said with a nod to the dance floor and a pointedly raised brow. It was a clear attempt to get under Annabella's skin. Again, the modiste agreed, refusing to play the Duchess's game. She is an ornament on anyone's arm. Of course not as handsome a pair as she made with the Duke, of course, the Duchess continued as if Miss Kelly had not spoken at all. Though she spoke casually, the implied warning was impossible to miss. From the corner of her eye, the Duchess could see the modiste turn to glance up at her. No. Miss Kelly said softly. They made a most handsome pair. A blush was creeping up the modiste's neck. 
Would you excuse me, Your Grace? I... I should like to take some air, she said with a hurried curtsy. The Duchess dipped her head, watching the dressmaker weave her way out of the ballroom. Yes, you have been found out. Nothing stays hidden in London for long, silly girl, the Duchess thought to herself. It was a hard lesson that all young ladies learned one way or another. It was a little bit of a pity that the dressmaker had to learn it in such a painful manner. The Duchess frowned. That does not matter, she reminded herself. The only thing that matters is patience and her chances. Everything depends on her. With that, the Duchess's already formidable resolve was strengthened into a steely knife, razor sharp and ready to cut away anything that got into her way. Chapter 30 Annabella had no clear memory of returning home the evening before. She could only remember that she longed for the humble comforts of her rooms. A steady rain had begun to fall as she hastened homeward, soaking her thoroughly and ruining her hair and her gown. She did not care. The evening had left her feeling drained and numb. The rain was welcome in a way, for it made it impossible to tell if she was crying. The remnants of the scene that played out at Lady Patience's ball clung to her, and it felt as if the rain was washing it away. When she had reached her home, she had trudged up the narrow stairs to the apartments above the shop. Each step felt as if it had weighed a ton. Carelessly, Annabella had removed her fine gown, now drenched and dripping. She couldn't be bothered to even make an effort at hanging it. It lay where it had fallen, a heap of water-stained white and green silk. She simply crawled into bed and wished the evening away. Sleep eluded her, fragmented dreams haunting her for the few minutes she managed to doze off. When the first rays of the sun began to shine through the small window in her bedroom, Annabella contemplated simply staying in bed. She was swaddled in her mother's quilt, safe and warm in her cocoon. But no, she had never been one for idling a day away. With a heavy sigh, she threw the covers off, wincing a little when her sore feet touched the cold floor. Mechanically, she dressed in the simple dress she wore in her shop. The well-washed cotton comforted as she put it on. The gown, heaped on the floor, caught her eye in the looking glass as she attended to her hair. Annabella sighed and lifted the sopping dress up. It was heavy, laden as it was with rainwater. There was no saving it now unless she hoped to start a trend for water-stained silk. I'm sorry, beautiful dress, she murmured to the empty room. You did not deserve your fate. You were a beautiful dream. With another sigh, she heaved the dress up and draped it across the fire screen so that it might dry a little. The day passed in a blur of gritty, painful eyes and a throbbing head. Annabella did not even attempt to work, simply sat behind the counter and tended to the few customers that wandered in for gloves or stockings. It was nearing noontide when a familiar personage passed by the shop windows, first on one side, then on the other. Unbidden, Annabella's heart began to race. She would know him anywhere, even in her sleep-deprived state. What on earth is he thinking of coming here after last night? She thought incredulously. It was indeed the Duke, pacing like a caged tiger outside her shop. With a kind of morbid fascination she watched him, taking a kind of grim satisfaction from his obviously troubled state. Her mouth ran dry, however, when the Duke stopped before the shop door. Without thinking, Annabella ducked behind the counter, crouching on the floor. When several moments passed with the only sound being the pounding of her heart in her ears, Annabella's curiosity got the better of her. Cautiously, Still on the floor, she peered around the edge of the counter. The Duke still stood before the door, one arm extended as if he was simply holding the handle. She could not see his expression, but she could almost feel the tension radiating from him. His arm dropped, and he took a step backward. He turned, thought better of it, and returned to the door. This time, when he grasped the handle, he turned it and pushed the door open. The bell above the door chimed merrily, almost mockingly, into the heavy silence of the shop. Annabella scrambled behind the counter, trying to move as silently as possible into the back room without being spotted. 
Hello? The Duke called hesitantly. The sound of his voice sent a sharp pain through Annabella's chest. Still huddled on the floor, this time in her workroom, her back pressed against the wall, Annabella pressed both hands to her mouth. She could hear his polished riding boots clicking across the wooden floor, the boards creaking occasionally as he moved about. The back door to the shop opened suddenly, and Annabella thought that her heart might actually stop. She exhaled in relief, however, when she saw that it was Penny, wearing her favourite pink daydress. To her credit, Penny did not immediately comment on the fact that Annabella was crouched on the floor, clearly in hiding. She merely gave her a questioning look and began removing her gloves and capelet. Is anyone there? The Duke called again in his smooth tenor. Annabella thought that Penny's eyebrows might simply disappear into the red curls beneath her bonnet from shooting up so fast. Penny pointed to the front of the store and mouthed, Is that him? Annabella nodded, to which Penny pursed her lips, hands on her hips. They engaged in a kind of silent conversation, both staring and nodding increasingly vehemently toward the front of the store. At last, Penny sighed, threw up her hands, and made her way to the front. Apologies for the wait, sir, Penny said politely. How might I help? I was hoping to speak with Miss Kelly, he replied. Annabella's heart squeezed at hearing him say her name, and she pressed her hands to her chest. I'm afraid that she is out just now attending a fitting for a client, Penny said smoothly. There was a moment of silence and Annabella could easily imagine the Duke weighing Penny's words. If you might let her know I called, he said finally. May I leave my card with you? Certainly, sir. I'll see that she receives it promptly when she returns, Penny reassured him. I... Oh, your grace, forgive me. I didn't... Please do not trouble yourself. There was the sound of footsteps and the squeak of the floorboards again. The steps halted, and in a voice nearer the door, the Duke said, Would you tell her that I never... That is, I didn't mean to... Just give her my regards, please. Certainly, Your Grace, Penny said. At last, the door opened and closed again. There was silence for a moment, and then a rustle of silk and hurried footsteps that warned Penny was on the warpath. Annabella pushed away from the wall, wobbling a little as she stood just as Penny attained the workroom again. Annabella Marie Kelly, you had better tell me this instant what is going on, Penny said, little fists planted on her hips. It was always a little amusing whenever she attempted to lecture Annabella, for she stood nearly a foot shorter. Annabella didn't feel particularly amused this time, however, and sat heavily on a stool with a grunt. It's nothing, she offered lamely. Penny was having none of it, and made an exasperated sound through her nose. That is what you have been saying the entirety of this whole affair, she said, slapping the calling card down on the work table. I would say that this is the very opposite of nothing, she said, sliding the card over to Annabella. Annabella simply stared down at the card. It was a fine card stock, the Duke's name printed neatly on the front and edged in dark blue. Oddly, the more she stared at it, the more the letters started to blur. This was rather confusing, until a fat tear plopped down onto it. Oh, oh, no, my dear, no, Penny said, hustling over to Annabella and instantly wrapping her into a warm embrace. With one hand, she pressed Annabella's head into her bosom, whereupon Annabella proceeded to do something she despised. She cried, great heaving sobs, shaking her shoulders and making her breath catch. Penny didn't say anything, merely made comforting noises and gently rubbed Annabella's back until the storm had passed. When Annabella was able to finally draw a deep, shaky breath, Penny held her out at arm's length, concern creasing her normally cheerful round face. Annabella could not remember feeling so low since her mother had died. It's just that he didn't tell me the truth, Annabella managed at last. It's that he is intended for my friend. I could never hurt her. Lady Patience? Penny asked, surprised. When Annabella nodded, Penny pursed her lips again. 
No, that lamb has had enough to contend with by all accounts, she murmured. Annabella nodded unhappily, agreeing. Pulling in another deep breath, she sat up and swiped at her eyes with the heels of her hands. She turned back to the work table, the Duke's card still staring up at her. Uncertainly, she reached out and touched his name, feeling the indents where it was printed. On a whim, she flipped the card over and was surprised to see a few lines written. Duty is a harsh master, please forgive me. You were a Midsummer Night's Dream. Annabella did not know what to say to that. She felt as if she didn't know what to do about anything anymore. Penny peered over her shoulder and Annabella held out the card so that she might read it too. Well, that's all well and good, but it doesn't account for his behaviour, Penny tutted. Annabella was inclined to agree. Still, she could feel her face falling again. I really liked him, Penny, she said softly, her voice trembling. Her friend had nothing to say to that, only patting her shoulder comfortingly. Chapter 31 The sun had long passed its zenith, the shadows cast by the buildings rotating across the street. Alan still paced the streets, feeling as if he was in danger of leaping out of his own skin. He had never felt like this before, such a tearing combination of shame, despair and restlessness. The concept of duty had never seemed so heavy. He had no sense of direction, choosing his path at random. Truthfully, he should have gone home hours ago. He had a pile of letters that needed answering, appointments to keep. Strangely, he couldn't bring himself to care about any of it. He had always lauded himself on his sense of duty, on his keen understanding of obligation. Now his mind felt frayed, like he couldn't concentrate on any of it. He turned another corner and paused, taking the chance to observe the people that scurried about. In direct contrast to the fashionable neighbourhood that he resided in for the season, this part of London was full of people from a multitude of backgrounds. There were merchants, businessmen, shopkeepers, women calling out as they sold apples, bunches of flowers, even glasses of gin. Girls who looked no older than seven sold carefully tied posies of violets. A rat catcher strolled about, his quarry hanging from a pole that he brandished proudly. Alan had no real reason to still linger here, other than the fact that he simply wished to be near Annabella. Consequently, he had been allowed an unexpected glimpse into her life. He had understood on some level that she had worked from girlhood, but it had been an abstract notion. Now he was staring down into the large blue eyes and dirty face of a girl who was trying to pass a handful of violets to him. Wordlessly, he accepted them, pressing a coin in her small, waiting hand. He had no real use for them, but was moved by pity. The girl was off in an instant, running on bare feet that slapped across the cobbles. The Duke watched her go, wondering if Annabella had ever been that desperate. From where he stood he could just see her storefront, the golden butterfly gleaming on the sign. The ladies he had known before Annabella had seemed delicate, fragile even, and so he had supposed that she must be as well. That is all wrong, he realised. She must be made of strong stuff to survive in a place like this, to make her own way in the world without the protection of family. This realisation filled him with a strange sort of pride, and he could feel a smile tugging at one side of his mouth. Of course, with this realisation came another right on its heels. If she was strong enough to withstand all of this, was she not strong enough to bear the truth? Oh God, why didn't I trust her? She would have likely sheed away from him, yes, but at least she would not despise him for his dishonesty. He closed his eyes briefly, absorbing the enormity of his folly. Shaking himself all over like a wet dog, he turned reluctantly back toward the neighbourhood he belonged in. He glanced down at the violets in his hand and sighed. Well, some good might come of these, at least, he thought dully. He was resigned to his fate, no matter how much it made his stomach feel like a stone better to simply get on with it. Patience could not recall ever feeling so light, so sure, so, well, utterly unlike herself. She had been allowed to sleep until luncheon, and when she opened her eyes on the world, she could tell at once that something had shifted. 
she had experienced very little of the world. And the ball last night had provided her with a vibrant glimpse of what she had been missing. Theatre, salons, tea parties, picnics. She wanted to know them all. There were art exhibitions and trips to the seashore. It was all more than she had ever considered. Her world thus far had been confined to the books that she could find in her father's dusty library. It seemed a great and terrible pity to give up her new life when she was just discovering it. Patience was not a willful girl, and she was not in a full-on rebellion exactly. It was more that she wished to catch up on all she had been missing. She still had every intention of settling down and marrying, some day. And not just marrying whom I have been told to, she thought firmly. She rose from her bed and slipped into her dressing gown, tying the sash with determined motions. Sitting before the mirror at her dressing table, Patience considered her reflection for the first time. She had delicate features, with her father's light green eyes. Her cheeks were round and soft, her mouth a pale rosebud. She looked every bit the delicate, unassuming girl she was meant to be. For so long she had been living under her mother's iron fist that she had forgotten that she was also her father's daughter. Her father had not been simply a duke but a great military hero and leader as well. Patience lifted her chin, tilting it this way and that. She might look like an ivory cameo, but that was all the better. They would not expect her determination. She smiled at herself. Now to just find a way to inform Mother that I shan't be compelled to marry anyone against my will. That thought quelled her enthusiasm a little, but Patience's resolve did not waver. Rising, she went to her writing desk and pulled out a sheet of paper. Tapping the feathered end of her quill against her lips for a moment as she thought, Patience at last began writing. It may have been a small thing, but she was determined to seize her destiny, even if it was only with a pen and ink for now. Quickly she wrote a succinct letter to Miss Kelly. She could not entirely explain why, but she had a fondness and regard for the modiste that crossed the boundaries of social status. It was not simply that Miss Kelly was the only other person under 40 that she had socialised with. Patience liked her kind and forthright manner. Just as she was blotting the letter in preparation for folding it, the door to Patience's rooms opened. Good morning, my lady, the maid greeted her. Patience nodded, but did not look up from her task. The enticing smell of hot chocolate made her mouth water a little, so she hurried a little as she pressed a wax seal to the folded letter. Jenny, Patience said, turning in her chair to face the maid who was busy straightening the bed. I have a task of the utmost importance. Warily the maid left off what she was doing. How can I help, my lady? she asked. Patience stood slowly, holding the letter near to her heart. This is the sort of thing I would expect of a lady's maid, she said with careful emphasis. The maid perked up at that. She was not a full lady's maid, not yet, and would not be until Patience were properly married. That is, if Patience decided to take Jenny to her new household when she left. Becoming a true lady's maid would mean an increase in pay and status alike. Patience knew this was what Jenny desired above all else, and willingly played upon this desire. I am certain I can be entrusted with it, Jenny said, tossing her head. Patience smiled. I have a most important letter that I need delivering. Oh, that's no trouble, my lady, Jenny said, stepping forward and reaching out for said letter. The post has not been collected yet. I shall put it into the box in the hall for... No. Patience said, a bit more sharply than she intended. No, it must be delivered by hand, and as quickly as you can. Do not pass it to anyone else. The maid hesitated, then nodded. As you say, my lady. She looked down at the direction, then back up at Patience. Is there some trouble with your trousseau, my lady? No, none at all, Lady Patience said coolly. It's simply that I shan't need one she thought to herself, with only a hint of a smile to give her away. Chapter 32 The Duchess's head simply would not stop pounding. 
All day she had been fielding callers and well-wishers who wanted to congratulate her on Patience's successful debut. This would have been all fine and well, but Patience had refused to come out of her room all day. The Duchess had been inclined to allow her to rest, not wishing to overtire the girl. However, this was verging on impertinence. When she had dispatched a maid to summon Patience, she had returned and informed the Duchess that the young lady was unwell and taken to bed. The Duchess had rolled her eyes up to the ceiling as if she could see Patience through the plaster and would. With a heavy sigh, she had dismissed the maid. Lavinia did not know what was happening to her good, biddable daughter. She scarcely recognised her the past couple of weeks, and not simply because she was dressed as if she had stepped out of a fashion plate. Patience had found a confidence that the Duchess did not know she possessed. Unfortunately, this newfound confidence meant that Patience was beginning to get her own ideas about her situation. It's all down to that social climbing modista, the Duchess sniffed. That prompted a frown. She had not been able to shake the feeling that all was not as it should be between the modiste and the duke. It would have been easy enough to dismiss the tension between them as simple awkwardness, a duke dancing with a dressmaker. But the duchess felt something else was afoot in her waters. It was a silly notion, of course, but one that would not be dismissed. Lavinia had learned long ago to trust these moments of intuition, for they were rarely wrong. There was something that had niggled at her, about the dressmaker from the start. And now the Duchess felt that she was firmly on the trail of whatever it was. She would get her opportunity to suss out whatever it was soon enough. Miss Kelly was due to deliver the last gown for Patience, one for a mask at which the Duchess intended to announce her engagement. I will get her wed if I have to drag him up the aisle myself, she thought with a grim smile. As was her custom, the Duchess awaited her guest as the afternoon turned to evening in the salon. The portrait of the Duke stared down at her, and she nodded determinedly at him. Don't you worry, beloved, she murmured. I'll do right by her. As the clock struck five, the modiste was shown into the salon by a servile footman. The Duchess raked her eyes over Miss Kelly, noting the dark circles and the red-rimmed eyes. She was dressed simply, and her hair was twisted up into a practical knot with no ornaments or curls. Well, 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 the Duchess thought, smiling like a cat that has cornered a mouse. What have we here? Worse the wear for a late night, or has something upset you? Miss Kelly? The Duchess greeted her neutrally. To her credit, the modiste managed a polite curtsy, as she always did, showing nothing of the strain in her face. Good evening, Your Grace, Miss Kelly said in a low voice that cracked slightly. I have brought Lady Patience's ball gown for a last fitting. She indicated the long box that she carried beneath her arm. The Duchess nodded, then narrowed her eyes. Oh dear, she said with no real feeling. I hope that you aren't unwell. We can't have patience taking ill. Miss Kelly managed a wan smile. No, Your Grace, just a little worn out from the evening's festivities. Hmm, the Duchess said, running her eyes over Miss Kelly again, who coloured slightly under the scrutiny. I hope the evening wasn't too lively for you and lived up to your expectations. The modiste went very, very still. Good, the Duchess thought. The girl is not a fool. We understand one another. It was a remarkable evening, Duchess. I cannot thank you enough for the kindness you showed in inviting me. The modiste paused here, shifting the box to rest more fully on her hip, her very green eyes fixed onto the Duchess's. I also must thank you for your continued patronage. Why, without your generous payments, I'm not sure I should have managed through the spring. The Duchess was taken slightly aback. She had been delaying payments to any number of merchants the entire spring, trading on the credit her good name could by her. As a result, she had been somewhat reluctant in paying the bills to the modiste. The Duchess was not the sort of woman to look away from a challenging stare, but the nature of her expression changed. She tilted her chin down slightly, acknowledging the jab. Fair play, needlewoman, she thought with grudging admiration. You are made of something stronger than I had given credit for. 
Of course, this did not bode well for the dressmaker's biddableness, should the need arise. As the two were engaged in a silent struggle of wills, a maid entered the salon and hurried over to the Duchess and whispered in her ear. The Duchess listened, nodded, and turned back to Miss Kelly. It seems that Lady Patience is not up to receiving you at this moment, the Duchess said with some relish. I'm afraid you shall have to call again. The modiste simply stared for a moment. The Duchess felt a slight twinge of guilt and was prepared to offer the girl tea when the salon door opened again. This time, it was a footman who hustled in, tight-lipped and looking concerned. He bent low and presented a small silver tray to the Duchess, which was bearing a single calling card. The Duchess lifted it, and the moment she saw it, her gaze was snapping back to the footman. Well, don't just leave him in the foyer. Invite him in at once, the Duchess ordered. She could not help but pinch the bridge of her nose, sighing a little. London servants, she grumbled to no one in particular. Imagine it, leaving a duke standing nearly on the doorstep. It cannot be countenanced. A duke? Miss Kelly repeated, her voice cracking on the word. I should really be going. I wouldn't wish to take up. Nonsense, the Duchess said, staring pointedly at her. You seem positively exhausted. Let me call for the carriage to send you home in. It's the least I can do, what with this being a wasted trip. More to the point, it gave the Duchess an excuse to keep Miss Kelly there for a moment longer. She wished to ascertain if her suspicions were correct. Thus she dispatched a footman accordingly to order the carriage. In the meantime, the previous footman had returned, trailing the Duke of Brandon behind him. The Duchess did not watch his approach, however, focusing instead on the muscle that worked in the modist's jaw. Your Grace, how nice to see you again. We were not expecting you, but I imagine Lady Patience shall be thrilled to see you naturally, the Duchess said smoothly. She couldn't help but feel a little smug that this would also be a cut to the dressmaker. Refusing to see one caller but accepting another would be put her right in her place, the Duchess was sure of it. It was unclear if the Duke heard her, however, for he had rather taken on the appearance of a pillar of salt. He jerked to a stop at seeing Miss Kelly, halting some few steps behind her. With some effort he tore his gaze away from her and came forward to make his salutations to the waiting Duchess. Forgive the intrusion, Your Grace, the Duke said, bowing slightly. Not at all. The Duchess signalled to the maid that had retreated to the corner and sent her off to fetch patience. While they waited, the Duchess's gaze shifted from the Duke to Miss Kelly and back again. I believe you two are already acquainted, she said pointedly. The Duke turned slightly to Miss Kelly and touched the brim of his hat. The modiste, jaw still rigid and expression betraying nothing, only shifted her gaze a little to the side and bobbed what might be called a curtsy. Oh, very good, the Duchess thought shrewdly. That's right, you two shared that lovely dance, she added, twisting the knife. There were only two reasons for two people to ignore each other so completely. Either awkward family business, which the Duchess was quite sure was out of the question, or scorned lovers. Given the way that the Duke's hand nearest the dressmaker flexed as if he should like very much to touch her, the Duchess was confident she had her answer. The dressmaker was not unfazed either. She shifted her box to the other side, placing it between herself and the Duke as if it were a kind of shield. Lavinia could almost hear the Duke willing Miss Kelly to acknowledge him. The dressmaker continued to ignore him steadfastly, which the Duchess nearly admired. Clever dressmaker, the Duchess mused, refusing the kingdom's most eligible Duke, a brilliant ploy. He's had ladies throwing themselves at him from the time he was just out of the schoolroom. One that refuses him must be quite an exotic treat. After what felt like an eternity, the maid returned. The Duchess shifted her attention to the maid, who paled under the scrutiny. The reason for said scrutiny was the fact that she had returned without patience. Begging your pardon, Your Grace, the maid said, swallowing nervously. Lady Patience sends her regrets, but she will not be able to attend to her guests as she is still feeling poorly. In the silence that followed, the Duchess was certain that she could have heard one of the dressmaker's needles fall to the floor. As it was, 
Miss Kelly abruptly ducked her head and coughed awkwardly. The Duchess turned cold eyes to her. I really have taken up enough of your valuable time, Your Grace, the modiste said. Please let me know when Lady Patience is well enough for me to attend her, she said with a curtsy. Before the Duchess could object, Miss Kelly had whirled on her dainty leather boot and was halfway out the door of the salon. The Duke did not watch her go, but the complete and unyielding stillness with which he listened to her footsteps told the Duchess that he longed to. The Duke hemmed and hawed for a moment before also announcing his intention of leaving. He stepped forward and awkwardly presented a mangled posy of violets, half crushed in his fist. I, uh, these are for Lady Patience, he explained unnecessarily. I'm sure she'll be... The Duchess paused, searching for a suitable word. Thrilled to receive such a gift from you, she concluded at length. The Duke did something between a nod, a shrug and a bow, and then he was fleeing from the salon as well. The tail of his handsome jacket flared out behind him in his haste. The footmen who remained behind all judiciously chose to quietly exit the salon as well, closing the doors as quietly as possible. This was a wise move on their part, as the Duchess was quietly seething with anger. She had gained a reputation as a formidable old dragon for good reason. Now that she knew who her enemy was, there was nothing to stop her from burning them to ash. Woe to anyone who gets in my way, she thought with a cold fury. All the while, the Duke continued to stare down benevolently from his portrait on the wall, as unfazed by the Duchess's temper as he had been in life. Chapter 33 It was proving unexpectedly difficult to hurry down a crowded London sidewalk with a large dress box beneath her arm, but Annabella was undeterred. She was determined to get as far away from the Duchess's house, from everyone in it, as quickly as she could. She was past sadness, her heartache evolving into indignation. This fueled her footsteps, giving her a quick clipped stride. So determined was she that at first she did not hear someone calling her name. Eventually, the voice caught her attention and she turned to see the Duke of Brandon half leaned out of the window of his carriage, calling after her. The sight was so undignified, so unlike a duke that under normal circumstances Annabella likely would have laughed. As it was, after staring for a beat, she merely turned around and continued walking. Miss Kelly, if you please, the Duke called after her again. She was aware that they were attracting no small amount of voyeurs, curious to see how this street drama would play out. I must speak with you. Annabella rolled her eyes, hefting the box from one side to the other. That may be, but I have no interest in speaking with you, she replied loudly over the noise of the street without turning. The Duke spoke to his driver, and the carriage drew alongside her. Surely I am entitled to a moment of your time to explain... Do not concern yourself with me, Your Grace, Annabella said pointedly. I am sure that I am beneath the notice of one such as yourself. A handcart paused at the side of the road, forced the driver to stop the Duke's carriage. Annabella couldn't help smiling a little bitterly in triumph and continued walking. The Duke was undeterred, however, and simply clambered out of his carriage and jogged a few steps after her. She could hear his footsteps as he approached, and she closed her eyes for a moment, steeling herself. Miss Kelly, he said again, and this time a note of desperation was in his voice. I am not accustomed to begging, but I beg you now, please let me speak to you for just a few moments. Using his longer legs to his advantage, he hurried a step or two ahead of her and turned to face her, forcing her to stop. Please, he said again his blue eyes wide and sincere. Let us talk like civilised people in my carriage. Annabella balked at the suggestion. Have you gone completely mad? The Duchess of Sussex is already watching me like a hawk. What do you imagine she would do if word got back to her that I was riding alone in a carriage with you, she demanded. The Duke paused, clearly not having considered that. That would be unfortunate, he admitted. He looked up and down the street, the tradesmen and pedestrians eyeing the pair curiously as they passed by. 
Do you think it is better that we speak here, on the street? How quickly do you imagine that the Duchess should have a report on our conversation then? He asked rhetorically. Annabella too felt compelled to glance about. She blew out a sigh, refusing to make eye contact with the Duke. It was a foolish idea, but she could not entirely dismiss it. Some part of her still longed to speak to him, to see if this grand man with a title still resembled the Mr Hardy she had become so unexpectedly fond of. She shifted the box she carried again, her fingers beginning to ache. At the least allow me to carry that parcel for you, the Duke said, nearly pleading. Very well, Annabella relented at last, turning around and walking back toward his carriage. They did not speak again until they were settled into the carriage. With the greatest of care, the Duke passed the parcel to her, which she then held on her lap as if it were a shield. Absently, she watched the scenery pass by as the carriage rolled slowly toward her shop. Miss Kelly, I don't presume to ask, but... Why did you do it? Annabella interrupted, not turning to look. You knew that you were intended for another. It's not as if I intended for this to happen, he protested. I never knew that I would meet someone like you. I had no expectation of it, really. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Someone like me, Annabella repeated, her breath fogging a little on the glass window. Interesting, driven, full of life, clever. Cleverer than myself, certainly, the Duke said, leaning forward across the space between them. Her eyes fluttered closed and she took a deep, steadying breath. You lied to me, she replied softly, simply. The Duke drew back at the quiet rebuke. Not out of any malice, he replied, matching her tone. My whole life I have been defined by my title and expectations. I... I suppose I simply wished to know what it was like to be just a man, taken with an exceptional woman. We are both bound by our duty and by the expectations of our parents. Annabella sighed, suddenly feeling very worn and very small. Her eyes flicked to the Duke and she saw that his face was as troubled as she felt. We were fools to think we might escape it. We might escape it still, the Duke blurted, speaking rapidly. No, we cannot, Annabella said firmly. She swallowed hard, willing her voice not to waver. Lady Patience does not deserve our treachery. She is a dear girl, and I will not see her future jeopardised, least of all for my own selfish reasons. Besides, she is my friend, and I have precious few of those. She whipped her head back toward the Duke suddenly, clearly catching him off guard. You understand, don't you? Annabella pressed, staring at him with eyes that threatened tears at any moment. The Duke said nothing, it was his turn to look out the window. Even now Annabella could not help but admire his handsome profile, the high collar of his shirt emphasising his straight jaw. The silence between them stretched, filled by the muffled sounds of the London streets as the carriage wended its way onward. With no warning the carriage suddenly dipped and shuddered, the wheels crossing ruts worn by other carriages. Her arms occupied, Annabella found herself lurching forward off balance. With surprising quickness, the Duke caught her by the shoulders, steadying her. Their faces were close together, his hands warm on her shoulders, their eyes locked onto each other, Annabella staring into the dark pools of the Duke's eyes. If she wasn't careful, she felt that she might fall forward and drown in them. Something passed between them. Not the shocking electricity of the first moment they bumped into each other, but something more sorrowful and longing. Annabella shook her head at last, then made a great show of writing the parcel on her lap. Gently the Duke helped to set her more securely on the bench and released her shoulders. The entire business was concluded in a matter of minutes, though it felt much longer. The remaining few moments of the trip were spent in complete silence. When at last the carriage stopped just outside the shop, Annabella felt as if she could not escape fast enough. The carriage was too small, too close, too... 
It was simply too much. A footman helped her down, and as she turned back to fetch the dress box, she found herself face to face with the Duke again. He had clearly scooted across the carriage seat and was staring down at Annabella. His eyes were searching her face, silently asking if she was sure. Annabella said nothing, merely retrieved the box, and though it tore at her heart to do so, turned away from the Duke. He did not call after her. There were no running footsteps. Determined, she squared her jaw and her shoulders. On the one hand, she was grimly pleased that the Duke respected her decision so completely. On the other hand, she could not help but feel yet another stab of heartbreak that he did not pursue her. It's for the best, she told herself as she retrieved the large brass key that unlocked the sturdy wooden door of her shop. It's for the best, she repeated as she stood behind the counter, staring blankly at the displays of gloves and stockings, the well-dressed mannequins and A window. It became a never-ending refrain, a mantra she attempted to soothe herself with. She was at the point of locking her store for the night when a young lady came hurrying up and knocked twice. Annabella was at the point of simply ignoring her and drawing the shade across the window on the door when she called her by name. Miss Kelly, please I have an urgent letter for you, the young lady said, her voice muffled by the door. Annabella frowned and cracked the door back open. Outside, a familiar face was peering back at her from beneath a white cap. Lady Patience is maid, she asked, not understanding. The maid nodded, then reached into her pocket and withdrew a letter. If you please, my mistress was quite concerned that you received this with all haste. Annabella blinked a few times, then nodded. The maid, however, didn't move off. I am to wait for your reply, she explained, a little apologetically. Quickly, Annabella tore past the wax seal and read the few lines. Dear Miss Kelly, I am sorry that I was not able to receive you this afternoon. If you would be so kind as to pay a call tomorrow just after luncheon, I have something of the utmost importance to discuss with you. Mother shall be out of the house the whole of the day, so we shall have privacy. Your devoted friend, Lady Patience. The first reaction was panic. Oh God, somehow she knows, Annabella fretted. She shook her head a little, though, dismissing that thought. Her second reaction was a feeling of dread that sank her stomach like a stone. She half considered simply refusing the invitation and avoiding the confrontation altogether. But that was not in her nature. She could not abide dishonesty, hence her break with the Duke. The maid watched her still through the small crack in the door, a curious expression on her face. No doubt she is attempting to understand why I look so conflicted, Annabella thought. Tell Lady Patience that I shall be there at one o'clock, Annabella said finally. The maid nodded, then turned and hurried off. It wasn't until later that Annabella reflected on the strangeness of the message and the manner in which it was delivered. It would have been simple enough for Lady Patience to slip it into the post, yet she had insisted on it being hand-delivered by her maid. If she had been unwell, why should she send out an invitation now? What of that line about the Duchess being absent? What could that possibly mean? Annabella wondered as she stared up at the ceiling of her bedroom. She fully anticipated a sleepless night. Perhaps she would be able to suss it out as she lay awake. Chapter 34 Annabella truly had no notion of what to expect as she was admitted into Lady Patience's private rooms. She was prepared for tears, anger, accusations, any number of unpleasant scenes. What she was not prepared for, however, was to find Lady Patience sitting eagerly on a chaise lounge, casual and familiar in a morning dress and wrapper. She veritably bounced up in her eagerness to great Annabella, who was taken aback. She returned Patience's friendly air kisses automatically, but couldn't help but feel as if she were waiting for the proverbial sword to fall. Oh, Annabella, your face, Patience said, grinning as she stepped back. You are in shock no doubt because you expected to find me riddled with consumption and in bed. Something like that, Annabella muttered, allowing herself to be pulled to a chair. I was so sorry to refuse your invitation yesterday, but I couldn't accept it, Patience explained, sitting in a chair and taking Annabella's hands. Can you forgive me? 
I was resolved not to see the Duke of Brandon, and I'm afraid you were an unintended casualty. Me, forgive you, Annabella said, feeling slow and dull-witted from the lack of sleep and unexpected direction of the conversation. Patience's face became a study in worry as Annabella stared at her. Deftly, she released Annabella's hands and slipped away. Oh, my darling girl, Annabella murmured, shaking her head slowly. This time it was Annabella's turn to take Patience's hands. Her voice became strangled as she attempted to speak, her eyes burning with tears that she was afraid would begin to fall at any moment. Dear Patience, she said, it's me that must beg your forgiveness. Patience drew back, her delicate face wrinkling in confusion. Whatever for? Annabella couldn't speak for a moment, just sat miserably crying silent tears, her eyes focused down on their joined hands. I am not a good friend. I am the very worst of them. And you are such a sweet, darling thing. You deserve better, she warbled. Annabella, how could you possibly say such a thing? Whatever is the meaning of all this? Patience asked, clearly worried. She slid from her place on the settee, resting on the floor before Annabella. She laid her head against Annabella's knees and looked up at her with round, concerned eyes. The sweet simplicity of the gesture touched Annabella and made her cry all the harder. After a few moments of this, she found her voice but struggled to find the words to explain. My mystery suitor, he's, well, he's no mystery. I found out his true identity and, oh, patience, I never knew, I swear it. Annabella, what are you talking about? Patience demanded, her brows knit together in concern. Annabella took a deep breath and looked directly at Patience. I only ever knew him as Mr Hardy. I knew that wasn't the whole truth, but I never imagined in a thousand years. She trailed off, her eyes lowering again. Mr Hardy, Patience repeated slowly. You cannot possibly mean Alan Hardy, the Duke of Brandon. The very picture of misery, Annabella nodded slowly. It seemed the entire world was hanging in the silence that fell between them. She did not even dare to look at Patience, certain she would see hurt, betrayal, anger, all the things she had every right to feel toward Annabella. Your mystery suitor was the Duke all along, Patience said, enunciating each word clearly. Annabella nodded again, flinching just a little. The awkward quiet between them was broken by a most undignified, unladylike bark of laughter. Annabella's head jerked up and she was flummoxed to find that Lady Patience was quite overcome with riotous laughter. In fact, she rocked backward and sat upon her haunches, still laughing. Annabella was unsure how to respond and watched Patience warily. This only seemed to make Patience laugh harder. She tried once or twice to quiet herself, only to dissolve into raucous laughter again. Oh, Annabella, she cried between giggles. You're a sweet thing to be so worried for me. Patience made another concerted effort at composing herself again, rising to sit next to Annabella. You are not angry with me, Annabella asked hopefully. Angry? Why I can't thank you enough? Here, Patience leaned forward, a mischievous look on her face. I did not wish to see the Duke yesterday because I intend to refuse him. Annabella could only stare in what could best be described as shock. It felt as if the floor were falling away and she had become dislodged from reality. You are going to refuse the Duke, the Duke that has been expressly chosen to be your husband for the good of both of your families, Annabella clarified, feeling certain that she could not possibly be hearing correctly. I am, Patience said, drawing herself up straight. I came to the conclusion that we have very little in common, and a marriage between us would be, well, it would just be a disaster, wouldn't it? Annabella opened her mouth to agree, but found that no sound would come out. She was positive she resembled some species of trout, but she truly could not find her voice. Besides, Patience continued, I do not want a husband who would constantly be wishing that I would be different, more, in some way. I wish for a husband that loves me exactly as I am, silly, 
naive me. Annabella, tears filling her eyes again, seized Patience's hands. Oh, you deserve the very best of men. You deserve all of the love in the world. Patience smiled at Annabella with such an expression of indulgent affection that she thought her heart might burst. There was something familiar in that expression, something that tingled at the back of Annabella's mind. Annabella dismissed the feeling, still feeling as if she must be in a dream. But Patience, are you sure? You are giving up so much, Annabella pointed out. No, I'm truly not, she replied firmly. You have shown me that there is more to the world than fine carriages and silk slippers. I may not have your skills, but I am a girl of some ability and intelligence. I do not want this sort of marriage. But you? Patience cried, suddenly turning all of her attention back to Annabella. There is clearly light between you and the Duke. Go and get him. Annabella laughed a watery laugh. I'm not sure it is so simple. And why not? Patience demanded. He clearly is enamoured with you. Is he? Annabella asked simply. Annabella, Patience said, her tone suddenly serious. He has never shown me the attention he paid to you, the way that he stared at you when you were dancing. All I could think was, oh, how lovely they are together. There wasn't a speck of jealousy in my heart. Let her have him, I said to myself, and all the better for it. This time, Annabella really did laugh, swiping at the last of the tears in her eyes. Oh, Patience, you really have become such a ray of sunshine over the season. And that's another thing. I have only just begun to experience life outside of my cursed princess's tower. I want to know more of the world before I settle down, Patience said, her aristocratic nose wrinkling. Now... The only thing that remains is for you to decide to run after the Duke. It's not so simple, Annabella replied quietly. I have the duty to my mother's memory, all of her work. Do you really think she wished for you to be alone your whole life? I did not know her, but I can't imagine any mother wishes for her daughter to pass up the chance for love and happiness. Patience's cheerful face formed a frown. Well, maybe my own but she has her own reasons. Annabella could not think of a single thing to say to that. There was a ring of truth to Patience's words. Her mother could never have foreseen that someone would wish to court Annabella, certainly not a duke. You're probably right, she said slowly. Her face, so miserable just a few moments ago, began to shine like the sun with delight. I... I do love him, you know. Patience actually squealed a little, leaning in. And, what shall you do about it? I've spent the whole of our acquaintance running away from him, Annabella said, bemused. I suppose now it is my turn to run after him. Patience was gathering herself for a response when the door slammed open with enough force to vibrate on its hinges. The Duchess of Sussex was not a woman to be crossed on the best of days, and this was most definitely not the best of days. She could not shake this feeling of unease that had been plaguing her since before the ball. Something about the modiste still unsettled her. Her conduct toward the Duke of Brandon had only confirmed her suspicions. It was more than that, however. She had been plagued by nightmares again. She had long been haunted by the same nightmare, sometimes coming nightly. It had subsided in recent years, and she had hoped that perhaps it was settled once and for all. But she had woken last night, her legs tangled in the bed linens and a cold sweat on her brow. She would sit up with a lit candle on the nightstand then, her arms wrapped about herself. It was easy to be the formidable, indomitable duchess during daylight hours. It was a whole other thing when she was so completely alone at night. She was uncertain as to why the nightmares were resurfacing now. She could blame any number of things, returning to London, her re-entry into society, the stress of managing Patience's season. But the truth was likely far more simple. The reality was that she did not want to lose Patience, even it was to a brilliant marriage. The only thing that made it bearable was the knowledge that her darling girl would be safe and secure for the rest of her life. 
well, that and the knowledge that she would be living only a scant dozen miles away. Losing the Duke in the cold, black Irish Sea had been terrible enough, but she had lost more than a husband that night. She had also lost a daughter, her firstborn. The loss of that tiny life had made the Duchess cold and hard, and she had been determined not to lose her remaining daughter in any way until she had to. The Duchess was well aware of what people said about her, how she had kept patients locked up like a nun. There was truth in their words which stung, and the Duchess had wondered more than once if she had done the right thing. Those doubts were usually settled with a firm shake of her head. Lately, however, she was constantly under assault from doubt and second guesses. It was difficult to admit it, but the truth was that patience had blossomed over the past several weeks. The Duchess was not exactly thrilled or even approving of the friendship between her daughter and a seamstress and the fact that it was someone so humble that had brought her daughter to life. It had been an exhausting day, following on from a sleepless night. She was paying a myriad of calls, trying to build on connections that had formed after the ball. Patients should have been attending with her, but the girl was in some new rebellion, taking to her bed and refusing to leave her rooms. It did not help that bills were mounting, and the Duchess had no idea how to pay them. The Duchess had finished climbing the grand stairs in her rented townhouse, and was looking forward to removing her hat and sitting quietly in her room for a few moments. When she reached the junction of the hall, however, with one side leading to her rooms and the other to Patience's quarters, she heard voices. She had been in the midst of removing her lavender kid leather gloves when she paused, her left hand partially slipped from the glove. Her ears strained, picking up the sounds of conversation and girlish laughter. The Duchess could feel her temper rising, and she stalked on silent cat-like feet toward Patience's sitting room. If that uppity modiste has wormed her way into Patience's rooms again, she thought, her hackles rising. Of course, part of her irritation with the modiste was that she was reminded of her mounting debts whenever she saw her. The Duchess paused just outside the door, her ears sharp. She could not possibly be hearing what she thought she was. From within, the unmistakable voice of the modiste. I... I do love him, you know. The Duchess's temper broke then. She spent a few moments in stunned silence, incandescent with anger. Without a second thought, she forced the door open and simply stood glaring for a few moments at the modiste. Both girls stared back up at her, twin expressions of shock and panic on their faces. She hated how similar they looked, hated that her daughter had lied to her in order to spend time with a seamstress, hated that her daughter was losing a duke to a lowly needlewoman. Like a fury from myth, the Duchess flew forward and snatched up Miss Kelly by the arm. You! she nearly snarled, yanking the girl to her feet. So angry was she that she could only manage that one word. Mother, what are you? Patience cried out in protest and distress. The Duchess paid her no mind, however. She was so focused on removing the perceived source of all of her troubles that she could not even really recall how it was achieved. She had a vague recollection of summoning the butler at a volume normally reserved for howling wolves. There were some kind of spluttered protests on the part of the modiste as the Duchess shoved her into a carriage. Chapter 35 Two days had passed since the unfortunate scene at the Duchess's townhouse. For Annabella they passed in a grey haze. She was keenly aware that she had disgraced herself in some fashion. The fact that a steady stream of clients still poured through her door was a bit of a surprise. She had fully expected the Duchess to expose her to the ton, but she clearly had not. Perhaps the Duchess is more forgiving than I had previously considered, Annabella thought, absently watching a trio of fresh-faced debutantes cooing over the selection of embroidered gloves. Or more likely, she does not want the humiliation of the ton, knowing that a modista threatened her daughter's perfect engagement. She wished that she could get some kind of word to patience, so make sure that she was well. It wasn't hard to imagine that she had faced some measure of the Duchess's wrath as well. There was nothing Annabella could do about it, though. She had been banned in every possible way from the Duchess of Sussex's house. 
The Duchess was clearly feeling some kind of spiteful, however, as a terse letter had arrived that very morning, informing Annabella that her services were no longer required. Payment had been enclosed for the work she had thus far completed. It was clear that the Duchess had intended this as some sort of snub, but the truth was that Annabella could breathe a little easier and pay her own creditors. No, the real sting was the knowledge that she could not see Lady Patience again. She had been fooling herself to imagine that she could ever be considered an acceptable companion to a lady. Granted, she had been fooling herself about a number of things lately, like the Duke. She couldn't even bear to think of him without a kind of burning pain. There was no way to contact him, as she did not even have his address. According to Penny, that font of gossip, the rumour was that he had quit London entirely and returned to his country estate. Penny had offered to find out where exactly that was, but Annabella had refused. If the Duke had finally accepted her refusal, there seemed little point in raking it all over again. Penny had been spending a good amount of time at the shop with Annabella. It was easy to imagine her as a worrying red hen, clucking at Annabella to remember to eat, to sleep. It was not without merit that Penny did this, for Annabella had thrown herself into her work again. Even if her heart was broken, her work was still there. It was soothing, intoxicating even, to lose herself in the meditation of stitching. And there was no shortage of work to be done. Lady Patience had made such an impact in the season, culminating in the triumph at her debut ball. Orders were pouring in, and Annabella and Mary were nearly run off their feet. It was such that Annabella had taken on another girl in haste, the daughter of a shirtmaker who was a crack at mathematics and kept tidy accounts. On the third day, the shop door clanged open, causing any number of heads to swivel in alarm. Standing framed in the doorway, resplendent in a sage-green daydress and feathered bonnet, was Lady Patience, made in tow. She held her head regally high, surveying the shop and those in it with some measure of disdain. The ton perceived this as snobbery and wholly approved. Miss Kelly, she announced to the shop at large, I require a private fitting at once. If one did not know Patience as well as Annabella had come to, it would have been impossible to detect the small signs that this was play-acting. Her voice wavered only slightly, and her posture slipped only twice, which she quickly recovered. It was clear that Patience was up to something. Regardless, Annabella was delighted to see her. Lady Patience, always a delight to see you, Annabella said, coming forward. Some of us have been waiting long before you, a pug-nosed girl with freckles and brown ringlets snipped. Lady Patience drew herself up, and in a clear imitation of the Duchess said, Do you know who I am? Are you aware of who my mother is? The girl, suitably cowed, made a great show of sniffing and exiting the store in a cloud of indignation. Patience glared at the other patrons until they, too, cleared out. When at last the store was empty, Annabella darted forward and locked the shop door and pulled the shade down. The moment this was done, Patience deflated, releasing a breath she had clearly been holding. Are you all right? What on earth are you doing here? Annabella asked, searching Patience's face. I could not simply let mother. I have a plan, she replied, recovering some of her temerity. A plan? For what exactly? Annabella asked, feeling slow and dull after the past few days. I just have one question. Do you truly love the Duke? Patience demanded with surprising force. She stepped close, peering into Annabella's face. Annabella did not answer, at least not with words. There was little doubt as to the meaning of the smile that spread across her face. Satisfied, Patience nodded. Good. Now, have you still my gown for the mask here? I do. I was never able to deliver. Patience clapped her hands. Oh, good. Ah, and there is Mrs. Talbot, she announced, spotting Penny who had let herself in by the back door, as was her wont. I was so worried that you hadn't received my letter. It arrived only this past hour, Penny said, winding her way to the shop floor where they were congregated. I didn't feel that I could refuse. Penny, what are you doing here? What exactly is happening? Annabella asked, 
looking about at the assembled faces. Behind Penny, Mary and Sally, the two shop girls, also stepped forward, peering curiously. I have a plan, Patience repeated. Do you trust that we are your friends and that we wish for your happiness? Of course, but I still don't understand, Annabella said, glancing about. Are you able to make another gown like mine, identical in every way? But to your own measurements, Patience continued. That shouldn't be any great difficulty, Annabella said with a self-depreciating shrug. Patience bit her lip. Could you have it done by Friday? Friday, Annabella repeated. That's only three days away. Not even if I were the most skilled dressmaker in the world could I hope to accomplish that. Patience exchanged looks with all the assembled. To a person, they all began grinning, looking to each other with knowing glances. That is why I've called all of you here, Patience announced. We may not have your skill, but we can thread needles, heat irons, sew on buttons. Give us what tasks you can, and we'll see them done. Annabella looked about at the smiling friend around her. Are you all sure? This will be not be easy with late nights. When they all nodded, Annabella felt a lump rise in her throat again. She was not sure what she had done to deserve such friends, but she knew that whatever else came, she would always be rich in them. With a laugh of relief and gratitude, she threw herself at them, embracing them with arms spread as wide as they could go. Alan had assumed that he would find some measure of solace and comfort when he returned to his country estate. It had always proved to be a source of relief and contentment, and he had not expected it to be any different now. It was something of an unwelcome surprise, then, to find that the restless aching that had plagued him in London had followed him home. He had taken to pacing, unable to sit still for any length of time. Consequently, he had seen much more of his estate than he ever had before. This, too, was not much help, for in every corner, every shadowed place, he could not help but imagine Annabella. It was easy to see her as mistress of such a place. He had little doubt that she would do well. But that was a discarded dream. He had neglected his duty for long enough, living in a kind of fantasy land. He refused to be the duke that failed. Consequently, he pushed every thought, every feeling that jeopardised that future deep down. Alan knew that he was becoming closed off, pinched and furtive, but he reasoned that it was better to become unfeeling than to be miserable. He was succeeding in this aim when a letter arrived for him by special messenger. The hand the direction was written in was unfamiliar, but when he turned the letter over, the wax seal was that of the Duchess of Sussex. Alan could not help but frown, deepening the creases that had crowned his forehead for nearly a week. Heaving a great sigh, he tore past the seal and unfolded the letter. It was not the short, commanding letter reminding him of his duties from the Duchess that he had expected. It was long and written in a flowing, looping hand. To the Duke of Brandon, I am not sure as to the propriety of writing a clandestine letter to the man one has been instructed to marry, but I would like to believe that we are past all that. As you may have surmised, I am as reluctant as you are to join hands in matrimony. I have come to know myself over the past months, and I have reached the conclusion that I should make you miserable. I am quite certain that you should do likewise. Please understand, this is not a criticism of either of us. We are simply too different. That being said, I hope that you should forgive further boldness. I have lately become aware that you have entertained some attachment to Miss Annabella Kelly. Do not be troubled by this revelation. On the contrary, it is something of a relief to me. My only admonishment would be regarding your lack of transparency with her, and a further warning that should you hurt her, I will be merciless. Miss Kelly has rejected you, believing this to be in the best interests of all involved. I disagree with this assessment. If, like me, you believe this to be untrue, I encourage you to accept the invitation to attend my upcoming mask. I would also encourage you to bring your fastest horses. I hope that I'm able to rightfully sign this as your dear friend, Lady Patience. The Duke could scarcely believe his eyes. It was the second rejection in a week's time. If he were a prideful man, he might have felt stung. The fact of the matter was, however, 
that he felt a kind of lightening relief. There was a small easing in the tension he had been carrying in the depths of his stomach. Overcome, he sat heavily in the leather chair behind his desk. He couldn't begin to fathom why Lady Patience insisted that he attend her mask, however. Does she mean to break with me publicly? he mused. That was very likely the only way in which the Duchess would accept such a blatant rebellion, though accept may have been an optimistic term for it. It would, of course, be a grave humiliation to himself, but really, what did he care at this point? He could not marry the woman he wished, and a public rejection like that would keep the ladies of the tone at bay for a while. It may prove to be amusing as well. He had danced to the Duchess' tune all spring and summer. It might do her good to have a bit of comeuppance. Still, he hesitated. It would mean revisiting something that he had worked hard to begin burying. To pry that particular bandage off now risked making the wound bleed again. What did his presence there matter in the end? Lady Patience could reject him publicly, and he did not have to be present for the humiliation. Let the ton think he nursed his wounded pride in private, which, of course, he was, but not in the manner in which they supposed. No, he thought to himself a little sadly. I think I shan't play your games either, Lady Patience. He was at the point of tossing the letter aside when a line leapt out at him again. It was odd, as there was still time for him to get to London. I would also encourage you to bring your fastest horses. What the devil do you suppose that means? He murmured to the empty study. Chapter 36 the servant's entrance door to the Duchess of Sussex townhouse creaked as it opened, which nearly gave Annabella a heart attack. Every sound made her jump, certain that she was about to be discovered. It all came from skulking about like a thief, dark cloak drawn tightly about her, hood hiding her face. To her immense relief, however, it was the smiling face of Jenny, the maid, that greeted her. Patience had been explicit in her instructions, emphasising that Annabella was to arrive precisely at nine o'clock and wait by the servant's entrance. The fact that the plan was proceeding according to plan, however, was doing little to quell Annabella's nerves. It all felt precariously close to falling apart. Even more terrifying was the notion of it actually succeeding. Wordlessly, Jenny pressed a finger to her lips, indicating silence. Annabella nodded and allowed herself to be guided through the maze that was the servant's domain. When they reached a flight of stairs, Jenny gestured to indicate that Annabella should remove her cloak. She obliged, and Jenny couldn't help but sigh as she did so. Annabella flashed her a nervous but appreciative smile. She knew that she was wearing another masterpiece, and Jenny had played her own part in bringing it to life. Whatever else happened, Annabella would forever be grateful to everyone that had put their hands to this task. Go upstairs, Jenny said quietly, but with a great deal of urgency. Go to the left, and then immediately the right. There is a door to your right. Lady Patience will be waiting for you there. Whatever you do, do not go through any doors that have a green back. Annabella nodded, took a deep breath, and placed a gloved hand on the railing. Slowly. Careful not to trip over her long silk gown, she began climbing the stairs. She turned back to look over her shoulder once, finding Jenny shooing her onward encouragingly, her dark blue cloak over one arm. Thus emboldened, Annabella gathered herself and hurried onward. Following Jenny's instructions carefully, she found herself in a dim library. Lady Patience was indeed there, looking resplendent but fidgety. Like Annabella, she wore a pure white silk gown. It had the small, puffed sleeves expected of an evening gown, but Annabella had cleverly used silk chiffon to create long, flowing petals from the back of the arms. The effect was that of a princess from a fairy tale. Accentuating this was a belt embroidered with beads and gold silk thread. The ensemble was topped with a delicate wire crown in the shape of vines with flowers, small golden butterflies perched on the stems and leaves. We must be quick, Patience whispered. If I am missing for long, Mother will grow suspicious. Hold still, she commanded. Annabella did as she was instructed, 
watching as Patience removed her golden bangles and slipped them onto Annabella's arms. Patience, no, she hissed. I couldn't. You must, Patience insisted, if you want the illusion to be complete. You will have to help with my necklace. Biting her lip, Annabella obliged as Patience turned around. Before she knew what was happening, the clasp to the choker of rows of pearls was unsnapped, and then it was being pressed against her own neck. Finally, Patience removed the crown and gingerly placed it atop Annabella's own head. Oh, Annabella, she sighed, stepping back. You are the loveliest creature I have ever seen. How could any man not fall in love with you? Annabella smiled, the duality of the moment not lost on her. Whereas she had comforted Patience as she readied her for her debut ball, now it was Patience that comforted Annabella. It had long been a secret wish in her heart to have a sister, and she felt that she knew some measure of that happiness now. Now, Patience said, grasping Annabella by the shoulders and turning her about. Go through this door to the ballroom. Cross to the back, where the doors overlook the garden as quick as you can, but don't draw anyone's eye. Oh, I almost forgot. Patience turned back around to a bookstand, upon which was resting a white and gold domino mask. Annabella quickly pressed it to her face while Patience tied the ribbons behind her head. With one last nod of approval and a deep breath, Annabella left the library. The sounds from the ballroom floated through the hallway and golden light spilled out from the doorway. Annabella was not entirely sure what to expect within and she steeled herself accordingly. Whatever she had imagined, it was nothing compared to what actually was. The ballroom had been transformed into a kind of paradise. Plants and flowers of every description filled the corners and crawled up the walls. Golden ribbons woven with garlands of flowers hung from the chandeliers in great loops. The guests had eschewed the traditional dress code for balls of black and white and instead appeared in a kaleidoscope of colours. All wore masks, many decorated with feathers, beads and ribbons. Some were dressed as animals, others as figures from history or myth. Annabella, and by extension Patience, was the only one dressed in white. It was a dazzling display, and Annabella felt grateful just to see it. Uncertainly, she stepped into the ballroom, looking around for... Well, she wasn't entirely sure what. Patience had insisted that she be here, at this hour dressed exactly as she was, but Annabella did not know to what end. She attempted to look as if she belonged, holding her head high and walking slowly but purposefully, gently shouldering her way through the crowd. At last she made her way to the aforementioned door and found it to be unlatched. With a last furtive glance around she slipped through it, opening the door only as much as was necessary. Once outside, Annabella took a deep breath of fragrant summer air. Unconsciously, she crossed her arms about herself, rubbing her upper arms with silk-gloved hands. The sounds of the ball rose and fell, rising sharply once with the unmistakable opening of the same door she had passed through. Turning slowly, Annabella's breath caught. Standing behind her, illuminated from behind, was the figure of a tall, lean man. Though his face was hidden by a mask and he stood in silhouette, Annabella knew him instantly. Lady Patience? the Duke of Brandon asked hesitantly. Not quite, Annabella responded, then reached up to slip her mask off. Of all the things that had happened thus far this evening, this moment was the most nerve-wracking. She did not know what his reaction would be. There was every chance that he would turn away from her, and she wouldn't blame him if he did so. Still, her heart told her that she was right to have faith in him. She was proved right, because the moment her face was revealed, the Duke immediately rushed forward, then caught himself. Miss Kelly, he exclaimed, I took you for Lady Patience. How have I never noticed how much you favour her? Wait a moment. What are you doing here? Please forgive the deception, Annabella said quietly, turning the mask about nervously in her hands. It was the only way we could think of to see you. We? 
the Duke asked, drawing closer and removing his own mask. Annabella could not help but smile when she saw his face. It would seem that Lady Patience is quite the conspirator, Annabella said with a wry laugh. The Duke, too, laughed. I had wondered why she was so insistent on my being out here at exactly this moment, particularly after such a clear rejection letter. Your Grace, I would ask your forgiveness for my forthright nature, but I assume that you are used to it by now, Annabella began, pausing to bite her lip once. But the fact of the matter is that I... I don't want to run from you any more. You don't? the Duke asked, coming to stand within a breath of Annabella. That is good news indeed, though I must confess that I have enjoyed the merry chase you have led me on. Annabella laughed breathily. Have you really? Oh, yes, the Duke said with an emphatic nod. And now I must also inform you that I love you deeply, truly, and far more than I had ever expected to love another. Though the Duke had spoken calmly and clearly, his words sent Annabella spiralling. She felt light and warm, an electric current passing through every limb. Your Grace, I... She began, her eyes filling with warm, happy tears. The name is Alan, if you don't mind, the Duke interrupted, smiling down at Annabella. With the greatest of care, as if she were made of porcelain, he gently cradled her face in his warm hands. Alan, she sighed, whatever shall we do now? Well, he said with a cagey grin, it just so happens that Lady Patience insisted that I bring my fastest horses to London. Your fastest horses, Annabella repeated, realisation dawning on her. You mean that we should make for the Scottish border? I imagine that we can be in Gretna Green soon enough, Alan confirmed. A delighted squeal broke the silence between them. Annabella and Alan turned as one, their hands intertwining. There stood Patience, clearly having run out of the virtue that was her namesake. She clapped and squealed again, wearing the most delighted expression that had either Annabella or Alan had ever beheld. An elopement, she gasped. Oh, it's so romantic. And I suspect exactly what you planned for, Annabella said dryly. Naturally, Patience said with a little shrug that was identical to Annabella's. Now, hurry your grace and call for your carriage. I'll make sure she gets to the front of the house safely. Reluctantly, Alan released Annabella's hands as Patience shooed him on. Overcome, Annabella could not help but laugh, grasping Patience's hands and making delighted sounds. She was not sure what she had done to deserve not only the love of a man such as the Duke, but also friends of such good loyalty. We must hurry, Patience said pushing Annabella toward the door with both hands on her back. Jenny will meet us in the entry hall with your cloak. Wait, Annabella protested, balking. I haven't anything else for a journey this long. Not to worry, Patience said, grinning all the while. I had Mrs Talbot prepare a trunk for you just in case. It was delivered just an hour ago. Penny? Somehow this did not surprise Annabella in the least. She shook her head and laughed again. She reached for the door, still smiling at Patience. And the door swung open toward her, revealing the Duchess. She had foregone the customary mask, so the fury and confusion on her face was plain for all to see. Epilogue In an evening full of strange occurrences, being discovered by the Duchess was perhaps the most normal thing of all. It was also the most heart-stopping. Annabella simply froze for a moment. Patience, much to her credit, yelped and tripped backward into the shadows, attempting to remain hidden. Following her lead, Annabella attempted to replace her mask, praying futilely that her face had not been seen. It was all in vain, of course, for the Duchess had proved time and again that she was sharp-eyed and not easily fooled. However, even she took a moment to stare with narrowed eyes at Annabella. The Duchess shook her head as if she could not believe what she was seeing. How did you... Are you wearing my daughter's jewels? The Duchess shrieked in a voice so outraged that it made Annabella wince. Ah, yes, Your Grace, but if I could... Annabella began. That is enough. I shall call for the night watch and have you taken down for a thief. Rouse the constabulary. 
the Duchess roared beyond all pretense of grace or manners. Mother, no, Patience cried, stepping forward. She's no thief. I gave them to her. Patience, I am doing this for your own good, the Duchess said, seizing Annabella roughly by the bicep. The Duchess's strength was surprising, and she yanked Annabella forward. First you steal my daughter's betrothed, you uppity minx, and now this. With her free hand, the Duchess pushed the glass door to the ballroom open. It was a testament to her state of mind that she no longer seemed to care who saw such a tawdry display. A kind of hushed gasp of shock rippled through the guests as the Duchess continued towing Annabella forward, flinging her into the midst of the ton. There was a squeaking squeal as the musicians abruptly halted their playing. Is this the repayment I am to expect for my generous patronage? The Duchess asked the ballroom at large. Look at her, standing here in her pilfered jewels. Annabella thought her heart might simply beat out of her chest as dozens of pairs of eyes fell on her at once. The crowd that had just a second ago been dancing in graceful pairs had parted with the Duchess's sudden and outraged appearance. Though they still wore their masks, there was no concealing the sneers with which they regarded Annabella now. Madame, have you taken complete leave of your senses? Have you no sense of propriety? A voice said into the heaving silence, a lovely tenor that was dangerously low and sharp. Annabella whirled about, her heart leaping to see the Duke. Like the Red Sea, the crowd parted obligingly before him. He stalked forward, his face unmasked and posture tense, though the spectators had no idea of the history that had transpired between this trio, there could be little doubt as to Annabella's attachment to the Duke when they beheld the radiant look she turned on him. Alan! she cried out. The crowd gasped uniformly at such an informal, intimate mode of address in public. I have no sense of propriety, the Duchess raged. She has ruined everything. She is a scheming interloper, and I shall not stand for it in my own home. No, mother. A new voice entered the fray, soft and delicate but strong. Patience strode forward, resplendent in her identical gown to Annabella. With a kind of inner strength that no one could have previously guessed at, she strode forward and took her place by Annabella. Though she stood with head held high, Annabella could feel Patience's hand trembling slightly as she took hers. You don't understand. I am not betrothed and want nothing to do with the Duke. I have refused him. You refuse the Duke? For what? For this... this seamstress? The Duchess asked incredulously. Dressmaker! The Duke and Patience corrected in unison. A ripple of amusement passed through the assembly. The Duchess could clearly sense the tide of public opinion turning against her. It was one thing to carry on with someone of a lower class. It was quite another to create such an ugly scene in public. Annabella couldn't completely squash a feeling of triumph as she watched the Duchess look haplessly about. A look of cold fury passed over the Duchess's hawk-like face. With surprising swiftness, she darted forward and seized Annabella by the arm again. You may do as you wish, but you shan't do it inside my home, the Duchess said through gritted teeth and began hauling Annabella forward again. Mother! Patience cried out, and with a marvellous display of strength and will, she leapt forward and snatched at Annabella as well. Unfortunately, all she managed to grasp was Annabella's gown. Annabella let out a sound of alarm as she was caught between the two opposing forces for a moment. I suppose this is as good a testimony as any, as to the quality of my stitching, a strangely detached part of her mind observed as if all of this were happening to someone else. It's a sad fact that no matter the quality of the sewing, there is only so much that silk will tolerate before it begins to rip. Though whispers and murmurs were still circulating, the sound of silk being rent asunder was loud enough to be heard above all. Annabella blanched, feeling a sudden brush of cold air across her shoulder. The sleeve had been torn clean away with the tear continuing into the shoulder. This allowed the gown to partially fall away from Annabella's shoulder. This was a new level of insult, and the crowd openly gasped. Immediately, Annabella scurried to cover her shoulder. Patience, too, hurried forward, 
babbling apologies and begging Annabella's forgiveness. The Duchess, however, was frozen. Annabella caught a glimpse of her face between Patience and the Duke, who had formed a sort of protective wall about her. Gone was the fury and the outrage, replaced by disbelief and a pitiable sort of pain. Marie? The Duchess breathed so quiet that Annabella could scarcely hear her. It can't be. It couldn't. It can't be. With a newfound gentleness and caution, the Duchess attempted to come between Patience and the Duke to Annabella again. Let her through, Annabella murmured. She couldn't explain why, but the moment the Duchess murmured that name, she had an unexplainable feeling of familiarity. Exchanging glances, Patience and the Duke obliged her. Is it really you? the Duchess said, her face pale. Please, if I may. With a timid gesture, the Duchess indicated Annabella's shoulder. Annabella hesitated a moment, then nodded her assent. The Duchess, with surprising tenderness, moved the frayed satin aside and gasped. A butterfly! I would know this birthmark anywhere, the Duchess cried. My daughter, my lost little one. Though the night was warm, a fire had been built up in the Duchess's favourite salon. The Duchess sat on one end of a settee, Annabella perched cautiously next to her. The townhouse was quiet, the guests having been summarily dismissed by the Duke. The Tan did not seem to mind, however, for they could not recall an evening of such splendid entertainment. With the slightest touch, the Duchess traced the birthmark on Annabella's shoulder again. I would know this mark anywhere, the Duchess sighed, her voice thick. I used to kiss it every day when you were a babe. How? Annabella asked simply, turning back around to stare at the Duchess. The Duchess took a deep breath, her eyes fluttering closed for a moment at the memory. Your father, the Duke of Sussex, was posted in Ireland, the Duchess explained. The King was eager to pacify the Iceland, you see, and he trusted the Duke to see it done. You were just a little mite then, and then I unexpectedly fell pregnant with patience. The Duchess paused and smiled up at her younger daughter. It seemed that this baby was eager to make her debut, however, and all signs pointed to an early delivery. Your father was anxious for the birth to be in England, in case it was a son. I am named Patience because I had none before I was born, the young lady asked, her face incredulous. The Duchess shrugged in a way that was disturbingly familiar. What happened to my father? Annabella asked quietly, barely audible over the crackling of the fire. The crossing from the north of Ireland is treacherous at the wrong time of year. A storm blew up, most unexpectedly as they do across the North Sea, and the ship began to founder against the rocks. The Duchess looked away, her eyes shining. We were separated in the chaos. You were so small, and with the governess. The Duke placed me into a boat and swore that he would find you. That was the last time I saw him. The Duchess took a deep, shuddering breath, and in that silence all who were listening could hear the cries and fearful shouts that haunted her. My mother, my other mother, she found me washed up on the beach, wrapped in a blanket and surrounded by driftwood, Annabella said quietly. She named me Annabella for the butterfly on my shoulder. Butterflies were her favourite thing, she used to tell me before I came along. The Duchess turned back to Annabella and took her hand. She saw the name Marie embroidered on my blanket and used that for my middle name. Annabella continued with a smile. When the Duchess returned her smile, Patience gasped. How could I have been so blind? Everyone turned to look at her. Look at them. Mother, she is the very picture of you. Your smile is the very same. Annabella turned back to the Duchess and laughed a little when she beheld the same straight nose and wide smile. I hope that you can forgive me, the Duchess said, taking Annabella's hands in her own. I did everything for my daughter. A wry smile from Annabella met that. I cannot begrudge your motivations, especially as now I shall be under the protection of such a fierce lioness. The Duke barked out a laugh, then quickly composed himself when the ladies turned to stare. 
I suppose that I shall have to ply my suit all over again? he asked. If you imagine that I'm going to let a daughter of mine elope, you are sorely mistaken, the Duchess said, a spark of her formidable will reappearing. Annabella smiled up at the Duke. I would marry you in a barn tomorrow, she said softly. The Duke looked down on her with a look of such tender and abiding affection that Patience sighed. The Duchess, too, was clearly softened. Well, she grumbled, we'll see what can be done. Patience, who had done her best to contain her enthusiasm, let out a happy little cry and threw her arms about Annabella's neck. I get a sister and a brother all in one evening. This has been the best season I could have ever hoped for. Alan, who had been smiling indulgently at the proceedings, barked out a laugh. Becoming your brother is a rather more appealing notion. Rising, Annabella rounded on the Duke with playful anger. That is, should I choose to accept you, she teased, her words somewhat tempered by slipping her hand into his. I am the daughter of a Duke now, after all. She could feel rather than hear the Duke chuckling as she laid her head on his shoulder. As the Duke reached up to tilt her face up for a kiss and their lips met, Annabella thought that she had never felt so happy. Her heart fluttered within her, as if it had sprouted wings. But what about patience? When will she bloom as a lady? When will she be challenged by the inevitable cubit's bow? Click here or scan the QR code and read Patience's story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.